the seven who were hanged. Chapter 1 At one o'clock, Your Excellency. As the minister was a very stout man, inclined to apoplexy, they feared to arouse in him any dangerous excitement. And it was with every possible precaution that they informed him that a very serious attempt upon his life had been planned. When they saw that he received the news calmly, even with a smile, they gave him, also, the details. The attempt was to be made on the following day at the time that he was to start out with his official report. Several men, terrorists, whose plans had already been betrayed by a provocateur, and who were now under the vigilant surveillance of detectives, were to meet at one o'clock in the afternoon in front of his house, and, armed with bombs and revolvers, were to wait till he came out. There the terrorists were to be trapped. Wait, muttered the minister, perplexed. How did they know that I was to leave the house at one o'clock in the afternoon with my report, when I myself learned of it only the day before yesterday? The chief of the guards stretched out his arms with a shrug. Exactly at one o'clock in the afternoon, Your Excellency, he said. Half surprised, half commending the work of the police, who had managed everything skillfully, the minister shook his head, a morose smile upon his thick, dark lips, and still smiling obediently. And not desiring to interfere with the plans of the police, he hastily made ready, and went out to pass the night in someone else's hospitable palace. His wife and his two children were also removed from the dangerous house, before which the bomb-throwers were to gather upon the following day. While the lights were burning in the palace, and courteous, familiar faces were bowing to him, smiling and expressing their concern. The dignitary experienced a sensation of pleasant excitement, he felt as if he had already received, or was soon to receive, some great and unexpected reward. But the people went away, the lights were extinguished, and through the mirrors, the lace-like and fantastic reflection of the electric lamps on the street quivered across the ceiling and over the walls. A stranger in the house, with its paintings, its statues, and its silence, the light, itself silent and indefinite, awakened painful thoughts in him as to the vanity of bolts and guards and walls. And then, in the dead of night, in the silence and solitude of a strange bedroom, a sensation of unbearable fear swept over the dignitary. He had some kidney trouble, and whenever he grew strongly agitated, his face, his hands and his feet became swollen. Now, rising like a mountain of bloated flesh above the taut springs of the bed, he felt, with the anguish of a sick man, his swollen face, which seemed to him to belong to someone else. Unceasingly he kept thinking of the cruel fate which people were preparing for him. He recalled, one after another, all the recent horrible instances of bombs that had been thrown at men of even greater eminence than himself. He recalled how the bombs had torn bodies to pieces, had spattered brains over dirty brick walls, had knocked teeth from their roots. And influenced by these meditations, it seemed to him that his own stout, sickly body, outspread on the bed, was already experiencing the fiery shock of the explosion. He seemed to be able to feel his arms being severed from the shoulders, his teeth knocked out, his brain scattered into particles, his feet growing numb, lying quietly, their toes upward. Like those of a dead man. He stirred with an effort, breathed loudly and coughed in order not to seem to himself to resemble a corpse in any way. He encouraged himself with the live noise of the grating springs, of the rustling blanket. And to assure himself that he was actually alive and not dead, he uttered in a bass voice, loudly and abruptly, in the silence and solitude of the bedroom. Malatsi! 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 Good boys! He was praising the detectives, the police, and the soldiers, all those who guarded his life, and who so opportunely and so cleverly had averted the assassination. But even though he stirred, even though he praised his protectors, even though he forced an unnatural smile, in order to express his contempt for the foolish, unsuccessful terrorists. He nevertheless did not believe in his safety, he was not sure that his life would not leave him suddenly, at once. Death, which people had devised for him, and which was only in their minds, in their intention, seemed to him to be already standing there in the room. It seemed to him that death would remain standing there, and would not go away until those people had been captured, 
until the bombs had been taken from them. Until they had been placed in a strong prison. Their death was standing in the corner, and would not go away, it could not go away, even as an obedient sentinel stationed on guard by a superior's will and order. At one o'clock in the afternoon, Your Excellency, this phrase kept ringing, changing its tone continually, now it was cheerfully mocking, now angry, now dull and obstinate. It sounded as if a hundred wound-up gramophones had been placed in his room, and all of them, one after another, were shouting with idiotic repetition the words they had been made to shout. At one o'clock in the afternoon, Your Excellency. And suddenly, this one o'clock in the afternoon tomorrow, which but a short while ago was not in any way different from other hours, which was only a quiet movement of the hand along the dial of his gold watch, assumed an ominous finality, sprang out of the dial, began to live separately, stretched itself into an enormously huge black pole which cut all life in two. It seemed as if no other hours had existed before it and no other hours would exist after it, as if this hour alone, insolent and presumptuous, had a right to a certain peculiar existence. Well, what do you want? asked the minister angrily, muttering between his teeth. The gramophone shouted. At one o'clock in the afternoon, Your Excellency, and the black pole smiled and bowed. Gnashing his teeth, the minister rose in his bed to a sitting posture, leaning his face on the palms of his hands, he positively could not sleep on that dreadful night. Clasping his face in his swollen, perfumed palms, he pictured to himself with horrifying clearness how on the following morning, not knowing anything of the plot against his life. He would have risen, would have drunk his coffee, not knowing anything, and then would have put on his coat in the hallway. And neither he, nor the doorkeeper who would have handed him his fur coat, nor the lackey who would have brought him the coffee, would have known that it was utterly useless to drink coffee. And to put on the coat, since a few instants later, everything, the fur coat and his body and the coffee within it, would be destroyed by an explosion, would be seized by death. The doorkeeper would have opened the glass door. He, the amiable, kind, gentle doorkeeper, with the blue, typical eyes of a soldier, and with medals across his breast, he himself with his own hands would have opened the terrible door. Opened it because he knew nothing. Everybody would have smiled because they did not know anything. Oh ho, he suddenly said aloud, and slowly removed his hands from his face. Peering into the darkness, far ahead of him, with a fixed, strained look, he outstretched his hand just as slowly, felt the button on the wall and pressed it. Then he arose, and without putting on his slippers, walked in his bare feet over the rug in the strange, unfamiliar bedroom, found the button of another lamp upon the wall and pressed it. It became light and pleasant, and only the disarranged bed with the blanket, which had slipped off to the floor, spoke of the horror, not altogether past. In his nightclothes, with his beard disheveled by his restless movements, with his angry eyes, the dignitary resembled any other angry old man who suffered with insomnia and shortness of breath. It was as if the death which people were preparing for him, had made him bare. Had torn away from him the magnificence and splendor which had surrounded him, and it was hard to believe that it was he who had so much power. That his body was but an ordinary plain human body that must have perished terribly in the flame and roar of a monstrous explosion. Without dressing himself and not feeling the cold, he sat down in the first armchair he found, stroking his disheveled beard, and fixed his eyes in deep, calm thoughtfulness upon the unfamiliar plaster figures of the ceiling. So that was the trouble. That was why he had trembled in fear and had become so agitated. That was why death seemed to stand in the corner and would not go away, could not go away. Fools! He said emphatically, with contempt. Fools! He repeated more loudly, and turned his head slightly toward the door that those to whom he was referring might hear it. He was referring to those whom he had praised but a moment before, who in the excess of their zeal had told him of the plot against his life. Of course, he thought deeply, uneasy, convincing idea arising in his mind. Now that they have told me, I know, and feel terrified, but if I had not been told, would not have known anything and would have drunk my coffee calmly. After that death would have come, but then, am I so afraid of death? 
Here have I been suffering with kidney trouble, and I must surely die from it some day, and yet I am not afraid, because I do not know anything. And those fools told me, at one o'clock in the afternoon, Your Excellency, and they thought I would be glad. But instead of that death stationed itself in the corner and would not go away. It would not go away because it was my thought. It is not death that is terrible, but the knowledge of it, it would be utterly impossible to live if a man could know exactly indefinitely the day and hour of his death. And the fools cautioned me, at one o'clock in the afternoon, Your Excellency. He began to feel light-hearted and cheerful, as if someone had told him that he was immortal, that he would never die. And, feeling himself again strong and wise amidst the herd of fools who had so stupidly and impudently broken into the mystery of the future, he began to think of the bliss of ignorance. And his thoughts were the painful thoughts of an old, sick man who had gone through endless experience. It was not given to any living being, man or beast, to know the day and hour of death. Here had he been ill not long ago and the physicians told him that he must expect the end, that he should make his final arrangements, but he had not believed them and he remained alive. In his youth he had become entangled in an affair and had resolved to end his life. He had even loaded the revolver, had written his letters, and had fixed upon the hour for suicide, but before the very end he had suddenly changed his mind. It would always be thus, at the very last moment something would change, an unexpected accident would befall, no one could tell when he would die. At one o'clock in the afternoon, Your Excellency. Those kind asses had said to him, and although they had told him of it only that death might be averted, the mere knowledge of its possibility at a certain hour again filled him with horror. It was probable that some day he should be assassinated, but it would not happen tomorrow, it would not happen tomorrow, and he could sleep undisturbed, as if he were really immortal. Fools, they did not know what a great law they had dislodged, what an abyss they had opened, when they said in their idiotic kindness, at one o'clock in the afternoon, Your Excellency. No, not at one o'clock in the afternoon, Your Excellency, but no one knows when. No one knows when. What? Nothing, answered silence, nothing. But you did say something. Nothing, nonsense. I say, tomorrow, at one o'clock in the afternoon. There was a sudden, acute pain in his heart, and he understood that he would have neither sleep, nor peace, nor joy until that accursed black hour standing out of the dial should have passed. Only the shadow of the knowledge of something which no living being could know stood there in the corner. And that was enough to darken the world and envelop him with the impenetrable gloom of horror. The once disturbed fear of death diffused through his body, penetrated into his bones. He no longer feared the murderers of the next day, they had vanished, they had been forgotten, they had mingled with the crowd of hostile faces and incidents which surrounded his life. He now feared something sudden and inevitable, an apoplectic stroke, heart failure. Some foolish thin little vessel which might suddenly fail to withstand the pressure of the blood and might burst like a tight glove upon swollen fingers. His short, thick neck seemed terrible to him. It became unbearable for him to look upon his short, swollen fingers, to feel how short they were and how they were filled with the moisture of death. And if before, when it was dark, he had had to stir in order not to resemble a corpse, now in the bright, cold, inimical. Dreadful light he was so filled with horror that he could not move in order to get a cigarette or to ring for someone. His nerves were giving way. Each one of them seemed as if it were a bent wire, at the top of which there was a small head with mad, wide-open frightened eyes and a convulsively gaping, speechless mouth. He could not draw his breath. Suddenly in the darkness, amidst the dust and cobwebs somewhere upon the ceiling, an electric bell came to life. The small, metallic tongue, agitatedly, in terror, kept striking the edge of the ringing cap, became silent, and again quivered in an unceasing, frightened din. His Excellency was ringing his bell in his own room. People began to run. Here and there, in the shadows upon the walls, lamps flared up, there were not enough of them to give light, but there were enough to cast shadows. The shadows appeared everywhere. They rose in the corners, 
they stretched across the ceiling, tremulously clinging to each and every elevation, they covered the walls. And it was hard to understand where all these innumerable, deformed silent shadows, voiceless souls of voiceless objects, had been before. A deep, trembling voice said something loudly. Then the doctor was hastily summoned by telephone, the dignitary was collapsing. The wife of His Excellency was also called. Chapter 2 Condemned to be hanged. Everything befell as the police had foretold. Four terrorists, three men and a woman, armed with bombs, infernal machines and revolvers, were seized at the very entrance of the house. And another woman was later found and arrested in the house where the conspiracy had been hatched. She was its mistress. At the same time a great deal of dynamite and half-finished bomb explosives were seized. All those arrested were very young. The eldest of the men was twenty-eight years old, the younger of the women was only nineteen. They were tried in the same fortress in which they were imprisoned after the arrest. They were tried swiftly and secretly, as was done during that unmerciful time. At the trial all of them were calm, but very serious and thoughtful. Their contempt for the judges was so intense that none of them wished to emphasize his daring by even a superfluous smile or by a feigned expression of cheerfulness. Each was simply as calm as was necessary to hedge in his soul, from curious, evil and inimical eyes, the great gloom that precedes death. Sometimes they refused to answer questions. Sometimes they answered, briefly, simply and precisely, as though they were answering not the judge, but statisticians, for the purpose of supplying information for particular special tables. Three of them, one woman and two men, gave their real names, while two others refused and thus remained unknown to the judges. They manifested for all that was going on at the trial a certain curiosity, softened, as though through a haze, such as is peculiar to persons who are very ill or are carried away by some great, all-absorbing idea. They glanced up occasionally, caught some word in the air more interesting than the others, and then resumed the thought from which their attention had been distracted. The man who was nearest to the judges called himself Sergei Golovin, the son of a retired colonel, himself an ex-officer. He was still a very young, light-haired, broad-shouldered man. So strong that neither the prison nor the expectation of inevitable death could remove the color from his cheeks and the expression of youthful, happy frankness from his blue eyes. He kept energetically tugging at his bushy, small beard, to which he had not become accustomed, and continually blinking, kept looking out of the window. It was toward the end of winter, when amidst the snowstorms and the gloomy, frosty days, the approaching spring sent as a forerunner a clear, warm, sunny day, or but an hour, yet so full of spring. So eagerly young and beaming that sparrows on the streets lost their wits for joy, and people seemed almost as intoxicated. And now the strange and beautiful sky could be seen through an upper window which was dust-covered and unwashed since the last summer. At first sight the sky seemed to be milky gray, smoke-colored, but when you looked longer the dark blue color began to penetrate through the shade, grew into an ever deeper blue, ever brighter, ever more intense. And the fact that it did not reveal itself all at once, but hid itself chastely in the smoke of transparent clouds, made it as charming as the girl you love. And Sergei Golovin looked at the sky, tugged at his beard, blinked now one eye, now the other, with its long, curved lashes, earnestly pondering over something. Once he began to move his fingers rapidly and thoughtlessly, knitted his brow in some joy, but then he glanced about and his joy died out like a spark which is stepped upon. Almost instantly an earthen, deathly blue, without first changing into pallor, showed through the color of his cheeks. He clutched his downy hair, tore their roots painfully with his fingers, whose tips had turned white. But the joy of life and spring was stronger, and a few minutes later his frank young face was again yearning toward the spring sky. The young, pale girl, known only by the name of Musia, was also looking in the same direction, at the sky. She was younger than Golovin, but she seemed older in her gravity and in the darkness of her open, proud eyes. Only her very thin, slender neck, and her delicate girlish hands spoke of her youth. But in addition there was that ineffable something, 
which is youth itself, and which sounded so distinctly in her clear, melodious voice, tuned irreproachably like a precious instrument. Every simple word, every exclamation giving evidence of its musical timbre. She was very pale, but it was not a deathly pallor, but that peculiar warm whiteness of a person within whom, as it were, a great, strong fire is burning. Whose body glows transparently like fine Sevres porcelain. She sat almost motionless, and only at times she touched with an imperceptible movement of her fingers the circular mark on the middle finger of her right hand. The mark of a ring which had been recently removed. She gazed at the sky without caressing kindness or joyous recollections, she looked at it simply because in all the filthy, official hall the blue bit of sky was the most beautiful, the purest. The most truthful object, and the only one that did not try to search hidden depths in her eyes. The judges pitted Sergei Golovin, her they despised. Her neighbor, known only by the name of Werner, sat also motionless, in a somewhat affected pose, his hands folded between his knees. If a face may be said to look like a false door, this unknown man closed his face like an iron door and bolted it with an iron lock. He stared motionlessly at the dirty wooden floor, and it was impossible to tell whether he was calm or whether he was intensely agitated, whether he was thinking of something. Or whether he was listening to the testimony of the detectives as presented to the court. He was not tall in stature. His features were refined and delicate. Tender and handsome, so that he reminded you of a moonlit night in the south near the seashore, where the cypress trees throw their dark shadows. He at the same time gave the impression of tremendous, calm power, of invincible firmness, of cold and audacious courage. The very politeness with which he gave brief and precise answers seemed dangerous, on his lips, in his half-bow. And if the prison garb looked upon the others like the ridiculous costume of a buffoon, upon him it was not noticeable, so foreign was it to his personality. And although the other terrorists had been seized with bombs and infernal machines upon them, and Werner had had but a black revolver, the judges for some reason regarded him as the leader of the others and treated him with a certain deference, although succinctly and in a businesslike manner. The next man, Vasily Kasherin, was torn between a terrible, dominating fear of death and a desperate desire to restrain the fear and not betray it to the judges. From early morning, from the time they had been led into court, he had been suffocating from an intolerable palpitation of his heart. Perspiration came out in drops all along his forehead. His hands were also perspiring and cold, and his cold, sweat-covered shirt clung to his body, interfering with the freedom of his movements. With a supernatural effort of willpower he forced his fingers not to tremble, his voice to be firm and distinct, his eyes to be calm. He saw nothing about him. The voices came to him as through a mist, and it was to this mist that he made his desperate efforts to answer firmly, to answer loudly. But having answered, he immediately forgot question as well as answer, and was again struggling with himself silently and terribly. Death was disclosed in him so clearly that the judges avoided looking at him. It was hard to define his age, as is the case with a corpse which has begun to decompose. According to his passport, he was only twenty-three years old. Once or twice Werner quietly touched his knee with his hand, and each time Kasherin spoke shortly. Never mind. The most terrible sensation was when he was suddenly seized with an insufferable desire to cry out, without words, the desperate cry of a beast. He touched Werner quickly, and Werner, without lifting his eyes, said softly. Never mind, Vajia. It will soon be over. And embracing them all with a motherly, anxious look, the fifth terrorist, Tanya Kovalchuk, was faint with alarm. She had never had any children. She was still young and red-cheeked, just as Sergei Golovin, but she seemed as a mother to all of them, so full of anxiety, of boundless love were her looks, her smiles, her sighs. She paid not the slightest attention to the trial, regarding it as though it were something entirely irrelevant, and she listened only to the manner in which the others were answering the questions. To hear whether the voice was trembling, whether there was fear, whether it was necessary to give water to anyone. 
She could not look at Vasya in her anguish and only wrung her fingers silently. At Musia and Werner she gazed proudly and respectfully, and she assumed a serious and concentrated expression, and then tried to transfer her smile to Sergei Golovin. The dear boy is looking at the sky. Look, look, my darling, she thought about Golovin. And Vasya. What is it? My God, my God. What am I to do with him? If I should speak to him I might make it still worse. He might suddenly start to cry. So like a calm pond at dawn, reflecting every hastening, passing cloud, she reflected upon her full, gentle, kind face every swift sensation, every thought of the other four. She did not give a single thought to the fact that she, too, was upon trial, that she, too, would be hanged, she was entirely indifferent to it. It was in her house that the bombs and the dynamite had been discovered, and, strange though it may seem, it was she who had met the police with pistol shots and had wounded one of the detectives in the head. The trial ended at about eight o'clock, when it had become dark. Before Musia's and Golovin's eyes the sky, which had been turning ever bluer, was gradually losing its tint, but it did not turn rosy, did not smile softly as in summer evenings, but became muddy. Gray, and suddenly grew cold, wintry. Golovin heaved a sigh, stretched himself, glanced again twice at the window, but the cold darkness of the night alone was there. Then continuing to tug at his short beard, he began to examine with childish curiosity the judges, the soldiers with their muskets, and he smiled at Tanya Kovalchuk. When the sky had darkened Musia calmly, without lowering her eyes to the ground, turned them to the corner where a small cobweb was quivering from the imperceptible radiations of the steam heat. And thus she remained until the sentence was pronounced. After the verdict, having bidden goodbye to their frock-coated lawyers, and evading each other's helplessly confused, pitying and guilty eyes. The convicted terrorists crowded in the doorway for a moment and exchanged brief words. Never mind, Vasya. Everything will be over soon, said Werner. I am all right, brother, Kasherin replied loudly, calmly and even somewhat cheerfully. And indeed, his face had turned slightly rosy, and no longer looked like that of a decomposing corpse. The devil take them, they've hanged us, Golovin cursed quaintly. That was to be expected, replied Werner calmly. Tomorrow the sentence will be pronounced in its final form and we shall all be placed together, said Tanya Kovalchuk consolingly. Until the execution we shall all be together. Musia was silent. Then she resolutely moved forward. Chapter 3 Why Should I Be Hanged? Two weeks before the terrorists had been tried the same military district court, with a different set of judges, had tried and condemned to death by hanging Ivan Yensun, a peasant. Ivan Yensun was a workman for a well-to-do farmer, in no way different from other workmen. He was an Estonian by birth, from Vesenberg, and in the course of several years, passing from one farm to another, he had come close to the capital. He spoke Russian very poorly, and as his master was a Russian, by name Lazarev, and as there were no Estonians in the neighborhood, Yensun had practically remained silent for almost two years. In general, he was apparently not inclined to talk, and was silent not only with human beings, but even with animals. He would water the horse in silence, harness it in silence, moving about it, slowly and lazily, with short, irresolute steps, and when the horse, annoyed by his manner, would begin to frolic. To become capricious, he would beat it in silence with a heavy whip. He would beat it cruelly, with stolid, angry persistency, and when this happened at a time when he was suffering from the aftereffects of a carouse, he would work himself into a frenzy. At such times the crack of the whip could be heard in the house, with the frightened, painful pounding of the horse's hoofs upon the board floor of the barn. For beating the horse his master would beat Yensun, but then, finding that he could not be reformed, paid no more attention to him. Once or twice a month Yensun became intoxicated, usually on those days when he took his master to the large railroad station, where there was a refreshment bar. After leaving his master at the station, he would drive off about half a verst away, and there, stalling the sled and the horse in the snow on the side of the road. 
he would wait until the train had gone. The sled would stand sideways, almost overturned, the horse standing with widely spread legs up to his belly in a snowbank, from time to time lowering his head to lick the soft, downy snow. While Yen Sun would recline in an awkward position in the sled as if dozing away. The unfastened ear lappets of his worn fur cap would hang down like the ears of a setter, and the moist sweat would stand under his little reddish nose. Soon he would return to the station, and would quickly become intoxicated. On his way back to the farm, the whole ten versts, he would drive at a fast gallop. The little horse, driven to madness by the whip, would rear, as if possessed by a demon. The sled would sway, almost overturn, striking against poles, and Yen Sun, letting the reins go, would half sing, half exclaim abrupt, meaningless phrases in Estonian. But more often he would not sing, but with his teeth gritted together in an onrush of unspeakable rage, suffering and delight, he would drive silently on as though blind. He would not notice those who passed him, he would not call to them to look out, he would not slacken his mad pace either at the turns of the road or on the long slopes of the mountain roads. How it happened at such times that he crushed no one, how he himself was never dashed to death in one of these mad rides, was inexplicable. He would have been driven from this place, as he had been driven from other places, but he was cheap and other workmen were not better, and thus he remained there two years. His life was uneventful. One day he received a letter, written in Estonian, but as he himself was illiterate, and as the others did not understand Estonian, the letter remained unread. And as if not understanding that the letter might bring him tidings from his native home, he flung it into the manure with a certain savage, grim indifference. At one time Yensun tried to make love to the cook, but he was not successful, and was rudely rejected and ridiculed. He was short in stature, his face was freckled, and his small, sleepy eyes were somewhat of an indefinite color. Yen Sun took his failure indifferently, and never again bothered the cook. But while Yen Sun spoke but little, he was listening to something all the time. He heard the sounds of the dismal, snow-covered fields, with their heaps of frozen manure resembling rows of small, snow-covered graves, the sounds of the blue, tender distance. Of the buzzing telegraph wires, and the conversation of other people. What the fields and telegraph wires spoke to him he alone knew, and the conversation of the people were disquieting, full of rumors about murders and robberies and arson. And one night he heard in the neighboring village the little church bell ringing faintly and helplessly, and the crackling of the flames of a fire. Some vagabonds had plundered a rich farm, had killed the master and his wife, and had set fire to the house. And on their farm, too, they lived in fear. The dogs were loose, not only at night, but also during the day, and the master slept with a gun by his side. He wished to give such a gun to Yen Sun, only it was an old one with one barrel. But Yen Sun turned the gun about in his hand, shook his head and declined it. His master did not understand the reason and scolded him, but the reason was that Yen Sun had more faith in the power of his Finnish knife than in the rusty gun. It would kill me, he said, looking at his master sleepily with his glassy eyes, and the master waved his hand in despair. You fool! Think of having to live with such workmen! And this same Ivan Yensun, who distrusted a gun, one winter evening, when the other workmen had been sent away to the station, committed a very complicated attempt at robbery, murder and rape. He did it in a surprisingly simple manner. He locked the cook in the kitchen, lazily, with the air of a man who is longing to sleep, walked over to his master from behind and swiftly stabbed him several times in the back with his knife. The master fell unconscious, and the mistress began to run about, screaming, while Yen Sun, showing his teeth and brandishing his knife, began to ransack the trunks and the chests of drawers. He found the money he sought, and then, as if noticing the mistress for the first time, and as though unexpectedly even to himself, he rushed upon her in order to violate her. But as he had let his knife drop to the floor, the mistress proved stronger than he, and not only did not allow him to harm her, but almost choked him into unconsciousness. Then the master on the floor turned, the cook thundered upon the door with the oven fork, breaking it open, and Yen Sun ran away into the fields. 
He was caught an hour later, kneeling down behind the corner of the barn, striking one match after another, which would not ignite, in an attempt to set the place on fire. A few days later the master died of blood poisoning, and Yen Sun, when his turn among other robbers and murderers came, was tried and condemned to death. In court he was the same as always. A little man, freckled, with sleepy, glassy eyes. It seemed as if he did not understand in the least the meaning of what was going on about him, he appeared to be entirely indifferent. He blinked his white eyelashes, stupidly, without curiosity, examined the somber, unfamiliar courtroom, and picked his nose with his hard, shriveled, unbending finger. Only those who had seen him on Sundays at church would have known that he had made an attempt to adorn himself. He wore on his neck a knitted, muddy red shawl, and in places had dampened the hair of his head. Where the hair was wet it lay dark and smooth, while on the other side it stuck up in light and sparse tufts, like straws upon a hail-beaten, wasted meadow. When the sentence was pronounced, death by hanging, Yen Sun suddenly became agitated. He reddened deeply and began to tie and untie the shawl about his neck as though it were choking him. Then he waved his arm stupidly and said, turning to the judge who had not read the sentence, and pointing with his finger at the judge who read it. He said that I should be hanged. Who do you mean? asked the presiding judge, who had pronounced the sentence in a deep, bass voice. Everyone smiled, some tried to hide their smiles behind their mustaches and their papers. Yen Sun pointed his index finger at the presiding judge and answered angrily, looking at him askance. You. Well? Yen Sun again turned his eyes to the judge who had been silent, restraining a smile, whom he felt to be a friend, a man who had nothing to do with the sentence. And repeated. He said I should be hanged. Why must I be hanged? Take the prisoner away. But Yen Sun succeeded in repeating once more, convincingly and weightily. Why must I be hanged? He looked so absurd, with his small, angry face, with his outstretched finger, that even the soldier of the convoy, breaking the rule, said to him in an undertone as he led him away from the courtroom, You are a fool, young man. Why must I be hanged, repeated Yen Sun stubbornly. They'll swing you up so quickly that you'll have no time to kick. Keep still, cried the other convoy angrily. But he himself could not refrain from adding. A robber, too. Why did you take a human life, you fool? You must hang for that. They might pardon him, said the first soldier, who began to feel sorry for Yen Sun. Oh, yes. They'll pardon people like him, will they? Well, we've talked enough. But Yen Sun had become silent again. He was again placed in the cell in which he had already sat for a month and to which he had grown accustomed, just as he had become accustomed to everything, to blows, to vodka, to the dismal. Snow-covered fields, with their snow heaps resembling graves. And now he even began to feel cheerful when he saw his bed, the familiar window with the grating, and when he was given something to eat, he had not eaten anything since morning. He had an unpleasant recollection of what had taken place in the court, but of that he could not think, he was unable to recall it. And death by hanging he could not picture to himself at all. Although Yen Sun had been condemned to death, there were many others similarly sentenced, and he was not regarded as an important criminal. They spoke to him accordingly, with neither fear nor respect, just as they would speak to prisoners who were not to be executed. The warden, on learning of the verdict, said to him. Well, my friend, they've hanged you. When are they going to hang me? asked Yen Sun distrustfully. The warden meditated a moment. Well, you'll have to wait, until they can get together a whole party. It isn't worth bothering for one man, especially for a man like you. It is necessary to work up the right spirit. And when will that be? persisted Yen Sun. He was not at all offended that it was not worth while to hang him alone. He did not believe it, but considered it as an excuse for postponing the execution, preparatory to revoking it altogether. And he was seized with joy. The confused, terrible moment, of which it was so painful to think, retreated far into the distance, becoming fictitious and improbable, 
as death always seems. When? When? cried the warden, a dull, morose old man, growing angry. It isn't like hanging a dog, which you take behind the barn, and it is done in no time. I suppose you would like to be hanged like that, you fool. I don't want to be hanged, and suddenly Yen Sun frowned strangely. He said that I should be hanged, but I don't want it. And perhaps for the first time in his life he laughed, a hoarse, absurd, yet gay and joyous laughter. It sounded like the cackling of a goose, gaga -ga -ga. The warden looked at him in astonishment, then knit his brow sternly. This strange gaiety of a man who was to be executed was an offense to the prison, as well as to the very executioner. It made them appear absurd. And suddenly, for the briefest instant, it appeared to the old warden, who had passed all his life in the prison, and who looked upon its laws as the laws of nature. That the prison and all the life within it was something like an insane asylum, in which he, the warden, was the chief lunatic. Shaw! The devil take you, and he spat aside. Why are you giggling here? This is no dram shop. And I don't want to be hanged, G-A-G-G, laughed Yen Sun. Satan! muttered the inspector, feeling the need of making the sign of the cross. This little man, with his small, wizened face, he resembled least of all the devil, but there was that in his silly giggling which destroyed the sanctity and the strength of the prison. If he laughed longer, it seemed to the warden as if the walls might fall asunder, the grating melt and drop out, as if the warden himself might lead the prisoners to the gates. Bowing and saying, Take a walk in the city, gentlemen. Or perhaps some of you would like to go to the village. Satan. But Yen Sun had stopped laughing, and was now winking cunningly. You had better look out. Said the warden, with an indefinite threat, and he walked away, glancing back of him. Yen Sun was calm and cheerful throughout the evening. He repeated to himself, I shall not be hanged, and it seemed to him so convincing, so wise, so irrefutable, that it was unnecessary to feel uneasy. He had long forgotten about his crime, only sometimes he regretted that he had not been successful in attacking his master's wife. But he soon forgot that, too. Every morning Yen Sun asked when he was to be hanged, and every morning the warden answered him angrily. Take your time, you devil. Wait. And he would walk off quickly before Yen Sun could begin to laugh. And from these monotonously repeated words, and from the fact that each day came, passed and ended as every ordinary day had passed, Yen Sun became convinced that there would be no execution. He began to lose all memory of the trial, and would roll about all day long on his cot, vaguely and happily dreaming about the white melancholy fields, with their snow mounds. About the refreshment bar at the railroad station, and about other things still more vague and bright. He was well fed in the prison, and somehow he began to grow stout rapidly and to assume airs. Now she would have liked me, he thought of his master's wife. Now I am stout, not worse looking than the master. But he longed for a drink of vodka, to drink and to take a ride on horseback, to ride fast, madly. When the terrorists were arrested the news of it reached the prison. And in answer to Jansen's usual question, the warden said eagerly and unexpectedly. It won't be long now. He looked at Yen Sun calmly with an air of importance and repeated. It won't be long now. I suppose in about a week. Yen Sun turned pale, and as though falling asleep, so turbid was the look in his glassy eyes, asked. Are you joking? First you could not wait, and now you think I am joking. We are not allowed to joke here. You like to joke, but we are not allowed to, said the warden with dignity as he went away. Toward evening of that day Yen Sun had already grown thinner. His skin, which had stretched out and had become smooth for a time, was suddenly covered with a multitude of small wrinkles, and in places it seemed even to hang down. His eyes became sleepy, and all his motions were now so slow and languid as though each turn of the head, each move of the fingers. Each step of the foot were a complicated and cumbersome undertaking which required very careful deliberation. At night he lay on his cot, but did not close his eyes, 
and thus, heavy with sleep, they remained open until morning. Aha, said the warden with satisfaction, seeing him on the following day. This is no dram shop for you, my dear. With a feeling of pleasant gratification, like a scientist whose experiment had proved successful again, he examined the condemned man closely and carefully from head to foot. Now everything would go along as necessary. Satan was disgraced, the sacredness of the prison and the execution was re-established, and the old man inquired condescendingly. Even with a feeling of sincere pity. Do you want to meet somebody or not? What for? Well, to say goodbye. Have you no mother, for instance, or a brother? I must not be hanged, said Yen Sun softly, and looked askance at the warden. I don't want to be hanged. The warden looked at him and waved his hand in silence. Toward evening Yen Sun grew somewhat calmer. The day had been so ordinary, the cloudy winter sky looked so ordinary, the footsteps of people and their conversation on matters of business sounded so ordinary. The smell of the sour soup of cabbage was so ordinary, customary and natural that he again ceased believing in the execution. But the night became terrible to him. Before this Yen Sun had felt the night simply as darkness, as an especially dark time, when it was necessary to go to sleep, but now he began to be aware of its mysterious and uncanny nature. In order not to believe in death, it was necessary to hear and see and feel ordinary things about him, footsteps, voices, light, the soup of sour cabbage. But in the dark everything was unnatural. The silence and the darkness were in themselves something like death. And the longer the night dragged the more dreadful it became. With the ignorant innocence of a child or a savage, who believe everything possible, Yen Sun felt like crying to the sun, shine. He begged, he implored that the sun should shine, but the night drew its long, dark hours remorselessly over the earth, and there was no power that could hasten its course. And this impossibility, arising for the first time before the weak consciousness of Yen Sun, filled him with terror. Still not daring to realize it clearly, he already felt the inevitability of approaching death, and felt himself making the first step upon the gallows, with benumbed feet. Day quieted him, but night again filled him with fear, and so it was until one night when he realized fully that death was inevitable, that it would come in three days at dawn with the sunrise. He had never thought of what death was, and it had no image to him, but now he realized clearly, he saw, he felt that it had entered his cell and was looking for him, groping about with its hands. And to save himself, he began to run wildly about the room. But the cell was so small that it seemed that its corners were not sharp but dull, and that all of them were pushing him into the center of the room. And there was nothing behind which to hide. And the door was locked. And it was dark. Several times he struck his body against the walls, making no sound, and once he struck against the door, it gave forth a dull, empty sound. He stumbled over something and fell upon his face, and then he felt that it was going to seize him. Lying on his stomach, holding to the floor, hiding his face in the dark, dirty asphalt, Yen Sun howled in terror. He lay, and cried at the top of his voice until someone came. And when he was lifted from the floor and seated upon the cot, and cold water was poured over his head, he still did not dare open his tightly closed eyes. He opened one eye, and noticing someone's boot in one of the corners of the room, he commenced crying again. But the cold water began to produce its effect in bringing him to his senses. To help the effect, the warden on duty, the same old man, administered medicine to Yen Sun in the form of several blows upon the head. And this sensation of life returning to him really drove the fear of death away. Yen Sun opened his eyes, and then, his mind utterly confused, he slept soundly for the remainder of the night. He lay on his back, with mouth open, and snored loudly, and between his lashes, which were not tightly closed, his flat, dead eyes, which were upturned so that the pupil did not show, could be seen. Later, everything in the world, day and night, footsteps, voices, the soup of sour cabbage, produced in him a continuous terror, plunging him into a state of savage uncomprehending astonishment. 
His weak mind was unable to combine these two things which so monstrously contradicted each other, the bright day, the odor and taste of cabbage, and the fact that two days later he must die. He did not think of anything. He did not even count the hours, but simply stood in mute stupefaction before this contradiction which tore his brain in two. And he became evenly pale, neither white nor redder in parts, and appeared to be calm. Only he ate nothing and ceased sleeping altogether. He sat all night long on a stool, his legs crossed under him, in fright. Or he walked about in his cell, quietly, stealthily, and sleepily looking about him on all sides. His mouth was half open all the time, as though from incessant astonishment, and before taking the most ordinary thing into his hands, he would examine it stupidly for a long time. And would take it distrustfully. When he became thus, the wardens as well as the sentinel who watched him through the little window, ceased paying further attention to him. This was the customary condition of prisoners, and reminded the wardens of cattle being led to slaughter after a staggering blow. Now he is stunned, now he will feel nothing until his very death, said the warden, looking at him with experienced eyes. Ivan! Do you hear? Ivan! I must not be hanged, answered Yen Sun, in a dull voice, and his lower jaw again drooped. You should not have committed murder. You would not be hanged then, answered the chief warden, a young but very important-looking man with medals on his chest. You committed murder, yet you do not want to be hanged? He wants to kill human beings without paying for it. Fool! Fool, said another. I don't want to be hanged, said Yen Sun. Well, my friend, you may want it or not, that's your affair, replied the chief warden indifferently. Instead of talking nonsense, you had better arrange your affairs. You still have something. He has nothing. One shirt and a suit of clothes. And a fur cap. A sport. Thus time passed until Thursday. And on Thursday, at midnight a number of people entered Jansen's cell, and one man, with shoulder straps, said. Well, get ready. We must go. Yen Sun, moving slowly and drowsily as before, put on everything he had and tied his muddy red muffler about his neck. The man with shoulder straps, smoking a cigarette, said to someone while watching Yen Sun dress. What a warm day this will be. Real spring. Yansen's small eyes were closing. He seemed to be falling asleep, and he moved so slowly and stiffly that the warden cried to him. Hey, there. Quicker. Have you fallen asleep? Suddenly Yen Sun stopped. I don't want to be hanged, said he. He was taken by the arms and led away, and began to stride obediently, raising his shoulders. Outside he found himself in the moist, spring air, and beads of sweat stood under his little nose. Notwithstanding that it was night, it was thawing very strongly and drops of water were dripping upon the stones. And waiting while the soldiers, clanking their sabers and bending their heads, were stepping into the unlighted black carriage. Yen Sun lazily moved his finger under his moist nose and adjusted the badly tied muffler about his neck. Chapter 4 We Come from Oriol The same council chamber of the military district court which had condemned Yen Sun had also condemned to death a peasant of the government of Oriol, of the district of Yelitsk. Mikhail Golubets, nicknamed Tsiganok, also Tatarin. His latest crime, proven beyond question, had been the murder of three people and armed robbery. Behind that, his dark past disappeared in a depth of mystery. There were vague rumors that he had participated in a series of other murders and robberies, and in his path there was felt to be a dark trail of blood, fire, and drunken debauchery. He called himself murderer with utter frankness and sincerity, and scornfully regarded those who, according to the latest fashion, styled themselves expropriators. Of his last crime, since it was useless for him to deny anything, he spoke freely and in detail, but in answer to questions about his past, he merely gritted his teeth, whistled, and said, Search for the wind of the fields. When he was annoyed in cross-examination, Tsiganok assumed a serious and dignified air. 
All of us from Oriol are thoroughbreds, he would say gravely and deliberately. Oriol and Chroma are the homes of first-class thieves. Karachev and Livna are the breeding places of thieves. And Yelitz is the parent of all thieves. Now, what else is there to say? He was nicknamed Tsiganok, Gypsy, because of his appearance and his thievish manner. He was black-haired, lean, with yellow spots on his prominent, tartar-like cheekbones. His glance was swift, brief, but fearfully direct and searching, and the thing upon which he looked for a moment seemed to lose something, seemed to deliver up to him a part of itself. And to become something else. It was just as unpleasant and repugnant to take a cigarette at which he looked, as though it had already been in his mouth. There was a certain constant restlessness in him, now twisting him like a rag, now throwing him about like a body of coiling live wires. And he drank water almost by the bucket. To all questions during the trial he answered shortly, firmly, jumping up quickly, and at times he seemed to answer even with pleasure. Correct, he would say. Sometimes he emphasized it. Sirarect. At one time, suddenly, when they were speaking of something that would hardly have seemed to suggest it, he jumped to his feet and asked the presiding judge. Will you allow me to whistle? What for? asked the judge, surprised. They said that I gave the signal to my comrades. I would like to show you how. It is very interesting. The judge consented, somewhat wonderingly. Tsiganok quickly placed four fingers in his mouth, two fingers of each hand, rolled his eyes fiercely, and then the dead air of the courtroom was suddenly rent by a real, wild. Murderers whistle, at which frightened horses leap and rear on their hind legs and human faces involuntarily blanch. The mortal anguish of him who is to be assassinated, the wild joy of the murderer, the dreadful warning, the call. The gloom and loneliness of a stormy autumn night, all this rang in his piercing shriek, which was neither human nor beastly. The presiding officer shouted, then waved his arm at Tsiganok, and Tsiganok obediently became silent. And, like an artist who had triumphantly performed a difficult aria, he sat down, wiped his wet fingers upon his coat, and surveyed those present with an air of satisfaction. What a robber! said one of the judges, rubbing his ear. Another one, however, with a wild Russian beard, but with the eyes of a tartar, like those of Tsiganok, gazed pensively above Tsiganok's head, then smiled and remarked. It is indeed interesting. With light hearts, without mercy, without the slightest pangs of conscience, the judges brought out against Tsiganok a verdict of death. Correct, said Tsiganok, when the verdict was pronounced. In the open field and on a crossbeam. Correct. And turning to the convoy, he hurled with bravado. Well, are we not going? Come on, you sour coat. And hold your gun, I might take it away from you. The soldier looked at him sternly, with fear, exchanged glances with his comrade, and felt the lock of his gun. The other did the same. And all the way to the prison the soldiers felt that they were not walking but flying through the air, as if hypnotized by the prisoner, they felt neither the ground beneath their feet, nor the passage of time, nor themselves. Mishka Tsiganok, like Yensun, had had to spend seventeen days in prison before his execution. And all seventeen days passed as though they were one day, they were bound up in one inextinguishable thought of escape, of freedom, of life. The restlessness of Tsiganok, which was now repressed by the walls and the bars and the dead window through which nothing could be seen, turned all its fury upon himself and burned his soul like coal scattered upon boards. As though he were in a drunken vapor, bright but incomplete images swarmed upon him, failing and then becoming confused. And then again rushing through his mind in an unrestrainable blinding whirlwind, and all were bent toward escape, toward liberty toward life. With his nostrils expanded, like those of a horse, Tsiganok smelt the air for hours long, it seemed to him that he could smell the odor of hemp. Of the smoke of fire, the colorless and biting smell of burning. Now he whirled about in the room like a top, touching the walls, tapping them nervously with his fingers from time to time, taking aim, boring the ceiling with his gaze, 
filing the prison bars. By his restlessness, he had tired out the soldiers who watched him through the little window, and who, several times, in despair, had threatened to shoot. Tsiganok would retort, coarsely and derisively, and the quarrel would end peacefully because the dispute would soon turn into boorish, unoffending abuse. After which shooting would have seemed absurd and impossible. Tsiganok slept during the night soundly, without stirring, in unchanging yet live motionlessness, like a wire spring in temporary inactivity. But as soon as he arose, he immediately commenced to walk, to plan, to grope about. His hands were always dry and hot, but his heart at times would suddenly grow cold, as if a cake of unmelting ice had been placed upon his chest, sending a slight, dry shiver through his whole body. At such times, Tsiganok, always dark in complexion, would turn black, assuming the shade of bluish cast iron. And he acquired a curious habit. As though he had eaten too much of something sickeningly sweet, he kept licking his lips, smacking them, and would spit on the floor, hissingly, through his teeth. When he spoke, he did not finish his words, so rapidly did his thoughts run that his tongue was unable to compass them. One day the chief warden, accompanied by a soldier, entered his cell. He looked askance at the floor and said gruffly. Look! How dirty he has made it! Tsiganok retorted quickly. You've made the whole world dirty, you fat face, and yet I haven't said anything to you. What brings you here? The warden, speaking as gruffly as before, asked him whether he would act as executioner. Tsiganok burst out laughing, showing his teeth. You can't find anyone else? That's good. Go ahead, hang. Ha! 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 The necks are there, the rope is there, but there is nobody to string it up. By God! That's good. You'll save your neck if you do it. Of course, I couldn't hang them if I were dead. Well said, you fool. Well, what do you say? Is it all the same to you? And how do you hang them here? I suppose they're choked on the sly. No, with music, snarled the warden. Well, what a fool. Of course it can be done with music. This way, and he began to sing, with a bold and daring swing. You have lost your wits, my friend, said the warden. What do you say? Speak sensibly. Tsiganok grinned. How eager you are. Come another time and I'll tell you. After that, into that chaos of bright, yet incomplete images which oppressed Tsiganok by their impetuosity, a new image came, how good it would be to become a hangman in a red shirt. He pictured to himself vividly a square crowded with people, a high scaffold, and he, Tsiganok, in a red shirt walking about upon the scaffold with an axe. The sun shone overhead, gaily flashing from the axe, and everything was so gay and bright that even the man whose head was soon to be chopped off was smiling. And behind the crowd, wagons and the heads of horses could be seen, the peasants had come from the village, and beyond them, further, he could see the village itself. T.S. Ock. Tsiganok smacked his lips, licking them, and spat. And suddenly he felt as though a fur cap had been pushed over his head to his very mouth, it became black and stifling, and his heart again became like a cake of unmelting ice, sending a slight dry shiver through his whole body. The warden came in twice again, and Tsiganok, showing his teeth, said. How eager you are. Come in again. Finally one day the warden shouted through the casement window as he passed rapidly. You've let your chance slip by, you fool. We found somebody else. The devil take you. Hang yourself. Snarled Tsiganok, and he stopped dreaming of the execution. But toward the end, the nearer he approached the time, the weight of the fragments of his broken images became unbearable. Tsiganok now felt like standing still. Like spreading his legs and standing, but a whirling current of thoughts carried him away and there was nothing at which he could clutch, everything about him swam. And his sleep also became uneasy. Dreams even more violent than his thoughts appeared, new dreams, solid, heavy, like wooden painted blocks. 
And it was no longer like a current, but like an endless fall to an endless depth, a whirling flight through the whole visible world of colors. When Tsiganok was free he had worn only a pair of dashing mustaches, but in the prison a short, black, bristly beard grew on his face and it made him look fearsome, insane. At times Tsiganok really lost his senses and whirled absurdly about in the cell, still tapping upon the rough, plastered walls nervously. And he drank water like a horse. At times toward evening when they lit the lamp, Tsiganok would stand on all fours in the middle of his cell and would howl the quivering howl of a wolf. He was peculiarly serious while doing it, and would howl as though he were performing an important and indispensable act. He would fill his chest with air and then exhale it, slowly in a prolonged tremulous howl, and, cocking his eyes, would listen intently as the sound issued forth. And the very quiver in his voice seemed in a manner intentional. He did not scream wildly, but drew out each note carefully in that mournful wail full of untold sorrow and terror. Then he would suddenly break off howling and for several minutes would remain silent, still standing on all fours. Then suddenly he would mutter softly, staring at the ground. My darlings, my sweethearts. My darlings, my sweethearts. Have pity. My darlings. My sweethearts. And it seemed again as if he were listening intently to his own voice. As he said each word he would listen. Then he would jump up and for a whole hour would curse continually. He cursed picturesquely, shouting and rolling his bloodshot eyes. If you hang me, hang me, and he would burst out cursing again. And the sentinel, in the meantime white as chalk, weeping with pain and fright, would knock at the door with the butt end of the gun and cry helplessly. I'll fire. I'll kill you as sure as I live. Do you hear? But he dared not shoot. If there was no actual rebellion they never fired at those who had been condemned to death. And Tsiganok would gnash his teeth, would curse and spit. His brain thus racked on a monstrously sharp blade between life and death was falling to pieces like a lump of dry clay. When they entered the cell at midnight to lead Tsiganok to the execution he began to bustle about and seemed to have recovered his spirits. Again he had that sweet taste in his mouth, and his saliva collected abundantly, but his cheeks turned rosy and in his eyes began to glisten his former somewhat savage slyness. Dressing himself he asked the official. Who is going to do the hanging? A new man? I suppose he hasn't learned his job yet. You needn't worry about it, answered the official dryly. I can't help worrying, your honor. I am going to be hanged, not you. At least don't be stingy with the government's soap on the noose. All right, all right. Keep quiet. This man here has eaten all your soap, said Siganok, pointing to the warden. See how his face shines. Silence. Don't be stingy. And Tsiganok burst out laughing. But he began to feel that it was getting ever sweeter in his mouth, and suddenly his legs began to feel strangely numb. Still, on coming out into the yard, he managed to exclaim. The Carriage of the Count of Bengal. Chapter 5. Kiss, and Say Nothing. The verdict concerning the five terrorists was pronounced finally and confirmed upon the same day. The condemned were not told when the execution would take place, but they knew from the usual procedure that they would be hanged the same night, or, at the very latest, upon the following night. And when it was proposed to them that they meet their relatives upon the following Thursday they understood that the execution would take place on Friday at dawn. Tanya Kovalchuk had no near relatives, and those whom she had were somewhere in the wilderness in Little Russia, and it was not likely that they even knew of the trial or of the coming execution. Musia and Werner, as unidentified people, were not supposed to have relatives, and only two, Sergei Golovin and Vasily Kasherin, were to meet their parents. Both of them looked upon that meeting with terror and anguish, yet they dared not refuse the old people the last word, the last kiss. Sergei Golovin was particularly tortured by the thought of the coming meeting. He dearly loved his father and mother. He had seen them but a short while before, and now he was in a state of terror as to what would happen when they came to see him. 
The execution itself, in all its monstrous horror, in its brain-stunning madness, he could imagine more easily, and it seemed less terrible than these other few moments of meeting. Brief and unsatisfactory, which seemed to reach beyond time, beyond life itself. How to look, what to think, what to say, his mind could not determine. The most simple and ordinary act, to take his father by the hand, to kiss him, and to say, How do you do, father? seemed to him unspeakably horrible in its monstrous, inhuman, absurd deceitfulness. After the sentence the condemned were not placed together in one cell, as Tanya Kovalchuk had supposed they would be, but each was put in solitary confinement, and all the morning. Until eleven o'clock, when his parents came, Sergei Golovin paced his cell furiously, tugged at his beard, frowned pitiably and muttered inaudibly. Sometimes he would stop abruptly, would breathe deeply and then exhale like a man who has been too long under water. But he was so healthy, his young life was so strong within him, that even in the moments of most painful suffering his blood played under his skin, reddening his cheeks. And his blue eyes shone brightly and frankly. But everything was far different from what he had anticipated. Nikolai Sergeyevich Golovin, Sergei's father, a retired colonel, was the first to enter the room where the meeting took place. He was all white, his face, his beard, his hair, and his hands, as if he were a snow statue attired in man's clothes. He had on the same old but well-cleaned coat, smelling of benzene, with new shoulder straps crosswise, that he had always worn, and he entered firmly, with an air of stateliness. With strong and steady steps. He stretched out his white, thin hand, and said loudly. How do you do, Sergei? Behind him Sergei's mother entered with short steps, smiling strangely. But she also pressed his hands and repeated loudly. How do you do, Seryozenka? She kissed him on the lips and sat down silently. She did not rush over to him, she did not burst into tears. She did not break into a sob, she did not do any of the terrible things which Sergei had feared. She just kissed him and silently sat down. And with her trembling hands she even adjusted her black silk dress. Sergei did not know that the colonel, having locked himself all the previous night in his little study, had deliberated upon this ritual with all his power. We must not aggravate, but ease the last moments of our son, resolved the colonel firmly, and he carefully weighed every possible phase of the conversation. Every act and movement that might take place on the following day. But somehow he became confused, forgetting what he had prepared, and he wept bitterly in the corner of the oilcloth-covered couch. In the morning he explained to his wife how she should behave at the meeting. The main thing is, kiss, and say nothing, he taught her. Later you may speak, after a while, but when you kiss him, be silent. Don't speak right after the kiss, do you understand? Or you will say what you should not say. I understand. Nikolai Sergevich, answered the mother, weeping. And you must not weep. For God's sake, do not weep. You will kill him if you weep, old woman. Why do you weep? With women one cannot help weeping. But you must not weep, do you hear? Very well, Nikolai Sergevich. Riding in the Drozky, he had intended to school her in the instructions again, but he forgot. And so they rode in silence, bent, both grey and old, and they were lost in thought, while the city was gay and noisy. It was Shrovetide, and the streets were crowded. They sat down. Then the colonel stood up, assumed a studied pose, placing his right hand upon the border of his coat. Sergei sat for an instant, looked closely upon the wrinkled face of his mother and then jumped up. Be seated, Seryozenka, begged the mother. Sit down, Sergei, repeated the father. They became silent. The mother smiled. How we have petitioned for you, Seryozenka. Father. You should not have done that, mother. The colonel spoke firmly. We had to do it, Sergei, so that you should not think your parents had forsaken you. They became silent again. It was terrible for them to utter even a word, as though each word in the language had lost its individual meaning and meant but one thing, death. 
Sergei looked at his father's coat, which smelt of benzene, and thought, they have no servant now, consequently he must have cleaned it himself. How is it that I never before noticed when he cleaned his coat? I suppose he does it in the morning. Suddenly he asked. And how is sister? Is she well? Ninochka does not know anything, the mother answered hastily. The colonel interrupted her sternly, why should you tell a falsehood? The child read it in the newspapers. Let Sergei know that everybody, that those who are dearest to him, were thinking of him, at this time, and he could not say any more and stopped. Suddenly the mother's face contracted, then it spread out, became agitated, wet and wild-looking. Her discolored eyes stared blindly, and her breathing became more frequent, and briefer, louder. Say, 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 sir, she repeated without moving her lips. Sir. Dear mother. The colonel strode forward, and all quivering in every fold of his coat, in every wrinkle of his face, not understanding how terrible he himself looked in his death-like whiteness, in his heroic. Desperate firmness. He said to his wife. Be silent. Don't torture him. Don't torture him. He has to die. Don't torture him. Frightened, she had already become silent, but he still shook his clenched fists before him and repeated. Don't torture him. Then he stepped back, placed his trembling hands behind his back, and loudly, with an expression of forced calm, asked with pale lips. When? Tomorrow morning, answered Sergei, his lips also pale. The mother looked at the ground, chewing her lips, as if she did not hear anything. And continuing to chew, she uttered these simple words, strangely, as though they dropped like lead. Ninochka told me to kiss you, Seryozenka. Kiss her for me, said Sergei. Very well. The Kvostovs send you their regards. Which Kvostovs? Oh, yes. The colonel interrupted. Well, we must go. Get up, mother, we must go. The two men lifted the weakened old woman. Bid him goodbye, ordered the colonel. Make the sign of the cross. She did everything as she was told. But as she made the sign of the cross, and kissed her son a brief kiss, she shook her head and murmured weakly. No, it isn't the right way. It is not the right way. What will I say? How will I say it? No, it is not the right way. Goodbye, Sergei, said the father. They shook hands, and kissed each other quickly but heartily. You, began Sergei. Well? Asked the father abruptly. No, no. It is not the right way. How shall I say it, repeated the mother weakly, nodding her head. She had sat down again and was rocking herself back and forth. You, Sergei began again. Suddenly his face wrinkled pitiably, childishly, and his eyes filled with tears immediately. Through the sparkling gleams of his tears he looked closely into the white face of his father, whose eyes had also filled. You, father, are a noble man. What is that? What are you saying? said the colonel, surprised. And then suddenly, as if broken in two, he fell with his head upon his son's shoulder. He had been taller than Sergei, but now he became short, and his dry, downy head lay like a white ball upon his son's shoulder. And they kissed silently and passionately, Sergei kissed the silvery white hair, and the old man kissed the prisoner's garb. And I, suddenly said a loud voice. They looked around. Sergei's mother was standing, her head thrown back, looking at them angrily, almost with contempt. What is it, mother? cried the colonel. And I? She said, shaking her head with insane intensity. You kiss, and I? You men? Yes? And I? And I? Mother? Sergei rushed over to her. What took place then it is unnecessary and impossible to describe. The last words of the colonel were. I give you my blessing for your death, Serioza. Die bravely, like an officer. 
and they went away. Somehow they went away. They had been there, they had stood, they had spoken, and suddenly they had gone. Here sat his mother, there stood his father, and suddenly somehow they had gone away. Returning to the cell, Sergei lay down on the cot, his face turned toward the wall, in order to hide it from the soldiers, and he wept for a long time. Then, exhausted by his tears, he slept soundly. To Vasily Kasherin only his mother came. His father, who was a wealthy tradesman, did not want to come. Vasily met the old woman, as he was pacing up and down the room, trembling with cold, although it was warm, even hot. And the conversation was brief, painful. It wasn't worth coming, mother. You'll only torture yourself and me. Why did you do it, Vasya? Why did you do it? Oh, Lord! The old woman burst out weeping, wiping her face with the ends of her black, woolen kerchief. And with the habit which he and his brothers had always had of crying at their mother, who did not understand anything, he stopped, and, shuddering as with cold, spoke angrily. There. You see. I knew it. You understand nothing, mother. Nothing. Well, well, all right. Do you feel, cold? Cold. Vasily answered bluntly, and again began to pace the room, looking at his mother askance, as if annoyed. Perhaps you have caught cold? Oh, mother what is a cold, when, and he waved his hand helplessly. The old woman was about to say, and your father ordered wheat cakes beginning with Monday, but she was frightened, and said. I told him, it is your son, you should go, give him your blessing. No, the old beast persisted. Let him go to the devil. What sort of father has he been to me? He has been a scoundrel all his life, and remains a scoundrel. Vasenka. Do you speak of your father like this? said the old woman reproachfully, straightening herself. About my father. About your own father? He is no father to me. It was strange and absurd. Before him was the thought of death, while here something small, empty and trivial arose, and his words cracked like the shells of nuts underfoot. And almost crying with sorrow, because of the eternal misunderstanding which all his life long had stood like a wall between him and those nearest to him, and which even now, in the last hour before death, peered at him stupidly and strangely through small, widely opened eyes, Vasily exclaimed. Don't you understand that I am to be hanged soon? Hanged. Do you understand it? Hanged. You shouldn't have harmed anybody and nobody would, cried the old woman. My God! What is this? Even beasts do not act like this. Am I not your son? He began to cry, and seated himself in a corner. The old woman also burst out crying in her corner. Powerless, even for an instant, to blend in a feeling of love and to offset by it the horror of impending death, they wept their cold tears of loneliness which did not warm their hearts. The mother said, you ask whether I am a mother to you? You reproach me. And I have grown completely grey during these days. I have become an old woman. And yet you say, you reproach me. Well, mother, it is all right. Forgive me. It is time for you to go. Kiss my brothers for me. Am I not your mother? Do I not feel sorry? At last she went away. She wept bitterly, wiping her face with the edges of her kerchief, and she did not see the road. And the farther she got from the prison the more bitterly she wept. She retraced her steps to the prison, and then she strangely lost her way in the city in which she had been born, in which she lived to her old age. She strolled into a deserted little garden with a few old, gnarled trees, and she seated herself upon a wet bench, from which the snow had melted and suddenly she understood. He was to be hanged upon the morrow. The old woman jumped up, about to run, but suddenly her head began to swim terribly and she fell to the ground. The icy path was wet and slippery, and she could not rise. She turned about, lifted herself on her elbows and knelt, then fell back on her side. 
The black kerchief had slipped down, bearing upon the back of her head a bald spot amid her muddy gray hair. And then somehow it seemed to her that she was feasting at a wedding, that her son was getting married, and she had been drinking wine and had become intoxicated. I can't. My God. I can't. She cried, as though declining something. Swaying her head, she crawled over the wet, frozen crust, and all the time it seemed to her that they were pouring out more wine for her, more wine. And her heart had already begun to pain her from her intoxicated laughter, from the rejoicing, from the wild dancing, and they kept on pouring more wine for her, pouring more wine. Chapter 6 The Hours Are Rushing on the fortress where the condemned terrorists were imprisoned there was a steeple with an old-fashioned clock upon it. At every hour, at every half-hour, and at every quarter-hour the clock rang out in long-drawn, mournful chimes, slowly melting high in the air, like the distant and plaintive call of migrating birds. In the daytime, this strange and sad music was lost in the noise of the city, of the wide and crowded street which passed near the fortress. The cars buzzed along, the hoofs of the horses beat upon the pavements, the rocking automobiles honked in the distance. Peasant Izvizchiks had come especially from the outskirts of the city for the Shrovetide season and the tinkling of the bells upon the necks of their little horses filled the air. The prattle of voices, an intoxicated, merry Shrovetide prattle of voices arose everywhere. And in the midst of these various noises there was the young thawing spring, the muddy pools on the meadows, the trees of the squares which had suddenly become black. From the sea a warm breeze was blowing in broad, moist gusts. It was almost as if one could have seen the tiny fresh particles of air carried away, merged into the free, endless expanse of the atmosphere, could have heard them laughing in their flight. At night the street grew quiet in the lonely light of the large, electric sun. And then, the enormous fortress, within whose walls there was not a single light, passed into darkness and silence, separating itself from the ever-living, stirring city by a wall of silence. Motionlessness and darkness. Then it was that the strokes of the clock became audible. A strange melody, foreign to earth, was slowly and mournfully born and died out up in the heights. It was born again. Deceiving the ear, it rang plaintively and softly, it broke off, and rang again. Like large, transparent, glassy drops, hours and minutes descended from an unknown height into a metallic, softly resounding bell. This was the only sound that reached the cells, by day and night, where the condemned remained in solitary confinement. Through the roof, through the thickness of the stone walls, it penetrated, stirring the silence, it passed unnoticed, to return again, also unnoticed. Sometimes they awaited it in despair, living from one sound to the next, trusting the silence no longer. Only important criminals were sent to this prison. There were special rules there, stern, grim and severe, like the corner of the fortress wall, and if there be nobility in cruelty, then the dull, dead, solemnly mute silence. Which caught the slightest rustle and breathing, was noble. And in this solemn silence, broken by the mournful tolling of the departing minutes, separated from all that lives, five human beings, two women and three men, waited for the advent of night. Of dawn and the execution, and all of them prepared for it, each in his or her own way. Chapter 7 There is no death. Just as Tanya Kovalchuk had thought all her life only of others and never of herself, so now she suffered and grieved painfully, but only for her comrades. She pictured death, only as awaiting them, as something tormenting only to Sergei Golovin, to Musia, to the others, as for herself, it did not concern her. As a recompense for her firmness and restraint in the courtroom she wept for long hours, as old women who have experienced great misery. Or as very sympathetic and kind-hearted young people know how to weep. And the fear that perhaps Serioza was without tobacco or Werner without the strong tea to which he was accustomed, in addition to the fact that they were to die, caused her no less pain than the idea of the execution itself. Death was something inevitable and even unimportant, of which it was not worth while to think. But for a man in prison, before his execution, to be left without tobacco, 
that was altogether unbearable. She recalled and went over in her mind all the pleasant details of their life together, and then she grew faint with fear when she pictured to herself the meeting between Sergei and his parents. She felt particularly sorry for Musia. It had long seemed to her that Musia loved Werner, and although this was not a fact, she still dreamed of something good and bright for both of them. When she had been free, Musia had worn a silver ring, on which was the design of a skull, bones, and a crown of thorns about them. Tanya Kovalchuk had often looked upon the ring as a symbol of doom, and she would ask Musia, now in jest, now in earnest, to remove the ring. Make me a present of it, she had begged. No, Tanechka, I will not give it to you. But perhaps you will soon have another ring upon your finger. For some reason or other they all in turn had thought that she would doubtless soon marry, and this had offended her, she wanted no husband. And recalling these half-jesting conversations with Musia, and the fact that now Musia was actually condemned to death, she choked with tears in her maternal pity. And each time the clock struck she raised her tear-stained face and listened, how were they in the other cells receiving this drawn-out, persistent call of death? But Musia was happy. With her hands folded behind her back, dressed in a prisoner's garb which was much too large for her. And which made her look very much like a man, like a stripling dressed in someone else's clothes, she paced her cell evenly and tirelessly. The sleeves of the coat were too long for her, and she turned them up, and her thin, almost childish, emaciated hands peeped out of the wide holes like a beautiful flower out of a coarse earthen jug. The rough material of the coat rubbed her thin white neck, and sometimes Musia would free her throat with both hands and would cautiously feel the spot where the irritated skin was red and smarted. Musia paced the cell, and, blushing in agitation, she imagined that she was justifying herself before the people. She tried to justify herself for the fact that she, who was so young, so insignificant, who had done so little, and who was not at all a heroine, was yet to undergo the same honorable and beautiful death by which real heroes and martyrs had died before her. With unshakable faith in human kindness, in their compassion, in their love, she pictured to herself how people were now agitated on her account, how they suffered, how they pitied her. And she felt so ashamed that she blushed, as if, by dying upon the scaffold, she had committed some tremendous, awkward blunder. At the last meeting with their council she had asked him to bring her poison, but suddenly she had changed her mind. What if he and the others, she thought, should consider that she was doing it merely to become conspicuous, or out of cowardice, that instead of dying modestly and unnoticed. She was attempting to glorify herself. And she added hastily. No, it isn't necessary. And now she desired but one thing, to be able to explain to people, to prove to them so that they should have not the slightest doubt that she was not at all a heroine. That it was not terrible to die, that they should not feel sorry for her, nor trouble themselves about her. She wished to be able to explain to them that she was not at all to blame that she, who was so young and so insignificant, was to undergo such a martyr's death. And that so much trouble should be made on her account. Like a person who is actually accused of a crime, Musia sought justification. She endeavored to find something that would at least make her sacrifice more momentous, which might give it real value. She reasoned. Of course, I am young and could have lived for a long time. But. And as a candle darkens in the glare of the rising sun, so her youth and her life seemed dull and dark compared to that great and resplendent radiance which would shine above her simple head. There was no justification. But perhaps that peculiar something which she bore in her soul, boundless love, boundless eagerness to do great deeds, her boundless contempt for herself, was a justification in itself. She felt that she was really not to blame that she was hindered from doing the thing she could have done, which she had wished to do, that she had been smitten upon the threshold of the temple. At the foot of the altar. But if that were so, if a person is appreciated not only for what he has done, but also for what he had intended to do, then, then she was worthy of the crown of the martyr. Is it possible? Thought Musia bashfully. Is it possible that I am worthy of it? That I deserve that people should weep for me, 
should be agitated over my fate, over such a little and insignificant girl? And she was seized with sudden joy. There were no doubts, no hesitations, she was received into their midst, she entered justified the ranks of those noble people who always ascend to heaven through fires, tortures and executions. Bright peace and tranquility in endless, calmly radiant happiness. It was as if she had already departed from earth and was nearing the unknown sun of truth and life, and was incorporeally soaring in its light. And that is, death? That is not death. Thought Musia blissfully. And if scientists, philosophers and hangmen from the world over should come to her cell, spreading before her books, scalpels, axes and nooses, and were to attempt to prove to her that death existed, that a human being dies and is killed, that there is no immortality, they would only surprise her. How could there be no deathlessness, since she was already deathless? Of what other deathlessness, of what other death, could there be a question, since she was already dead and immortal, alive in death, as she had been dead in life? And if a coffin were brought into her cell with her own decomposing body in it, and she were told, Look! That is you! She would look and would answer. No, it is not I. And if they should attempt to convince her, frightening her by the ominous sight of her own decomposed body, that it was she, she, Musia, would answer with a smile. No. You think that it is I, but it isn't. I am the one you are speaking to, how can I be the other one? But you will die and become like that. No, I will not die. You will be executed. Here is the noose. I will be executed, but I will not die. How can I die, when I am already, now, immortal? And the scientists and philosophers and hangmen would retreat, speaking, with a shudder. Do not touch this place. It is holy. What else was Musia thinking about? She was thinking of many things, for to her the thread of life was not broken by death, but kept winding along calmly and evenly. She thought of her comrades, of those who were far away, and who in pain and sorrow were living through the execution together with them, and of those nearby who were to mount the scaffold with her. She was surprised at Vasily, that he should have been so disturbed, he, who had always been so brave, and who had jested with death. Thus, only on Tuesday morning, when altogether they had attached explosive projectiles to their belts, which several hours later were to tear them into pieces. Tanya Kovalchuk's hands had trembled with nervousness, and it had become necessary to put her aside, while Vasily jested, made merry, turned about. And was even so reckless that Werner had said sternly. You must not be too familiar with death. What was he afraid of now? But this incomprehensible fear was so foreign to Musia's soul that she ceased searching for the cause of it, and suddenly she was seized with a desperate desire to see Serio Zagolovin. To laugh with him. She meditated a little while, and then an even more desperate desire came over her to see Werner and to convince him of something. And imagining to herself that Werner was in the next cell, driving his heels into the ground with his distinct, measured steps, Musia spoke, as if addressing him. No, Werner, my dear. It is all nonsense, it isn't at all important whether or not you are killed. You are a sensible man, but you seem to be playing chess, and that by taking one figure after another the game is won. The important thing, Werner, is that we ourselves are ready to die. Do you understand? What do those people think? That there is nothing more terrible than death. They themselves have invented death, they are themselves afraid of it, and they try to frighten us with it. I should like to do this, I should like to go out alone before a whole regiment of soldiers and fire upon them with a revolver. It would not matter that I would be alone, while they would be thousands, or that I might not kill any of them. It is that which is important, that they are thousands. When thousands kill one, it means that the one has conquered. That is true, Werner, my dear. But this, too, became so clear to her that she did not feel like arguing further, Werner must understand it himself. Perhaps her mind simply did not want to stop at one thought, just as a bird that soars with ease, which sees endless horizons, 
and to which all space, all the depth, all the joy of the soft and caressing azure are accessible. The bell of the clock rang unceasingly, disturbing the deep silence. And into this harmonious, remote, beautiful sound the thoughts of the people flowed, and also began to ring for her. And the smoothly gliding images turned into music. It was just as if, on a quiet, dark night, Musia was riding along a broad, even road, while the easy springs of the carriage rocked her and the little bells tinkled. All alarm and agitation had passed, the fatigued body had dissolved in the darkness, and her joyously wearied fancy calmly created bright images. Carried away by their color and their peaceful tranquility. Musia recalled three of her comrades who had been hanged but a short time before, and their faces seemed bright and happy and near to her, nearer than those in life. Thus does a man think with joy in the morning of the house of his friends where he is to go in the evening, and a greeting rises to his smiling lips. Musia became very tired from walking. She lay down cautiously on the cot and continued to dream with slightly closed eyes. The clock bell rang unceasingly, stirring the mute silence, and bright, singing images floated calmly before her. Musia thought. Is it possible that this is death? My God! How beautiful it is! Or is it life? I do not know. I do not know. I will look and listen. Her hearing had long given way to her imagination, from the first moment of her imprisonment. Inclined to be very musical, her ear had become keen in the silence, and on this background of silence, out of the meager bits of reality, the footsteps of the guards in the corridors. The ringing of the clock, the rustling of the wind on the iron roof, the creaking of the lantern, it created complete musical pictures. At first Musia was afraid of them, brushed them away from her as if they were the hallucinations of a sickly mind. But later she understood that she herself was well, and that this was no derangement of any kind, and she gave herself up to the dreams calmly. And now, suddenly, she seemed to hear clearly and distinctly the sounds of military music. In astonishment, she opened her eyes, lifted her head, outside the window was black night, and the clock was striking. Again, she thought calmly, and closed her eyes. And as soon as she did so the music resounded anew. She could hear distinctly how the soldiers, a whole regiment, were coming from behind the corner of the fortress, on the right, and now they were passing her window. Their feet beat time with measured steps upon the frozen ground, one two. One two. She could even hear at times the leather of the boots creaking, how suddenly someone's foot slipped and immediately recovered its steps. And the music came ever nearer, it was an entirely unfamiliar but a very loud and spirited holiday march. Evidently there was some sort of celebration in the fortress. Now the band came up alongside of her window and the cell was filled with merry, rhythmic, harmoniously blended sounds. One large brass trumpet brayed harshly out of tune, now too late, now comically running ahead, Musia could almost see the little soldier playing it. A great expression of earnestness on his face, and she laughed. Then everything moved away. The footsteps died out, one two. One two. At a distance the music sounded still more beautiful and cheerful. The trumpet resounded now and then with its merry, loud brass voice, out of tune, and then everything died away. And the clock on the tower struck again, slowly, mournfully, hardly stirring the silence. They are gone, thought Musia, with a feeling of slight sadness. She felt sorry for the departing sounds, which had been so cheerful and so comical. She was even sorry for the departed little soldiers, because those busy soldiers, with their brass trumpets and their creaking boots, were of an entirely different sort. Not at all like those at whom she had felt like firing a revolver. Come again, she begged tenderly. And more came. The figures bent over her, they surrounded her in a transparent cloud and lifted her up, where the migrating birds were soaring and screaming, like heralds. On the right of her, on the left, above and below her, they screamed like heralds. They called, they announced from afar their flight. 
They flapped their wide wings and the darkness supported them, even as the light had supported them. And on their convex breasts, cleaving the air asunder, the city far below reflected a blue light. Musia's heart beat ever more evenly, her breathing grew ever more calm and quiet. She was falling asleep. Her face looked fatigued and pale. Beneath her eyes were dark circles, her girlish, emaciated hands seemed so thin, but upon her lips was a smile. Tomorrow, with the rise of the sun, this human face would be distorted with an inhuman grimace, her brain would be covered with thick blood. And her eyes would bulge from their sockets and look glassy, but now she slept quietly and smiled in her great immortality. Musia fell asleep. And the life of the prison went on, deaf and sensitive, blind and sharp-sighted, like eternal alarm itself. Somewhere people were walking. Somewhere people were whispering. A gun clanked. It seemed as if someone shouted. Perhaps no one shouted at all, perhaps it merely seemed so in the silence. The little casement window in the door opened noiselessly. A dark, mustached face appeared in the black hole. For a long time it stared at Musia in astonishment, and then disappeared as noiselessly as it had appeared. The bells rang and sang, for a long time, painfully. It seemed as if the tired hours were climbing up a high mountain toward midnight, and that it was becoming ever harder and harder to ascend. They fall, they slip, they slide down with a groan, and then again, they climb painfully toward the black height. Somewhere people were walking. Somewhere people were whispering. And they were already harnessing the horses to the black carriages without lanterns. Chapter 8 There is death as well as life. Sergei Golovin never thought of death, as though it were something not to be considered, something that did not concern him in the least. He was a strong, healthy, cheerful youth, endowed with that calm. Clear joy of living which causes every evil thought and feeling that might injure life to disappear from the organism without leaving any trace. Just as all cuts, wounds, and stings on his body healed rapidly, so all that weighed upon his soul and wounded it immediately rose to the surface and disappeared. And he brought into every work, even into his enjoyments, the same calm and optimistic seriousness, it mattered not whether he was occupied with photography with bicycling or with preparations for a terroristic act. Everything in life was joyous, everything in life was important, everything should be done well. And he did everything well, he was an excellent sailor, an expert shot with the revolver. He was as faithful in friendship as in love, and a fanatic believer in the word of honor. His comrades laughed at him, saying that if the most notorious spy told him upon his word of honor that he was not a spy, Sergei would believe him and would shake hands with him as with any comrade. He had one fault, he was convinced that he could sing well, whereas in fact he had no ear for music and even sang the revolutionary songs out of tune. And felt offended when his friends laughed at him. Either you are all asses, or I am an ass, he would declare seriously and even angrily. And all his friends as seriously declared, you are an ass we can tell by your voice. But, as is sometimes the case with good people, he was perhaps liked more for this little foible than for his good qualities. He feared death so little and thought of it so little that on the fatal morning, before leaving the house of Tanya Kovalchuk, he was the only one who had breakfasted properly, with an appetite. He drank two glasses of tea with milk, and a whole five kopeck roll of bread. Then he glanced at Werner's untouched bread and said, why don't you eat? Eat. We must brace up. I don't feel like eating. Then I'll eat it. May I? You have a fine appetite, Serioza. Instead of answering, Sergei, his mouth full, began to sing in a dull voice, out of tune. Hostile whirlwinds are blowing over us. After the arrest he at first grew sad. The work had not been done well, they had failed but then he thought, there is something else now that must be done well, and that is, to die, and he cheered up again. And however strange it may seem, beginning with the second morning in the fortress. 
he commenced devoting himself to gymnastics according to the unusually rational system of a certain German named Muller, which absorbed his interest. He undressed himself completely and, to the alarm and astonishment of the guard who watched him, he carefully went through all the prescribed eighteen exercises. The fact that the guard watched him and was apparently astonished, pleased him as a propagandist of the Muller system. And although he knew that he would get no answer he nevertheless spoke to the eye staring in the little window. It's a good system, my friend, it braces you up. It should be introduced in your regiment, he shouted convincingly and kindly, so as not to frighten the soldier, not suspecting that the guard considered him a harmless lunatic. The fear of death came over him gradually. It was as if somebody were striking his heart a powerful blow with the fist from below. This sensation was rather painful than terrible. Then the sensation was forgotten, but it returned again a few hours later, and each time it grew more intense and of longer duration, and thus it began to assume vague outlines of some great, even unbearable fear. Is it possible that I am afraid? thought Sergei in astonishment. What nonsense! It was not he who was afraid, it was his young, sound, strong body, which could not be deceived either by the exercises prescribed by the Muller system, or by the cold rubdowns. On the contrary, the stronger and the fresher his body became after the cold water, the keener and the more unbearable became the sensations of his recurrent fear. And just at those moments when, during his freedom, he had felt a special influx of the joy and power of life, in the mornings after he had slept soundly and gone through his physical exercises, now there appeared this deadening fear which was so foreign to his nature. He noticed this and thought. It is foolish, Sergei. To die more easily, you should weaken the body and not strengthen it. It is foolish. So he dropped his gymnastics and the rubdowns. To the soldier he shouted, as if to explain and justify himself. Never mind that I have stopped. It's a good thing, my friend, but not for those who are to be hanged. But it's very good for all others. And, indeed, he began to feel somewhat better. He tried also to eat less, so as to grow still weaker, but notwithstanding the lack of pure air and exercises, his appetite was very good, it was difficult for him to control it. And he ate everything that was brought to him. Then he began to manage differently, before starting to eat he would pour out half into the pail, and this seemed to work. A dull drowsiness and faintness came over him. I'll show you what I can do, he threatened his body, and at the same time sadly, yet tenderly he felt his flabby, softened muscles with his hand. Soon, however, his body grew accustomed to this regime as well, and the fear of death appeared again, not so keen, nor so burning, but more disgusting, somewhat akin to a nauseating sensation. It's because they are dragging it out so long, thought Sergei. It would be a good idea to sleep all the time till the day of the execution, and he tried to sleep as much as possible. At first he succeeded, but later, either because he had slept too much, or for some other reason, insomnia appeared. And with it came eager, penetrating thoughts and a longing for life. I am not afraid of this devil, he thought of death. I simply feel sorry for my life. It is a splendid thing, no matter what the pessimists say about it. What if they were to hang a pessimist? Ah, I feel sorry for life, very sorry. And why does my beard grow now? It didn't grow before, but suddenly it grows, why? He shook his head mournfully, heaving long, painful sighs. Silence, then a sigh, then a brief silence again, followed by a longer, deeper sigh. Thus it went on until the trial and the terrible meeting with his parents. When he awoke in his cell the next day he realized clearly that everything between him and life was ended. That there were only a few empty hours of waiting and then death would come, and a strange sensation took possession of him. He felt as though he had been stripped, stripped entirely, as if not only his clothes, but the sun, the air, the noise of voices and his ability to do things had been wrested from him. Death was not there as yet, but life was there no longer, there was something new, something astonishing, inexplicable. 
not entirely reasonable and yet not altogether without meaning, something so deep and mysterious and supernatural that it was impossible to understand. Fie, you devil, wondered Sergei, painfully. What is this? Where am I? I, who am I? He examined himself attentively, with interest, beginning with his large prison slippers, ending with his stomach where his coat protruded. He paced the cell, spreading out his arms and continuing to survey himself like a woman in a new dress which is too long for her. He tried to turn his head, and it turned. And this strange, terrible, uncouth creature was he, Sergei Golovin, and soon he would be no more. Everything became strange. He tried to walk across the cell, and it seemed strange to him that he could walk. He tried to sit down, and it seemed strange to him that he could sit. He tried to drink some water, and it seemed strange to him that he could drink, that he could swallow, that he could hold the cup, that he had fingers and that those fingers were trembling. He choked, began to cough and while coughing, thought, how strange it is that I am coughing. Am I losing my reason, thought Sergei, growing cold. Am I coming to that, too? The devil take them. He rubbed his forehead with his hand, and this also seemed strange to him. And then he remained breathless, motionless, petrified for hours, suppressing every thought, all loud breathing, all motion, for every thought seemed to him but madness, every motion, madness. Time was no more, it appeared transformed into space, airless and transparent, into an enormous square upon which all were there, the earth and life and people. He saw all that at one glance, all to the very end, to the mysterious abyss, death. And he was tortured not by the fact that death was visible, but that both life and death were visible at the same time. The curtain which through eternity has hidden the mystery of life and the mystery of death was pushed aside by a sacrilegious hand. And the mysteries ceased to be mysteries, yet they remained incomprehensible, like the truth written in a foreign tongue. There were no conceptions in his human mind, no words in his human language that could define what he saw. And the words, I am afraid, were uttered by him only because there were no other words, because no other conceptions existed, nor could other conceptions exist which would grasp this new, unhuman condition. Thus would it be with a man if, while remaining within the bounds of human reason, experience, and feelings, he were suddenly to see God himself. He would see him but would not understand, even though he knew that it was God, and he would tremble with inconceivable sufferings of incomprehension. There is Muller for you. He suddenly uttered loudly, with extreme conviction, and shook his head. And with that unexpected break in his feelings, of which the human soul is so capable, he laughed heartily and cheerfully. Oh, Muller! My dear Muller! Oh, you splendid German! After all you are right, Muller, and I am an ass! He paced the cell quickly several times and to the great astonishment of the soldier who was watching him through the peephole. He quickly undressed himself and cheerfully went through all the eighteen exercises with the greatest care. He stretched and expanded his young, somewhat emaciated body, sat down for a moment, drew deep breaths of air and exhaled it, stood up on tiptoe, stretched his arms and his feet. And after each exercise he announced, with satisfaction. That's it. That's the real way, Muller. His cheeks flushed. Drops of warm, pleasant perspiration came from the pores of his body, and his heart beat soundly and evenly. The fact is, Muller, philosophized Sergei, expanding his chest so that the ribs under his thin, tight skin were outlined clearly, the fact is. That there is a nineteenth exercise, to hang by the neck motionless. That is called execution. Do you understand, Muller? They take a live man, let us say Sergei Golovin, they swaddle him as a doll and they hang him by the neck until he is dead. It is a foolish exercise, Muller, but it can't be helped, we have to do it. He bent over on the right side and repeated. We have to do it, Muller. Chapter 9 Dreadful Solitude Under the same ringing of the clock, separated from Sergei and Musia by only a few empty cells. 
but yet so painfully desolate and alone in the whole world as though no other soul existed, poor Vasily Kasherin was passing the last hours of his life in terror and in anguish. Perspiring, his moist shirt clinging to his body, his once curly hair disheveled, he tossed about in the cell convulsively and hopelessly, like a man suffering from an unbearable physical torture. He would sit down for a while, then start to run again, he would press his forehead against the wall, stop and seek something with his eyes, as if looking for some medicine. His expression changed as though he had two different faces. The former, the young face, had disappeared somewhere, and a new one, a terrible face that had seemed to have come out of the darkness, had taken its place. The fear of death had come upon him all at once and taken possession of him completely and forcibly. In the morning, while facing almost certain death, he had been carefree and had scorned it, but toward evening when he was placed in a cell in solitary confinement. He was whirled and carried away by a wave of mad fear. So long as he went of his own free will to face danger and death, so long as he had death, even though it seemed terrible, in his own hands, he felt at ease. He was even cheerful. In the sensation of boundless freedom, of brave and firm conviction of his fearless will, his little, shrunken, womanish fear was drowned, leaving no trace. With an infernal machine at his girdle, he made the cruel force of dynamite his own, also its fiery death-bearing power. And as he walked along the street, amidst the bustling, plain people, who were occupied with their affairs, who were hurriedly avoiding the dangers from the horses of carriages and cars. He seemed to himself as a stranger from another, unknown world, where neither death nor fear was known. And suddenly this harsh, wild, stupefying change. He can no longer go where he pleases, but he is led where others please. He can no longer choose the place he likes, but he is placed in a stone cage, and locked up like a thing. He can no longer choose freely, like all people, between life and death, but he will surely and inevitably be put to death. The incarnation of willpower, life and strength an instant before, he has now become a wretched image of the most pitiful weakness in the world. He has been transformed into an animal waiting to be slaughtered, a deaf-mute object which may be taken from place to place, burnt and broken. It matters not what he might say, nobody would listen to his words, and if he endeavored to shout, they would stop his mouth with a rag. Whether he can walk alone or not, they will take him away and hang him. And if he should offer resistance, struggle or lie down on the ground, they will overpower him, lift him, bind him and carry him, bound, to the gallows. And the fact that this machine-like work will be performed over him by human beings like himself, lent to them a new, extraordinary and ominous aspect, they seemed to him like ghosts that came to him for this one purpose, or like automatic puppets on springs. They would seize him, take him, carry him, hang him, pull him by the feet. They would cut the rope, take him down, carry him off and bury him. From the first day of his imprisonment the people and life seemed to him to have turned into an incomprehensibly terrible world of phantoms and automatic puppets. Almost maddened with fear, he attempted to picture to himself that human beings had tongues and that they could speak, but he could not, they seemed to him to be mute. He tried to recall their speech, the meaning of the words that people used in their relations with one another, but he could not. Their mouths seemed to open, some sounds were heard. Then they moved their feet and disappeared. And nothing more. Thus would a man feel if he were at night alone in his house and suddenly all objects were to come to life, start to move and overpower him. And suddenly they would all begin to judge him, the cupboard, the chair, the writing table and the divan. He would cry and toss about, entreating, calling for help, while they would speak among themselves in their own language, and then would lead him to the scaffold, they, the cupboard, the chair, the writing table and the divan and the other objects would look on. To Vasily Kasherin, who was condemned to death by hanging, everything now seemed like children's playthings, his cell, the door with the peephole, the strokes of the wound-up clock. The carefully molded fortress, and especially that mechanical puppet with the gun who stamped his feet in the corridor, and the others who, frightening him, peeped into his cell through the little window and handed him the food in silence. 
and that which he was experiencing was not the fear of death, death was now rather welcome to him. Death with all its eternal mysteriousness and incomprehensibility was more acceptable to his reason than this strangely and fantastically changed world. What is more, death seemed to have been destroyed completely in this insane world of phantoms and puppets, having lost its great and enigmatic significance. Becoming something mechanical and only for that reason terrible. He would be seized, taken, led, hanged, pulled by the feet, the rope would be cut, he would be taken down, carried off and buried. And the man would have disappeared from the world. At the trial the nearness of his comrades brought Kasherin to himself. For an instant he imagined he saw real people. They were sitting and trying him, speaking like human beings, listening, apparently understanding him. But as he mentally rehearsed the meeting with his mother he clearly felt with the terror of a man who is beginning to lose his reason and who realizes it. That this old woman in the black little kerchief was only an artificial, mechanical puppet, of the kind that can say, Papa, Mama, but somewhat better constructed. He tried to speak to her, while thinking at the same time with a shudder. Oh Lord! That is a puppet. A mother doll. And there is a soldier puppet, and there, at home, is a father puppet, and this is the puppet of Vasily Kasherin. It seemed to him that in another moment he would hear somewhere the creaking of the mechanism, the screeching of unoiled wheels. When his mother began to cry, something human again flashed for an instant, but at the very first words it disappeared again. And it was interesting and terrible to see that water was flowing from the eyes of the doll. Then, in his cell, when the terror had become unbearable, Vasily Kasherin attempted to pray. Of all that had surrounded his childhood days in his father's house under the guise of religion only a repulsive, bitter and irritating sediment remained, but faith there was none. But once, perhaps in his earliest childhood, he had heard a few words which had filled him with palpitating emotion and which remained during all his life enwrapped with tender poetry. These words were. The joy of all the afflicted. It had happened, during painful periods in his life, that he whispered to himself, not in prayer, without being definitely conscious of it. These words, the joy of all the afflicted, and suddenly he would feel relieved and a desire would come over him to go to some dear friend and question gently. Our life, is this life? Eh, my dearest, is this life? And then suddenly it would appear laughable to him and he would feel like musing up his hair, putting forth his knee and thrusting out his chest as though to receive heavy blows. Saying, here, strike. He did not tell anybody, not even his nearest comrades, about his, joy of all the afflicted, and it was as though he himself did not know about it, so deeply was it hidden in his soul. He recalled it but rarely and cautiously. Now when the terror of the insoluble mystery, which appeared so plainly before him, enveloped him completely. Even as the water in high flood covers the willow twigs on the shore, a desire came upon him to pray. He felt like kneeling, but he was ashamed of the soldier and, folding his arms on his chest, he whispered softly. The joy of all the afflicted. And he repeated tenderly, in anguish. Joy of all the afflicted, come to me, help Vasca Kasherin. Long ago, while he was yet in his first term at the university and used to go off on a spree sometimes, before he had made the acquaintance of Werner and before he had entered the organization. He used then to call himself half-boastingly, half-pityingly, Vaska Kasherin, and now for some reason or other he suddenly felt like calling himself by the same name again. But the words had a dead and toneless sound. The joy of all the afflicted. Something stirred. It was as though someone's calm and mournful image had flashed up in the distance and died out quietly, without illuminating the deathly gloom. The wound-up clock in the steeple struck. The soldier in the corridor made a noise with his gun or with his saber and he yawned, slowly, at intervals. Joy of all the afflicted. You are silent. Will you not say anything to Vaska Kasherin? He smiled patiently and waited. All was empty within his soul and about him. And the calm, mournful image did not reappear. He recalled, painfully and unnecessarily, wax candles burning. 
the priest in his vestments, the icon painted on the wall. He recalled his father, bending and stretching himself, praying and bowing to the ground, while looking sidewise to see whether Vasco was praying, or whether he was planning some mischief. And a feeling of still greater terror came over Vasily than before the prayer. Everything now disappeared. Madness came crawling painfully. His consciousness was dying out like an extinguishing bonfire, growing icy like the corpse of a man who had just died. Whose heart is still warm but whose hands and feet had already become stiffened with cold. His dying reason flared up as red as blood again and said that he, Vasily Kasharin, might perhaps become insane here, suffer pains for which there is no name. Reach a degree of anguish and suffering that had never been experienced by a single living being. That he might beat his head against the wall, pick his eyes out with his fingers, speak and shout whatever he pleased. That he might plead with tears that he could endure it no longer, and nothing would happen. Nothing could happen and nothing happened. His feet, which had a consciousness and life of their own, continued to walk and to carry his trembling, moist body. His hands, which had a consciousness of their own, endeavored in vain to fasten the coat which was open at his chest and to warm his trembling, moist body. His body quivered with cold. His eyes stared. And this was calm itself embodied. But there was one more moment of wild terror. That was when people entered his cell. He did not even imagine that this visit meant that it was time to go to the execution, he simply saw the people and was frightened like a child. I will not do it. I will not do it. He whispered inaudibly with his livid lips and silently retreated to the depth of the cell, even as in childhood he shrank when his father lifted his hand. We must start. The people were speaking, walking around him, handing him something. He closed his eyes, he shook a little, and began to dress himself slowly. His consciousness must have returned to him, for he suddenly asked the official for a cigarette. And the official generously opened his silver cigarette case upon which was a chaste figure in the style of the decadence. Chapter 10 The Walls Are Falling The unidentified man, who called himself Werner, was tired of life and struggle. There was a time when he loved life very dearly, when he enjoyed the theater, literature and social intercourse. Endowed with an excellent memory and a firm will, he had mastered several European languages and could easily pass for a German, a Frenchman or an Englishman. He usually spoke German with a Bavarian accent, but when he felt like it, he could speak like a born Berliner. He was fond of dress, his manners were excellent and he alone, of all the members of the organization, dared attend the balls given in high society. Without running the risk of being recognized as an outsider. But for a long time, altogether unnoticed by his comrades, there had ripened in his soul a dark contempt for mankind, contempt mingled with despair and painful, almost deadly fatigue. By nature rather a mathematician than a poet, he had not known until now any inspiration, any ecstasy, and at times he felt like a madman, looking for the squaring of a circle in pools of human blood. The enemy against whom he struggled every day could not inspire him with respect. It was a dense net of stupidity, treachery and falsehood, vile insults and base deceptions. The last incident which seemed to have destroyed in him forever the desire to live, was the murder of the provocateur which he had committed by order of the organization. He had killed him in cold blood, but when he saw that dead, deceitful, now calm, and after all pitiful, human face, he suddenly ceased to respect himself and his work. Not that he was seized with a feeling of repentance, but he simply stopped appreciating himself. He became uninteresting to himself, unimportant, a dull stranger. But being a man of strong, unbroken willpower, he did not leave the organization. He remained outwardly the same as before, only there was something cold, yet painful in his eyes. He never spoke to anyone of this. He possessed another rare quality, just as there are people who have never known headaches, so Werner had never known fear. When other people were afraid, he looked upon them without censure but also without any particular compassion, just as upon a rather contagious illness from which, however, he himself had never suffered. 
He felt sorry for his comrades, especially for Vajia Kasharin, but that was a cold, almost official pity, which even some of the judges may have felt at times. Werner understood that the execution was not merely death, that it was something different, but he resolved to face it calmly, as something not to be considered. To live until the end as if nothing had happened and as if nothing could happen. Only in this way could he express his greatest contempt for capital punishment and preserve his last freedom of the spirit which could not be torn away from him. At the trial, and even his comrades who knew well his cold. Haughty fearlessness would perhaps not have believed this, he thought neither of death nor of life, but concentrated his attention deeply and coolly upon a difficult chess game which he was playing. A superior chess player, he had started this game on the first day of his imprisonment and continued it uninterruptedly. Even the sentence condemning him to death by hanging did not remove a single figure from his imaginary chessboard. Even the knowledge that he would not be able to finish this game, did not stop him. And the morning of the last day that he was to remain on earth he started by correcting a not altogether successful move he had made on the previous day. Clasping his lowered hands between his knees, he sat for a long time motionless, then he rose and began to walk, meditating. His walk was peculiar, he leaned the upper part of his body slightly forward and stamped the ground with his heels firmly and distinctly. His steps usually left deep, plain imprints even on dry ground. He whistled softly, in one breath, a simple Italian melody, which helped his meditation. But this time for some reason or other the thing did not work well. With an unpleasant feeling that he had made some important, even grave blunder, he went back several times and examined the game almost from the beginning. He found no blunder, yet the feeling about a blunder committed not only failed to leave him, but even grew ever more intense and unpleasant. Suddenly an unexpected and offensive thought came into his mind, did the blunder perhaps consist in his playing chess simply because he wanted to distract his attention from the execution and thus shield himself against the fear of death which is apparently inevitable in every person condemned to death? No. What for, he answered coldly and closed calmly his imaginary chessboard. And with the same concentration with which he had played chess, he tried to give himself an account of the horror and the helplessness of his situation. As though he were going through a strict examination, he looked over the cell, trying not to let anything escape. He counted the hours that remained until the execution, made for himself an approximate and quite exact picture of the execution itself and shrugged his shoulders. Well? He said to someone half-questioningly. Here it is. Where is the fear? Indeed there was no fear. Not only was it not there, but something entirely different, the reverse of fear, developed, a sensation of confused, but enormous and savage joy. And the error, which he had not yet discovered, no longer called forth in him vexation or irritation, it seemed to speak loudly of something good and unexpected. As though he had believed a dear friend of his to be dead, and that friend turned out to be alive, safe and sound and laughing. Werner again shrugged his shoulders and felt his pulse, his heart was beating faster than usual, but soundly and evenly, with a specially ringing throb. He looked about once more, attentively, like a novice for the first time in prison, examined the walls, the bolts, the chair which was screwed to the floor, and thought. Why do I feel so easy? So joyous and free? Yes, so free? I think of the execution tomorrow and I feel as though it is not there. I look at the walls, and I feel as though they are not here, either. And I feel so free, as though I were not in prison, but had just come out of some prison where I had spent all my life. What does this mean? His hands began to tremble, something Werner had not experienced before. His thoughts fluttered ever more furiously. It was as if tongues of fire had flashed up in his mind, and the fire wanted to burst forth and illumine the distance which was still dark as night. Now the light pierced through and the widely illuminated distance began to shine. The fatigue that had tormented Werner during the last two years had disappeared. The dead, cold, heavy serpent with its closed eyes and mouth clinched in death, had fallen away from his breast. Before the face of death, beautiful youth came back to him physically. 
Indeed, it was more than beautiful youth. With that wonderful clarity of the spirit which in rare moments comes over man and lifts him to the loftiest peaks of meditation, Werner suddenly perceived both life and death. And he was awed by the splendor of the unprecedented spectacle. It seemed to him that he was walking along the highest mountain ridge, which was narrow like the blade of a knife, and on one side he saw life, on the other side, death, like two sparkling, deep, beautiful seas, blending in one boundless, broad surface at the horizon. What is this? What a divine spectacle, he said slowly, rising involuntarily and straightening himself, as if in the presence of a supreme being. And destroying the walls, space and time with the impetuosity of his all-penetrating look, he cast a wide glance somewhere into the depth of the life he was to forsake. And life appeared to him in a new light. He did not strive, as before, to clothe in words that which he had seen, nor were there such words in the still poor, meager human language. That small, cynical and evil feeling which had called forth in him a contempt for mankind and at times even an aversion for the sight of a human face, had disappeared completely. Thus, for a man who goes up in an airship, the filth and litter of the narrow streets disappear and that which was ugly becomes beautiful. Unconsciously Werner stepped over to the table and leaned his right hand on it. Proud and commanding by nature, he had never before assumed such a proud, free, commanding pose. Had never turned his head and never looked as he did now, for he had never yet been as free and dominant as he was here in the prison, with but a few hours from execution and death. Now men seemed new to him, they appeared amiable and charming to his clarified vision. Soaring over time, he saw clearly how young mankind was, that but yesterday it had been howling like a beast in the forests. And that which had seemed to him terrible in human beings, unpardonable and repulsive, suddenly became very dear to him, like the inability of a child to walk as grown people do. Like a child's unconnected lisping, flashing with sparks of genius. Like a child's comical blunders, errors and painful bruises. My dear people! Werner suddenly smiled and at once lost all that was imposing in his pose. He again became a prisoner who finds his cell narrow and uncomfortable under lock, and he was tired of the annoying, searching eye staring at him through the peephole in the door. And, strange to say, almost instantly he forgot all that he had seen a little while before so clearly and distinctly, and, what is still stranger, he did not even make an effort to recall it. He simply sat down as comfortably as possible, without the usual stiffness of his body, and surveyed the walls and the bars with a faint and gentle, strange, unwerner like smile. Still another new thing happened to Werner, something that had never happened to him before, he suddenly started to weep. My dear comrades, he whispered, crying bitterly. My dear comrades! By what mysterious ways did he change from the feeling of proud and boundless freedom to this tender and passionate compassion? He did not know, nor did he think of it. Did he pity his dear comrades, or did his tears conceal something else, a still loftier and more passionate feeling, his suddenly revived and rejuvenated heart did not know this either. He wept and whispered. My dear comrades! My dear, dear comrades! In this man, who was bitterly weeping and smiling through tears, no one could have recognized the cold and haughty, weary, yet daring Werner, neither the judges, nor the comrades. Nor even he himself. Chapter 11 On the Way to the Scaffold Before placing the condemned people in coaches, all five were brought together in a large cold room with a vaulted ceiling, which resembled an office. Where people worked no longer or a deserted waiting room. They were now permitted to speak to one another. Only Tanya Kovalchuk availed herself at once of the permission. The others firmly and silently shook each other's hands, which were as cold as ice and as hot as fire, and silently, trying not to look at each other, they crowded together in an awkward, absent-minded group. Now that they were together, they felt somewhat ashamed of what each of them had experienced when alone. And they were afraid to look, so as not to notice or to show that new, peculiar, somewhat shameful sensation that each of them felt or suspected the others of feeling. 
But after a short silence they glanced at each other, smiled and immediately began to feel at ease and unrestrained, as before. No change seemed to have occurred, and if it had occurred, it had come so gently over all of them that it could not be discerned in anyone separately. All spoke and moved about strangely, abruptly, by jolts, either too fast or too slowly. Sometimes they seemed to choke with their words and repeated them a number of times. Sometimes they did not finish a phrase they had started, or thought they had finished, they did not notice it. They all blinked their eyes and examined ordinary objects curiously, not recognizing them, like people who had worn eyeglasses and had suddenly taken them off. And all of them frequently turned around abruptly, as though someone behind them was calling them all the time and showing them something. But they did not notice this, either. Musia's and Tanya Kovalchuk's cheeks and ears were burning, Sergei was at first somewhat pale, but he soon recovered and looked as he always did. Only Vasily attracted everybody's attention. Even among them, he looked strange and terrible. Werner became agitated and said to Musia in a low voice, with tender anxiety. What does this mean, Musieka? Is it possible that he, what? I must go to him. Vasily looked at Werner from the distance, as though not recognizing him, and he lowered his eyes. Vasya, what have you done with your hair? What is the matter with you? Never mind, my dear, never mind, it will soon be over. We must keep up, we must, we must. Vasily was silent. But when it seemed that he would no longer say anything, a dull, belated, terribly remote answer came, like an answer from the grave. I'm all right. I hold my own. Then he repeated. I hold my own. Werner was delighted. That's the way, that's the way. Good boy. That's the way. But his eyes met Vasily's dark, wearied glance fixed upon him from the distance and he thought with instant sorrow, from where is he looking? From where is he speaking? And with profound tenderness, with which people address a grave, he said. Vasya, do you hear? I love you very much. So do I love you very much, answered the tongue, moving with difficulty. Suddenly Musia took Werner by the hand and with an expression of surprise, she said like an actress on the stage, with measured emphasis. Werner, what is this? You said, I love? You never before said, I love, to anybody. And why are you all so, tender and serene? Why? Why? And like an actor, also accentuating what he felt, Werner pressed Musia's hand firmly. Yes, now I love very much. Don't tell it to the others, it isn't necessary, I feel somewhat ashamed, but I love deeply. Their eyes met and flashed up brightly, and everything about them seemed to have plunged in darkness. It is thus that in the flash of lightning all other lights are instantly darkened and the heavy yellow flame casts a shadow upon earth. Yes, said Musia, yes, Werner. Yes, he answered, yes, Musia, yes. They understood each other and something was firmly settled between them at this moment. And his eyes glistening, Werner again became agitated and quickly stepped over to Sergei. Serioza. But Tanya Kovalchuk answered. Almost crying with maternal pride, she tugged Sergei frantically by the sleeve. Listen, Werner. I am crying here for him, I am wearing myself to death, and he is occupying himself with gymnastics. According to the Muller system, smiled Werner. Sergei knit his brow confusedly. You needn't laugh, Werner. I have convinced myself conclusively. All began to laugh. Drawing strength and courage from one another, they gradually regained their poise, became the same as they used to be. They did not notice this, however, and thought that they had never changed at all. Suddenly Werner interrupted their laughter and said to Sergei very earnestly. You are right, Serioza. You are perfectly right. No, but you must understand, said Golovin gladly. Of course, we. But at this point they were asked to start. And their jailers were so kind as to permit them to ride in pairs, as they pleased. 
Altogether the jailers were extremely kind, even too kind. It was as if they tried partly to show themselves humane and partly to show that they were not there at all, but that everything was being done as by machinery. But they were all pale. Musia, you go with him. Werner pointed at Vasily, who stood motionless. I understand, Musia nodded. And you? I. Tanya will go with Sergei, you go with Vasya. I will go alone. That doesn't matter. I can do it, you know. When they went out in the yard, the moist, soft darkness rushed warmly and strongly against their faces, their eyes, taking their breath away. Then suddenly it penetrated their bodies tenderly and refreshingly. It was hard to believe that this wonderful effect was produced simply by the spring wind, the warm, moist wind. And the really wonderful spring night was filled with the odor of melting snow, and through the boundless space the noise of drops resounded. Hastily and frequently, as though trying to overtake one another, little drops were falling, striking in unison a ringing tune. Suddenly one of them would strike out of tune and all was mingled in a merry splash in hasty confusion. Then a large, heavy drop would strike firmly and again the fast, spring melody resounded distinctly. And over the city, above the roofs of the fortress, hung a pale redness in the sky reflected by the electric lights. UACH. Sergei Golovin heaved a deep sigh and held his breath, as though he regretted to exhale from his lungs the fine, fresh air. How long have you had such weather? inquired Werner. It's real spring. It's only the second day, was the polite answer. Before that we had mostly frosty weather. The dark carriages rolled over noiselessly one after another, took them in by twos, started off into the darkness, there where the lantern was shaking at the gate. The convoys like grey silhouettes surrounded each carriage, the horseshoe struck noisily against the ground, or plashed upon the melting snow. When Werner bent down, about to climb into the carriage, the gendarme whispered to him. There is somebody else going along with you. Werner was surprised. Where? Where is he going? Oh, yes. Another one? Who is he? The gendarme was silent. Indeed, in a dark corner a small, motionless but living figure pressed close to the side of the carriage. By the reflection of the lantern Werner noticed the flash of an open eye. Seating himself, Werner pushed his foot against the other man's knee. Excuse me, comrade. The man made no reply. It was only when the carriage started, that he suddenly asked in broken Russian, speaking with difficulty. Who are you? I am Werner, condemned to hanging for the attempt upon N. And you? I am Yensun. They must not hang me. They were riding thus in order to appear two hours later face to face before the inexplicable great mystery, in order to pass from life to death and they were introducing each other. Life and death moved simultaneously, and until the very end life remained life, to the most ridiculous and insipid trifles. What have you done, Yen Sun? I killed my master with a knife. I stole money. It seemed from the tone of his voice that Yen Sun was falling asleep. Werner found his flabby hand in the darkness and pressed it. Yen Sun withdrew it drowsily. Are you afraid? asked Werner. I don't want to be hanged. They became silent. Werner again found the Estonian's hand and pressed it firmly between his dry, burning palms. Jansen's hand lay motionless, like a board, but he made no longer any effort to withdraw it. It was close and suffocating in the carriage. The air was filled with the smell of soldiers' clothes, mustiness, and the leather of wet boots. The young gendarme who sat opposite Werner breathed warmly upon him, and in his breath there was the odor of onions and cheap tobacco. But some brisk, fresh air came in through certain clefts, and because of this, spring was felt even more intensely in this small, stifling, moving box, than outside. The carriage kept turning now to the right, now to the left, now it seemed to turn back. At times it seemed as though they had been turning around on one and the same spot for hours for some reason or other. 
at first a bluish electric light penetrated through the lowered, heavy window shades. Then suddenly, after a certain turn it grew dark, and only by this could they guess that they had turned into deserted streets in the outskirts of the city and that they were nearing the S. Railroad Station Sometimes during sharp turns, Werner's live, bent knee would strike against the live, bent knee of the gendarme, and it was hard to believe that the execution was approaching. Where are we going? Yen Sun asked suddenly. He was somewhat dizzy from the continuous turning of the dark box and he felt slightly sick at his stomach. Werner answered and pressed the Estonian's hand more firmly. He felt like saying something especially kind and caressing to this little, sleepy man, and he already loved him as he had never loved anyone in his life. You don't seem to sit comfortably, my dear man. Move over here, to me. Yen Sun was silent for a while, then he replied. Well, thank you. I'm sitting all right. Are they going to hang you too? Yes, answered Werner, almost laughing with unexpected jollity, and he waved his hand easily and freely. As though he were speaking of some absurd and trifling joke which kind but terribly comical people wanted to play on him. Have you a wife? asked Yen Sun. No. I have no wife. I am single. I am also alone. Alone, said Yen Sun. Werner's head also began to feel dizzy. And at times it seemed that they were going to some festival. Strange to say. Almost all those who went to the scaffold experienced the same sensation and mingled with sorrow and fear there was a vague joy as they anticipated the extraordinary thing that was soon to befall them. Reality was intoxicated with madness and death, united with life, brought forth apparitions. It seemed very possible that flags were waving over the houses. We have arrived. Said Werner gaily when the carriage stopped, and he jumped out easily. But with Yen Sun it was a rather slow affair, silently and very drowsily he resisted and would not come out. He seized the knob. The gendarme opened the weak fingers and pulled his hand away. Then Yen Sun seized the corner of the carriage, the door, the high wheel, but immediately let it go upon the slightest effort on the part of the gendarme. He did not exactly seize these things. He rather cleaved to each object sleepily and silently, and was torn away easily, without any effort. Finally he got up. There were no flags. The railroad station was dark, deserted and lifeless. The passenger trains were not running any longer, and the train which was silently waiting for these passengers on the way needed no bright light, no commotion. Suddenly Werner began to feel weary. It was not fear, nor anguish, but a feeling of enormous, painful, tormenting weariness which makes one feel like going off somewhere, lying down and closing one's eyes very tightly. Werner stretched himself and yawned slowly. Yen Sun also stretched himself and quickly yawned several times. I wish they'd be quicker about it, said Werner wearily. Yen Sun was silent, shrinking together. When the condemned moved along the deserted platform which was surrounded by soldiers, to the dimly lighted cars, Werner found himself near Sergei Golovin. Sergei, pointing with his hand somewhere aside, began to say something, but only the word lantern was heard distinctly, and the rest was drowned in slow and weary yawning. What did you say? asked Werner, also yawning. The lantern. The lamp in the lantern is smoking, said Sergei. Werner looked around. Indeed, the lamp in the lantern was smoking very much and the glass had already turned black on top. Yes, it is smoking. Suddenly he thought, what have I to do with the smoking of the lamp, since? Sergei apparently thought the same, as he glanced quickly at Werner and turned away. But both stopped yawning. They all went to the cars themselves, only Yen Sun had to be led by the arms. At first he stamped his feet and his boots seemed to stick to the boards of the platform. Then he bent his knees and fell into the arms of the gendarmes, his feet dangled like those of a very intoxicated man, and the tips of the boots scraped against the wood. It took a long time until he was silently pushed through the door. Vasily Kasherin also moved himself, 
unconsciously imitating the movements of his comrades, he did everything as they did. But on boarding the platform of the car, he stumbled, and a gendarme took him by the elbow to support him. Vasily shuddered and screamed shrilly, drawing back his arm. A.I. What is it, Vajia? Werner rushed over to him. Vasily was silent, trembling in every limb. The confused and even offended gendarme explained. I wanted to keep him from falling, and he. Come, Vajia, let me hold you, said Werner, about to take him by the arm. But Vasily drew back his arm again and cried more loudly than before. A.I. Vajia, it is I, Werner. I know. Don't touch me. I'll go myself. And continuing to tremble he entered the car himself and seated himself in a corner. Bending over to Musia, Werner asked her softly, pointing with his eyes at Vasily. How about him? Bad, answered Musia, also in a soft voice. He is dead already. Werner, tell me, is there such a thing as death? I don't know, Musia, but I think that there is no such thing, replied Werner seriously and thoughtfully. That's what I have thought. But he? I was tortured with him in the carriage, it was like riding with a corpse. I don't know, Musia. Perhaps there is such a thing as death for some people. Meanwhile, perhaps, but later there will be no death. For me death also existed before, but now it exists no longer. Musia's somewhat pale cheeks flushed as she asked. It did exist, Werner. It did? It did. But not now any longer. Just the same as with you. A noise was heard in the doorway of the car. Mishka Tsiganok entered, stamping noisily with his heels, breathing loudly and spitting. He cast a swift glance and stopped obdurately. No room here, gendarme. He shouted to the tired gendarme who looked at him angrily. You make it so that I am comfortable here, otherwise I won't go, hang me here on the lamppost. What a carriage they gave me, dogs. Is that a carriage? It's the devil's belly, not a carriage. But suddenly he bent down his head, stretched out his neck and thus went forward to the others. Out of the disheveled frame of hair and beard his black eyes looked wildly and sharply with an almost insane expression. Ah, gentlemen, he drawled out. So that's what it is. Hello, master. He thrust his hand to Werner and sat down opposite him. And bending closely over to him, he winked one eye and quickly passed his hand over his throat. You, too? What? Yes, smiled Werner. Are all of us to be hanged? All. Oh ho. Tsiganok grinned, showing his teeth, and quickly felt everybody with his eyes, stopping for an instant longer on Musia and Yensun. Then he winked again to Werner. The minister? Yes, the minister. And you? I am here for something else, master. People like me don't deal with ministers. I am a murderer, master, that's what I am. An ordinary murderer. Never mind, master, move away a little, I haven't come into your company of my own will. There will be room enough for all of us in the other world. He surveyed them all with one swift, suspicious, wild glance from under his disheveled hair. But all looked at him silently and seriously, even with apparent interest. He grinned, showing his teeth, and quickly clapped Werner on the knee several times. That's the way, master. How does the song run? Don't rustle, oh green little mother forest. Why do you call me master, since we are all going? Correct, Tsiganok agreed with satisfaction. What kind of master are you, if you are going to hang right beside me? There is a master for you, and he pointed with his finger at the silent gendarme. Eh, that fellow there is not worse than our kind, he pointed with his eyes at Vasily. Master. Eh there, master. You're afraid, aren't you? No, answered the heavy tongue. Never mind that, no, don't be ashamed, there's nothing to be ashamed of. 
Only a dog wags his tail and snarls when he is taken to be hanged, but you are a man. Who is that dope? He isn't one of you, is he? He darted his glance rapidly about, and hissing, kept spitting continuously. Yen Sun, curled up into a motionless bundle, pressed closely into the corner. The flaps of his outworn fur cap stirred, but he maintained silence. Werner answered for him. He killed his employer. Oh Lord, wondered Tsiganok. Why are such people allowed to kill? For some time Tsiganok had been looking sideways at Musia, now turning quickly, he stared at her sharply, straight into her face. Young lady, young lady. What about you? Her cheeks are rosy and she is laughing. Look, she is really laughing, he said, clasping Werner's knee with his clutching, iron-like fingers. Look, look. Reddening, smiling confusedly, Musia also gazed straight into his sharp and wildly searching eyes. The wheels rattled fast and noisily. The small cars kept hopping along the narrow rails. Now at a curve or at a crossing the small engine whistled shrilly and carefully, the engineer was afraid lest he might run over somebody. It was strange to think that so much humane painstaking care and exertion was being introduced into the business of hanging people. That the most insane deed on earth was being committed with such an air of simplicity and reasonableness. The cars were running, and human beings sat in them as people always do, and they rode as people usually ride, and then there would be a halt, as usual. The train will stop for five minutes. And their death would be waiting, eternity, the great mystery. Chapter 12 They are hanged. The little cars ran on carefully. Sergei Golovin at one time had lived for several years with his relatives at their country house, along this very road. He had traveled upon it by day as well as by night, and he knew it well. He closed his eyes, and thought that he might now simply be returning home, that he had stayed out late in the city with acquaintances, and was now coming back on the last train. We will soon be there, he said, opening his eyes and looking out of the grated, mute window. Nobody stirred, nobody answered. Only Tsiganok spat quickly several times and his eyes ran over the car, as though feeling the windows, the doors, the soldiers. It's cold, said Vasily Kasharin, his lips closed tightly, as though really frozen, and his words sounded strangely. Tanya Kovalchuk began to bustle about. Here's a handkerchief. Tie it about your neck. It's a very warm one. Around the neck? Sergei asked suddenly, startled by his own question. But as the same thing occurred to all of them, no one seemed to hear him. It was as if nothing had been said, or as if they had all said the same thing at the same time. Never mind, Vasya, tie it about your neck. It will be warmer, Werner advised him. Then he turned to Yensun and asked gently. And you, friend, are you cold? Werner, perhaps he wants to smoke. Comrade, perhaps you would like to smoke, asked Musia. We have something to smoke. I do. Give him a cigarette, Serioza, said Werner delightedly. But Sergei was already getting out a cigarette. All looked on with friendliness, watching how Jansen's fingers took the cigarette, how the match flared, and then how the blue smoke issued from Jansen's mouth. Thanks, said Jensen, it's good. How strange, said Sergei. What is strange? Werner turned around. What is strange? I mean, the cigarette. Yen Sun held a cigarette, an ordinary cigarette, in his ordinary live hands, and, pale-faced, looked at it with surprise, even with terror. And all fixed their eyes upon the little tube, from the end of which smoke was issuing, like a bluish ribbon, wafted aside by the breathing, with the ashes, gathering, turning black. The light went out. The light's out, said Tanya. Yes. The lights out. Let it go, said Werner, frowning, looking uneasily at Yen Sun, whose hand, holding the cigarette, was hanging loosely, as if dead. Suddenly, Tsiganok turned quickly, bent over to Werner, close to him, face to face, and rolling the whites of his eyes, 
like a horse, whispered. Master, how about the convoys? Suppose we, eh? Shall we try? No, don't do it, Werner replied, also in a whisper. We shall drink it to the bitter end. Why not? It's livelier in a fight. Eh? I strike him, he strikes me, and you don't even know how the thing is done. It's just as if you don't die at all. No, you shouldn't do it, said Werner, and turned to Yensun. Why don't you smoke, friend? Suddenly Yansen's wizened face became woefully wrinkled, as if somebody had pulled strings which set all the wrinkles in motion. And, as in a dream, he began to whimper, without tears, in a dry, strained voice. I don't want to smoke. Aha! 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 Why should I be hanged? Aha! 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 They began to bustle about him. Tanya Kovalchuk, weeping freely, petted him on the arm, and adjusted the drooping earlaps of his worn fur cap. My dear, do not cry. My own. My dear. Poor, unfortunate little fellow. Musia looked aside. Tsiganok caught her glance and grinned, showing his teeth. What a queer fellow. He drinks tea, and yet feels cold, he said, with an abrupt laugh. But suddenly his own face became bluish black, like cast iron, and his large yellow teeth flashed. Suddenly the little cars trembled and slackened their speed. All, except Yensun and Kasharin, rose and sat down again quickly. Here is the station, said Sergei. It seemed to them as if all the air had been suddenly pumped out of the car, it became so difficult to breathe. The heart grew larger, making the chest almost burst, beating in the throat, tossing about madly, shouting in horror with its blood-filled voice. And the eyes looked upon the quivering floor, and the ears heard how the wheels were turning ever more slowly, the wheels slipped and turned again, and then suddenly, they stopped. The train had halted. Then a dream set in. It was not terrible, rather fantastic, unfamiliar to the memory, strange. The dreamer himself seemed to remain aside, only his bodiless apparition moved about, spoke soundlessly, walked noiselessly, suffered without suffering. As in a dream, they walked out of the car, formed into parties of two, inhaled the peculiarly fresh spring air of the forest. As in a dream, Yen Sun resisted bluntly, powerlessly, and was dragged out of the car silently. They descended the steps of the station. Are we to walk? asked someone almost cheerily. It isn't far now, answered another, also cheerily. Then they walked in a large, black, silent crowd amid the forest, along a rough, wet and soft spring road. From the forest, from the snow, a fresh, strong breath of air was wafted. The feet slipped, sometimes sinking into the snow, and involuntarily the hands of the comrades clung to each other. And the convoys, breathing with difficulty, walked over the untouched snow on each side of the road. Someone said in an angry voice. Why didn't they clear the road? Did they want us to turn somersaults in the snow? Someone else apologized guiltily. We cleaned it, your honor. But it is thawing and it can't be helped. Consciousness of what they were doing returned to the prisoners, but not completely, in fragments, in strange parts. Now, suddenly, their minds practically admitted. It is indeed impossible to clear the road. Then again everything died out, and only their sense of smell remained, the unbearably fresh smell of the forest and of the melting snow. And everything became unusually clear to the consciousness, the forest, the night, the road and the fact that soon they would be hanged. Their conversation, restrained to whispers, flashed in fragments. It is almost four o'clock. I said we started too early. The sun dawns at five. Of course, at five. We should have. They stopped in a meadow, in the darkness. A little distance away, beyond the bare trees, two small lanterns moved silently. There were the gallows. I lost one of my rubbers, said Sergei Golovin. Really, 
asked Werner, not understanding what he said. I lost a rubber. It's cold. Where's Vasily? I don't know. There he is. Vasily stood, gloomy, motionless. And where is Musia? Here I am. Is that you, Werner? They began to look about, avoiding the direction of the gallows, where the lanterns continued to move about silently with terrible suggestiveness. On the left, the bare forest seemed to be growing thinner, and something large and white and flat was visible. A damp wind issued from it. The sea, said Sergei Golovin, inhaling the air with nose and mouth. The sea is there. Musia answered sonorously. My love which is as broad as the sea. What is that, Musia? The banks of life cannot hold my love, which is as broad as the sea. My love which is as broad as the sea, echoed Sergei, thoughtfully, carried away by the sound of her voice and by her words. My love which is as broad as the sea, repeated Werner, and suddenly he spoke wonderingly, cheerfully. Musia, how young you are! Suddenly, Tsiganok whispered warmly, out of breath, right into Werner's ear. Master! Master! There's the forest! My God! What's that? There, where the lanterns are, are those the gallows? What does it mean? Werner looked at him. Tsiganok was writhing in agony before his death. We must bid each other goodbye, said Tanya Kovalchuk. Wait, they have yet to read the sentence, answered Werner. Where is Yen Sun? Yen Sun was lying on the snow, and about him people were busying themselves. There was a smell of ammonia in the air. Well, what is it, doctor? Will you be through soon, someone asked impatiently. It's nothing. He has simply fainted. Rub his ears with snow. He is coming to himself already. You may read the sentence. The light of the dark lantern flashed upon the paper and on the white, gloveless hands holding it. Both the paper and the hands quivered slightly, and the voice also quivered. Gentlemen, perhaps it is not necessary to read the sentence to you. You know it already. What do you say? Don't read it, Werner answered for them all, and the little lantern was soon extinguished. The services of the priest were also declined by them all. Tsiganok said. Stop your fooling, father, you will forgive me, but they will hang me. Go to, where you came from. And the dark, broad silhouette of the priest moved back silently and quickly and disappeared. Day was breaking, the snow turned whiter, the figures of the people became more distinct, and the forest, thinner, more melancholy. Gentlemen, you must go in pairs. Take your places in pairs as you wish, but I ask you to hurry up. Werner pointed to Yen Sun, who was now standing, supported by two gendarmes. I will go with him. And you, Serioza, take Vasily. Go ahead. Very well. You and I go together, Muzeka, shall we not? asked Tanya Kovalchuk. Come, let us kiss each other goodbye. They kissed one another quickly. Tsiganok kissed firmly, so that they felt his teeth, Yensun softly, drowsily, with his mouth half open, and it seemed that he did not understand what he was doing. When Sergei Golovin and Kasherin had gone a few steps, Kasherin suddenly stopped and said loudly and distinctly, Goodbye, comrades. Goodbye, comrade, they shouted in answer. They went off. It grew quiet. The lanterns beyond the trees became motionless. They awaited an outcry, a voice, some kind of noise, but it was just as quiet there as it was among them, and the yellow lanterns were motionless. Oh, my God, someone cried hoarsely and wildly. They looked about. It was Tsiganok, writhing in agony at the thought of death. They are hanging. They turned away from him, and again it became quiet. Tsiganok was writhing, catching at the air with his hands. How is that, gentlemen? Am I to go alone? It's livelier to die together. Gentlemen, what does it mean? He seized Werner by the hand, 
his fingers clutching and then relaxing. Dear master, at least you come with me? Eh? Do me the favor? Don't refuse. Werner answered painfully. I can't, my dear fellow. I am going with him. Oh, my God. Must I go alone, then? My God. How is it to be? Musia stepped forward and said softly. You may go with me. Tsiganok stepped back and rolled the whites of his eyes wildly. With you? Yes. Just think of her. What a little girl. And you're not afraid? If you are, I would rather go alone. No, I am not afraid. Tsiganok grinned. Just think of her. But do you know that I am a murderer? Don't you despise me? You had better not do it. I shan't be angry at you. Musia was silent, and in the faint light of dawn her face was pale and enigmatic. Then suddenly she walked over to Tsiganok quickly, and, throwing her arms about his neck, kissed him firmly upon his lips. He took her by the shoulders with his fingers, held her away from himself, then shook her, and, with loud smacks, kissed her on the lips, on the nose, on the eyes. Come. Suddenly the soldier standing nearest them staggered forward, and opening his hands, let his gun drop. He did not stoop down to regain it, but stood for an instant motionless, turned abruptly and, like a blind man, walked toward the forest over the untouched snow. Where are you going? Called out another soldier in fright. Halt. But the man continued walking through the deep snow silently and with difficulty. Then he must have stumbled over something, for he waved his arms and fell face downward. And there he remained lying on the snow. Pick up the gun, you sour-faced gray coat, or I'll pick it up, said Siganok sternly to the other soldier. You don't know your business. The little lanterns began to move about busily again. Now it was the turn of Werner and Yen Sun. Goodbye, master, called Tsiganok loudly. We'll meet each other in the other world, you'll see. Don't turn away from me. When you see me, bring me some water to drink, it will be hot there for me. Goodbye. I don't want to be hanged, said Yen Sun drowsily. Werner took him by the hand, and then the Estonian walked a few steps alone. But later they saw him stop and fall down in the snow. Soldiers bent over him, lifted him up and carried him on, and he struggled faintly in their arms. Why did he not cry? He must have forgotten even that he had a voice. And again the little yellow lanterns became motionless. And I, Muzeka, said Tanya Kovalchuk mournfully, must I go alone? We live together, and now. Tanechka, dearest. But Tsiganok took her part heatedly. Holding her by the hand, as though fearing that someone would take her away from him, he said quickly, in a businesslike manner, to Tanya. Ah, young lady, you can go alone. You are a pure soul, you can go alone wherever you please. But I, I can't. A murderer. Understand? I can't go alone. Where are you going, you murderer? They will ask me. Why, I even stole horses, by God. But with her it is just as if, just as if I were with an infant, understand? Do you understand me? I do. Go. Come, let me kiss you once more, Muzeka. Kiss. Kiss each other, urged Tsiganok. That's a woman's job. You must bid each other a hearty goodbye. Musia and Tsiganok moved forward. Musia walked cautiously, slipping, and by force of habit raising her skirt slightly. And the man led her to death firmly, holding her arm carefully and feeling the ground with his foot. The lights stopped moving. It was quiet and lonely around Tanya Kovalchuk. The soldiers were silent, all gray in the soft, colorless light of daybreak. I am alone, sighed Tanya Kovalchuk suddenly. Serioza is dead, Werner is dead, and Vazia, too. I am alone. Soldiers. Soldiers. I am alone, alone. 
The sun was rising over the sea. The bodies were placed in a box. Then they were taken away. With stretched necks, with bulging eyes, with blue, swollen tongues, looking like some unknown, terrible flowers between the lips, which were covered with bloody foam, the bodies were hurried back along the same road by which they had come, alive. And the spring snow was just as soft and fresh, the spring air was just as strong and fragrant. And on the snow lay Sergei's black rubber shoe, wet, trampled underfoot. Thus did men greet the rising sun. A story which will never be finished. Exhausted with the painful uncertainty of the day, I fell asleep, dressed, on my bed. Suddenly my wife aroused me. In her hand a candle was flickering, which appeared to me in the middle of the night as bright as the sun. And behind the candle her chin, too, was trembling, and enormous, unfamiliar dark eyes stared motionlessly. Do you know, she said, do you know they are building barricades on our street? It was quiet. We looked straight into each other's eyes, and I felt my face turning pale. Life vanished somewhere and then returned again with a loud throbbing of the heart. It was quiet and the flame of the candle was quivering, and it was small, dull, but sharp-pointed, like a crooked sword. Are you afraid? I asked. The pale chin trembled, but her eyes remained motionless and looked at me, without blinking, and only now I noticed what unfamiliar, what terrible eyes they were. For ten years I had looked into them and had known them better than my own eyes, and now there was something new in them which I am unable to define. I would have called it pride, but there was something different in them, something new, entirely new. I took her hand, it was cold. She grasped my hand firmly and there was something new, something I had not known before, in her handclasp. She had never before clasped my hand as she did this time. How long? I asked. About an hour already. Your brother has gone away. He was apparently afraid that you would not let him go, so he went away quietly. But I saw it. It was true then, the time had arrived. I rose, and, for some reason, spent a long time washing myself, as was my wont in the morning before going to work, and my wife held the light. Then we put out the light and walked over to the window overlooking the street. It was spring. It was May, and the air that came in from the open window was such as we had never before felt in that old, large city. For several days the factories and the roads had been idle. And the air, free from smoke, was filled with the fragrance of the fields and the flowering gardens, perhaps with that of the dew. I do not know what it is that smells so wonderfully on spring nights when I go out far beyond the outskirts of the city. Not a lantern, not a carriage, not a single sound of the city over the unconcerned stony surface, if you had closed your eyes you would really have thought that you were in a village. There a dog was barking. I had never before heard a dog barking in the city, and I laughed for happiness. Listen, a dog is barking. My wife embraced me, and said. It is there, on the corner. We bent over the windowsill, and there, in the transparent, dark depth, we saw some movement, not people, but movement. Something was moving about like a shadow. Suddenly the blows of a hatchet or a hammer resounded. They sounded so cheerful, so resonant, as in a forest, as on a river when you are mending a boat or building a dam. And in the presentiment of cheerful, harmonious work, I firmly embraced my wife, while she looked above the houses, above the roofs, looked at the young crescent of the moon which was already setting. The moon was so young, so strange, even as a young girl who is dreaming and is afraid to tell her dreams, and it was shining only for itself. When will we have a full moon? You must not. You must not, my wife interrupted. You must not speak of that which will be. What for? It is afraid of words. Come here. It was dark in the room, and we were silent for a long time, without seeing each other, yet thinking of the same thing. And when I started to speak, it seemed to me that someone else was speaking. I was not afraid, yet the voice of the other one was hoarse, as though suffocating for thirst. What shall it be? 
and, they? You will be with them. It will be enough for them to have a mother. I cannot remain. And I? Can I? I know that she did not stir from her place, but I felt distinctly that she was going away, that she was far, far away. I began to feel so cold, I stretched out my hands, but she pushed them aside. People have such a holiday once in a hundred years, and you want to deprive me of it. Why? she said. But they may kill you there. And our children will perish. Life will be merciful to me. But even if they should perish. And this was said by her, my wife, a woman with whom I had lived for ten years. But yesterday she had known nothing except our children, and had been filled with fear for them, but yesterday she had caught with terror the stern symptoms of the future. What had come over her? Yesterday, but I, too, forgot everything that was yesterday. Do you want to go with me? Do not be angry, she thought that I was afraid, angry, don't be angry. Tonight, when they began to knock here, and you were still sleeping, I suddenly understood that my husband, my children, all these were simply temporary. I love you. Very much, she found my hand and shook it with the same new, unfamiliar grasp, but do you hear how they are knocking there? They are knocking, and something seems to be falling, some kind of walls seem to be falling, and it is so spacious, so wide, so free. It is night now, and yet it seems to me that the sun is shining. I am thirty years of age, and I am old already, and yet it seems to me that I am only seventeen, and that I love someone with my first love, a great, boundless love. What a night! I said. It is as if the city were no more. You are right, I have also forgotten how old I am. They are knocking, and it sounds to me like music, like singing of which I have always dreamed, all my life. And I did not know whom it was that I loved with such a boundless love, which made me feel like crying and laughing and singing. There is freedom, do not take my happiness away, let me die with those who are working there, who are calling the future so bravely, and who are rousing the dead past from its grave. There is no such thing as time. What do you say? There is no such thing as time. Who are you? I did not know you. Are you a human being? She burst into such ringing laughter as though she were really only seventeen years old. I did not know you, either. Are you, too, a human being? How strange and how beautiful it is, a human being. That which I am writing happened long ago. And those who are sleeping now in the sleep of grey life and who die without awakening, those will not believe me, in those days there was no such thing as time. The sun was rising and setting, and the hand was moving around the dial, but time did not exist. And many other great and wonderful things happened in those days. And those who are sleeping now the sleep of this grey life and who die without awakening, will not believe me. I must go, said I. Wait, I will give you something to eat. You haven't eaten anything today. See how sensible I am, I shall go tomorrow. I shall give the children away and find you. Comrade, said I. Yes, comrade. Through the open windows came the breath of the fields, and silence, and from time to time, the cheerful strokes of the axe, and I sat by the table and looked and listened. And everything was so mysteriously new that I felt like laughing. I looked at the walls and they seemed to me to be transparent. As if embracing all eternity with one glance, I saw how all these walls had been built, I saw how they were being destroyed, and I alone always was and always will be. Everything will pass, but I shall remain. And everything seemed to me strange and queer, so unnatural, the table and the food upon it, and everything outside of me. It all seemed to me transparent and light, existing only temporarily. Why don't you eat? asked my wife. I smiled. Bread, it is so strange. She glanced at the bread, at the stale, dry crust of bread, and for some reason her face became sad. Still continuing to look at it, she silently adjusted her apron with her hands and her head turned slightly, very slightly, in the direction where the children were sleeping. 
do you feel sorry for them? I asked. She shook her head without removing her eyes from the bread. No, but I was thinking of what happened in our life before. How incomprehensible. As one who awakens from a long sleep, she surveyed the room with her eyes and all seemed to her so incomprehensible. Was this the place where we had lived? You were my wife. And there are our children. Here, beyond the wall, your father died. Yes. He died. He died without awakening. The smallest child, frightened at something in her sleep, began to cry. And this simple childish cry, apparently demanding something, sounded so strange amid these phantom walls, while there, below, people were building barricades. She cried and demanded, caresses, certain queer words and promises to soothe her. And she soon was soothed. Well, go, said my wife in a whisper. I should like to kiss them. I am afraid you will wake them up. No, I will not. It turned out that the oldest child was awake, he had heard and understood everything. He was but nine years old, but he understood everything, he met me with a deep, stern look. Will you take your gun, he asked thoughtfully and earnestly. I will. It is behind the stove. How do you know? Well, kiss me. Will you remember me? He jumped up in his bed, in his short little shirt, hot from sleep, and firmly clasped my neck. His arms were burning, they were so soft and delicate. I lifted his hair on the back of his head and kissed his little neck. Will they kill you? he whispered right into my ear. No, I will come back. But why did he not cry? He had cried sometimes when I had simply left the house for a while, is it possible that it had reached him, too? Who knows? So many strange things happened during the great days. I looked at the walls, at the bread, at the candle, at the flame which had kept flickering, and took my wife by the hand. Well, till we meet again. Yes, till we meet again. That was all. I went out. It was dark on the stairway and there was the odor of old filth. Surrounded on all sides by the stones and the darkness, groping down the stairs, I was seized with a tremendous, powerful and all-absorbing feeling of the new. Unknown and joyous something to which I was going. The giant. And then there came the giant, the big, great giant. Such a great, big one. There he came, on and on. Such a funny giant. His hands are huge and thick, and his fingers are outspread, and his feet are huge, and so thick. That's how thick they are. Then he came, and then, down he fell. You understand, he fell, fell right down. His foot caught on a stair, such a stupid giant he is, such a funny one. So, you see, his foot caught on a stair. He opened his mouth, and, there he is lying, lying right down, as funny as a chimney sweep. What have you come here for, Mr. Giant? Get out of here, Mr. Giant. Sasha is such a dear, such a nice, good little boy, he clings so gently to his mother, to her heart, to her heart, such a dear, lovely little child. He has such dear, fine eyes, clear, clean. And everybody loves him so much. And he has such a nice little nose, and little lips, and he is not naughty at all. It was such a long time ago that he was naughty. He ran and shouted and rode a hobby horse. You know, giant, Sasha has a horsey, a fine horsey, a big one, with a tail, and he mounts it and rides far, far away, to the little river and to the forest. And down in the little river there are little fishes. Do you know, giant, what fishes are? No, no, giant, you do not know, you are stupid, but Sasha knows, they are so little and nice. The sun shines over the water, and they play, little, cunning, lively fishes. Yes, stupid giant, but you do not know that. What a funny giant, he came and fell down. That's what I call funny. He was going up the stairs, and his foot caught on the stair, and, down he fell. What a stupid giant! 
Serves you right, giant, do not come here, nobody has called you, stupid giant that you are. It was long ago that Sasha was naughty, was shouting and running, but now he is gentle, so dear, and mama loves him so dearly, dearly. She loves him so much, more than anybody else in the world, more than herself, more than life. He is her little son, her happiness, her joy. See, now he is a tiny, quiet, little child, and his life is tiny, but later he will grow big, big like the giant. He will have a big beard, big, big whiskers, and his life will be a big, shining, beautiful one. He will be good, clever, and strong, like the giant, such a strong, clever man, and everybody will love him, and everybody will love him, and everybody will look at him and be glad. There will be sorrow in his life, every man meets sorrow, but there will be joys also, great, shining like the sun. He will enter the world, fair and intelligent, and the blue sky will shine over his head, and birds will sing songs to him, and brooks will murmur gently. And he will look at it all and say, how wonderful the world is, how wonderful the world is. This is impossible. I hold you, my little boy, firmly and tenderly, tenderly. Are you afraid of the dark here? Look, it is light in the window. There is a lantern in the street, it stands over there and gives light. Is it not funny? To us also it gives some light, the dear lantern. It said to itself, let me give them also a little bit of light, it is so dark there, so dark. Such a tall, funny lantern. Tomorrow, too, it will be shining, tomorrow. Lord, tomorrow. Yes, yes, yes. The giant. Sure, sure. Such a huge, huge giant. Bigger than a lantern, than a steeple, and how funny he is, came and fell down. Oh you stupid giant, how did it happen that you did not notice the stairs? I was looking up, and did not see them, says the giant in a deep voice, you know, in a deep, deep voice, way down, I was looking up. You had better look down, you stupid giant, then you would be able to see. My Sasha is so dear, so dear and clever, he will grow even bigger than you are. And then he will walk straight over the city, right over woods and mountains, he will be so strong and brave, he will be afraid of nothing, of nothing at all. If he comes to a river, he steps right over it. Everybody looks at him. People open their mouths, but he steps right straight over it. And his life will be so big, and brilliant, and beautiful. And the sun will shine, the dear darling sun. It will come out in the morning and shine, such a darling sun. Lord, there he came, the giant, and down he fell. Such a funny, funny. Oh! Funny giant. Thus, late at night, a mother spoke to her dying boy. She was carrying him to and fro in the dark room, and she spoke. And the lantern shone in through the window, and in the next room the father listened to her words, and wept. Love, faith and hope. He loved. According to his passport, he was called Max Z. But as it was stated in the same passport that he had no special peculiarities about his features, I prefer to call him Mr. N plus one. He represented a long line of young men who possess wavy, disheveled locks, straight, bold, and open looks, well-formed and strong bodies, and very large and powerful hearts. All these youths have loved and perpetuated their love. Some of them have succeeded in engraving it on the tablets of history, like Henry IV. Others, like Petrarch, have made literary preserves of it. Some have availed themselves for that purpose of the newspapers, wherein the happenings of the day are recorded, and where they figured among those who had strangled themselves, shot themselves. Or who had been shot by others. Still others, the happiest and most modest of all, perpetuated their love by entering it in the birth records, by creating posterity. The love of N plus one was as strong as death, as a certain writer put it, as strong as life, he thought. Max was firmly convinced that he was the first to have discovered the method of loving so intensely, so unrestrainedly, so passionately, 
and he regarded with contempt all who had loved before him. Still more, he was convinced that even after him no one would love as he did, and he felt sorry that with his death the secret of true love would be lost to mankind. But, being a modest young man, he attributed part of his achievement to her, to his beloved. Not that she was perfection itself, but she came very close to it, as close as an ideal can come to reality. There were prettier women than she, there were wiser women, but was there ever a better woman? Did there ever exist a woman on whose face was so clearly and distinctly written that she alone was worthy of love, of infinite, pure, and devoted love? Max knew that there never were, and that there never would be such women. In this respect, he had no special peculiarities, just as Adam did not have them, just as you, my reader, do not have them. Beginning with Grandmother Eve and ending with the woman upon whom your eyes were directed, before you read these lines, the same inscription is to be clearly and distinctly read on the face of every woman at a certain time. The difference is only in the quality of the ink. A very nasty day set in, it was Monday or Tuesday, when Max noticed with a feeling of great terror that the inscription upon the dear face was fading. Max rubbed his eyes, looked first from a distance, then from all sides, but the fact was undeniable, the inscription was fading. Soon the last letter also disappeared, the face was white like the recently whitewashed wall of a new house. But he was convinced that the inscription had disappeared and not of itself, but that someone had wiped it off. Who? Max went to his friend, John N. He knew and he felt sure that such a true, disinterested, and honest friend there never was and never would be. And in this respect, too, as you see, Max had no special peculiarities. He went to his friend for the purpose of taking his advice concerning the mysterious disappearance of the inscription, and found John N. Exactly at the moment when he was wiping away that inscription by his kisses. It was then that the records of the local occurrences were enriched by another unfortunate incident, entitled, An Attempt at Suicide. It is said that death always comes in due time. Evidently, that time had not yet arrived for Max, for he remained alive, that is, he ate, drank, walked, borrowed money and did not return it. And altogether he showed by a series of psychophysiological acts that he was a living being, possessing a stomach, a will, and a mind, but his soul was dead, or, to be more exact. It was absorbed in lethargic sleep. The sound of human speech reached his ears, his eyes saw tears and laughter, but all that did not stir a single echo, a single emotion in his soul. I do not know what space of time had elapsed. It may have been one year, and it may have been ten years, for the length of such intermissions in life depends on how quickly the actor succeeds in changing his costume. One beautiful day, it was Wednesday or Thursday, Max awakened completely. A careful and guarded liquidation of his spiritual property made it clear that a fair piece of Max's soul, the part which contained his love for woman and for his friends, was dead. Like a paralysis-stricken hand or foot. But what remained was, nevertheless, enough for life. That was love for and faith in mankind. Then Max, having renounced personal happiness, started to work for the happiness of others. That was a new phase, he believed. All the evil that is tormenting the world seemed to him to be concentrated in a red flower, in one red flower. It was but necessary to tear it down, and the incessant, heart-rending cries and moans which rise to the indifferent sky from all points of the earth, like its natural breathing, would be silenced. The evil of the world, he believed, lay in the evil will and in the madness of the people. They themselves were to blame for being unhappy, and they could be happy if they wished. This seemed so clear and simple that Max was dumbfounded in his amazement at human stupidity. Humanity reminded him of a crowd huddled together in a spacious temple and panic-stricken at the cry of, fire. Instead of passing calmly through the wide doors and saving themselves, the maddened people, with the cruelty of frenzied beasts, cry and roar. Crush one another and perish, not from the fire, for it is only imaginary, but from their own madness. It is enough sometimes when one sensible, firm word is uttered to this crowd, 
the crowd calms down and imminent death is thus averted. Let, then, a hundred calm, rational voices be raised to mankind, showing them where to escape and where the danger lies, and heaven will be established on earth, if not immediately. Then at least within a very brief time. Max began to utter his word of wisdom. How he uttered it you will learn later. The name of Max was mentioned in the newspapers, shouted in the marketplaces, blessed and cursed. Whole books were written on what Max N plus one had done, what he was doing, and what he intended to do. He appeared here and there and everywhere. He was seen standing at the head of the crowd, commanding it, he was seen in chains and under the knife of the guillotine. In this respect Max did not have any special peculiarities, either. A preacher of humility and peace, a stern bearer of fire and sword, he was the same Max, Max the believer. But while he was doing all this, time kept passing on. His nerves were shattered. His wavy locks became thin and his head began to look like that of Elijah the prophet, here and there he felt a piercing pain. The earth continued to turn light-mindedly around the sun, now coming nearer to it, now retreating coquettishly. And giving the impression that it fixed all its attention upon its household friend, the moon. The days were replaced by other days, and the dark nights by other dark nights. With such pedantic German punctuality and correctness that all the artistic natures were compelled to move over to the far north by degrees. Where the devil himself would break his head endeavoring to distinguish between day and night, when suddenly something happened to Max. Somehow it happened that Max became misunderstood. He had calmed the crowd by his words of wisdom many a time before and had saved them from mutual destruction but now he was not understood. They thought that it was he who had shouted, fire. With all the eloquence of which he was capable he assured them that he was exerting all his efforts for their sake alone. That he himself needed absolutely nothing, for he was alone, childless, that he was ready to forget the sad misunderstanding and serve them again with faith and truth, but all in vain. They would not trust him. And in this respect Max did not have any special peculiarities, either. The sad incident ended for Max in a new intermission. Max was alive, as was positively established by medical experts, who had made a series of simple tests. Thus, when they pricked a needle into his foot, he shook his foot and tried to remove the needle. When they put food before him, he ate it, but he did not walk and did not ask for any loans, which clearly testified to the complete decline of his energy. His soul was dead, as much as the soul can be dead while the body is alive. To Max all that he had loved and believed in was dead. Impenetrable gloom wrapped his soul. There were neither feelings in it, nor desires, nor thoughts. And there was not a more unhappy man in the world than Max, if he was a man at all. But he was a man. According to the calendar, it was Friday or Saturday, when Max awakened as from a prolonged sleep. With the pleasant sensation of an owner to whom his property has been restored which had wrongly been taken from him, Max realized that he was once more in possession of all his five senses. His sight reported to him that he was all alone, in a place which might in justice be called either a room or a chimney. Each wall of the room was about a meter and a half wide and about ten meters high. The walls were straight, white, smooth, with no openings, except one through which food was brought to Max. An electric lamp was burning brightly on the ceiling. It was burning all the time, so that Max did not know now what darkness was. There was no furniture in the room, and Max had to lie on the stone floor. He lay curled together, as the narrowness of the room did not permit him to stretch himself. His sense of hearing reported to him that until the day of his death he would not leave this room. Having reported this, his hearing sank into inactivity, for not the slightest sound came from without, except the sounds which Max himself produced, tossing about. Or shouting until he was hoarse until he lost his voice. Max looked into himself. In contrast to the outward light which never went out he saw within himself impenetrable, heavy, and motionless darkness. In that darkness his love and faith were buried. Max did not know whether time was moving or whether it stood motionless. 
the same even, white light poured down on him, the same silence and quiet. Only by the beating of his heart Max could judge that Kronos had not left his chariot. His body was aching ever more from the unnatural position in which it lay, and the constant light and silence were growing ever more tormenting. How happy are they for whom night exists, near whom people are shouting, making noise, beating drums. Who may sit on a chair, with their feet hanging down, or lie with their feet outstretched, placing the head in a corner and covering it with the hands in order to create the illusion of darkness. Max made an effort to recall and to picture to himself what there is in life, human faces, voices, the stars. He knew that his eyes would never in life see that again. He knew it, and yet he lived. He could have destroyed himself, for there is no position in which a man cannot do that, but instead Max worried about his health, trying to eat, although he had no appetite. Solving mathematical problems to occupy his mind so as not to lose his reason. He struggled against death as if it were not his deliverer, but his enemy, and as if life were to him not the worst of infernal tortures, but love, faith, and happiness. Gloom in the past, the grave in the future, and infernal tortures in the present, and yet he lived. Tell me, John N., where did he get the strength for that? He hoped. The Man Who Found the Truth Chapter 1 I was twenty-seven years old and had just maintained my thesis for the degree of Doctor of Mathematics with unusual success. When I was suddenly seized in the middle of the night and thrown into this prison. I shall not narrate to you the details of the monstrous crime of which I was accused, there are events which people should neither remember nor even know. That they may not acquire a feeling of aversion for themselves. But no doubt there are many people among the living who remember that terrible case and, the human brute, as the newspapers called me at that time. They probably remember how the entire civilized society of the land unanimously demanded that the criminal be put to death. And it is due only to the inexplicable kindness of the man at the head of the government at the time that I am alive, and I now write these lines for the edification of the weak and the wavering. I shall say briefly, my father, my elder brother, and my sister were murdered brutally, and I was supposed to have committed the crime for the purpose of securing a really enormous inheritance. I am an old man now. I shall die soon, and you have not the slightest ground for doubting when I say that I was entirely innocent of the monstrous and horrible crime. For which twelve honest and conscientious judges unanimously sentenced me to death. The death sentence was finally commuted to imprisonment for life in solitary confinement. It was merely a fatal linking of circumstances, of grave and insignificant events, of vague silence and indefinite words, which gave me the appearance and likeness of the criminal. Innocent though I was. But he who would suspect me of being ill-disposed toward my strict judges would be profoundly mistaken. They were perfectly right, perfectly right. As people who can judge things and events only by their appearance, and who are deprived of the ability to penetrate their own mysterious being, they could not act differently. Nor should they have acted differently. It so happened that in the game of circumstances, the truth concerning my actions, which I alone knew, assumed all the features of an insolent and shameless lie. And however strange it may seem to my kind and serious reader, I could establish the truth of my innocence only by falsehood, and not by the truth. Later on, when I was already in prison, in going over in detail the story of the crime and the trial, and picturing myself in the place of one of my judges, I came to the inevitable conclusion each time that I was guilty. Then I produced a very interesting and instructive work. Having set aside entirely the question of truth and falsehood on general principles, I subjected the facts and the words to numerous combinations, erecting structures. Even as small children build various structures with their wooden blocks. And after persistent efforts I finally succeeded in finding a certain combination of facts which, though strong in principle, seemed so plausible that my actual innocence became perfectly clear. Exactly and positively established. To this day I remember the great feeling of astonishment, mingled with fear, which I experienced at my strange and unexpected discovery. By telling the truth I lead people into error and thus deceive them, 
while by maintaining falsehood I lead them, on the contrary, to the truth and to knowledge. I did not yet understand at that time that, like Newton and his famous apple, I discovered unexpectedly the great law upon which the entire history of human thought rests, which seeks not the truth. But verisimilitude, the appearance of truth, that is, the harmony between that which is seen and that which is conceived, based on the strict laws of logical reasoning. And instead of rejoicing, I exclaimed in an outburst of naive, juvenile despair, Where, then, is the truth? Where is the truth in this world of phantoms and falsehood? See my, Diary of a Prisoner, of June 29, 18. I know that at the present time, when I have but five or six more years to live, I could easily secure my pardon if I but asked for it. But aside from my being accustomed to the prison and for several other important reasons, of which I shall speak later, I simply have no right to ask for pardon. And thus break the force and natural course of the lawful and entirely justified verdict. Nor would I want to hear people apply to me the words, a victim of judicial error, as some of my gentle visitors expressed themselves, to my sorrow. I repeat, there was no error. Nor could there be any error in a case in which a combination of definite circumstances inevitably lead a normally constructed and developed mind to the one and only conclusion. I was convicted justly, although I did not commit the crime, such is the simple and clear truth, and I live joyously and peacefully my last few years on earth with a sense of respect for this truth. The only purpose by which I was guided in writing these modest notes is to show to my indulgent reader that under the most painful conditions, where it would seem that there remains no room for hope or life, a human being, a being of the highest order, possessing a mind and a will, finds both hope and life. I want to show how a human being, condemned to death, looked with free eyes upon the world, through the grated window of his prison, and discovered the great purpose, harmony and beauty of the universe, to the disgrace of those fools who, being free, living a life of plenty and happiness, slander life disgustingly. Some of my visitors reproach me for being haughty, they ask me where I secured the right to teach and to preach. Cruel in their reasoning, they would like to drive away even the smile from the face of the man who has been imprisoned for life as a murderer. No. Just as the kind and bright smile will not leave my lips, as an evidence of a clear and unstained conscience, so my soul will never be darkened, my soul, which has passed firmly through the defile of life, which has been carried by a mighty will power across these terrible abysses and bottomless pits, where so many daring people have found their heroic, but, alas, fruitless, death. And if the tone of my confessions may sometimes seem too positive to my indulgent reader, it is not at all due to the absence of modesty in me. But it is due to the fact that I firmly believe that I am right, and also to my firm desire to be useful to my neighbor as far as my faint powers permit. Here I must apologize for my frequent references to my diary of a prisoner, which is unknown to the reader. But the fact is that I consider the complete publication of my diary too premature and perhaps even dangerous. Begun during the remote period of cruel disillusions, of the shipwreck of all my beliefs and hopes, breathing boundless despair, my notebook bears evidence in places that its author was. If not in a state of complete insanity, on the brink of insanity. And if we recall how contagious that illness is, my caution in the use of my diary will become entirely clear. Oh, blooming youth! With an involuntary tear in my eye I recall your magnificent dreams, your daring visions and outbursts, your impetuous, seething power, but I should not want your return, blooming youth. Only with the grayness of the hair comes clear wisdom, and that great aptitude for unprejudiced reflection which makes of all old men philosophers and often even sages. Chapter 2 Those of my kind visitors who honor me by expressing their delight and even, may this little indiscretion be forgiven me. Even their adoration of my spiritual clearness, can hardly imagine what I was when I came to this prison. The tens of years which have passed over my head and which have whitened my hair cannot muffle the slight agitation which I experience at the recollection of the first moments when, with the creaking of the rusty hinges, the fatal prison doors opened and then closed behind me forever. 
not endowed with literary talent, which in reality is an indomitable inclination to invent and to lie. I shall attempt to introduce myself to my indulgent reader exactly as I was at that remote time. I was a young man, twenty-seven years of age, as I had occasion to mention before, unrestrained, impetuous, given to abrupt deviations. A certain dreaminess, peculiar to my age. A self-respect which was easily offended and which revolted at the slightest insignificant provocation, a passionate impetuosity in solving world problems. Fits of melancholy alternated by equally wild fits of merriment, all this gave the young mathematician a character of extreme unsteadiness, of sad and harsh discord. I must also mention the extreme pride, a family trait, which I inherited from my mother, and which often hindered me from taking the advice of riper and more experienced people than myself. Also my extreme obstinacy in carrying out my purposes, a good quality in itself, which becomes dangerous, however, when the purpose in question is not sufficiently well founded and considered. Thus, during the first days of my confinement, I behaved like all other fools who are thrown into prison. I shouted loudly and, of course, vainly about my innocence. I demanded violently my immediate freedom and even beat against the door and the walls with my fists. The door and the walls naturally remained mute, while I caused myself a rather sharp pain. I remember I even beat my head against the wall, and for hours I lay unconscious on the stone floor of my cell. And for some time, when I had grown desperate, I refused food, until the persistent demands of my organism defeated my obstinacy. I cursed my judges and threatened them with merciless vengeance. At last I commenced to regard all human life, the whole world, even heaven, as an enormous injustice, a derision and a mockery. Forgetting that in my position I could hardly be unprejudiced, I came with the self-confidence of youth, with the sickly pain of a prisoner. Gradually to the complete negation of life and its great meaning. Those were indeed terrible days and nights, when, crushed by the walls, getting no answer to any of my questions. I paced my cell endlessly and hurled one after another into the dark abyss all the great valuables which life has bestowed upon us, friendship, love, reason and justice. In some justification to myself I may mention the fact that during the first and most painful years of my imprisonment a series of events happened which reflected themselves rather painfully upon my psychic nature. Thus I learned with the profoundest indignation that the girl, whose name I shall not mention and who was to become my wife, married another man. She was one of the few who believed in my innocence. At the last parting she swore to me to remain faithful to me unto death, and rather to die than betray her love for me, and within one year after that she married a man I knew, who possessed certain good qualities, but who was not at all a sensible man. I did not want to understand at that time that such a marriage was natural on the part of a young, healthy, and beautiful girl. But, alas! We all forget our natural science when we are deceived by the woman we love, may this little jest be forgiven me. At the present time Madame N. is a happy and respected mother, and this proves better than anything else how wise and entirely in accordance with the demands of nature and life was her marriage at that time which vexed me so painfully. I must confess, however, that at that time I was not at all calm. Her exceedingly amiable and kind letter in which she notified me of her marriage, expressing profound regret that changed circumstances and a suddenly awakened love compelled her to break her promise to me, that amiable, truthful letter, scented with perfume, bearing the traces of her tender fingers, seemed to me a message from the devil himself. The letters of fire burned my exhausted brains, and in a wild ecstasy I shook the doors of my cell and called violently. Come. Let me look into your lying eyes. Let me hear your lying voice. Let me but touch with my fingers your tender throat and pour into your death rattle my last bitter laugh. From this quotation my indulgent reader will see how right were the judges who convicted me for murder, they had really foreseen in me a murderer. My gloomy view of life at the time was aggravated by several other events. Two years after the marriage of my fiancé, consequently three years after the first day of my imprisonment, my mother died, she died, as I learned, 
of profound grief for me. However strange it may seem, she remained firmly convinced to the end of her days that I had committed the monstrous crime. Evidently this conviction was an inexhaustible source of grief to her, the chief cause of the gloomy melancholy which fettered her lips in silence and caused her death through paralysis of the heart. As I was told, she never mentioned my name nor the names of those who died so tragically, and she bequeathed the entire enormous fortune, which was supposed to have served as the motive for the murder, to various charitable organizations. It is characteristic that even under such terrible conditions her motherly instinct did not forsake her altogether. In a postscript to the will she left me a considerable sum, which secures my existence whether I am in prison or at large. Now I understand that, however great her grief may have been, that alone was not enough to cause her death. The real cause was her advanced age and a series of illnesses which had undermined her once strong and sound organism. In the name of justice, I must say that my father, a weak-charactered man, was not at all a model husband and family man. By numerous betrayals, by falsehood and deception he had led my mother to despair, constantly offending her pride in her strict, unbribable truthfulness. But at that time I did not understand it. The death of my mother seemed to me one of the most cruel manifestations of universal injustice, and called forth a new stream of useless and sacrilegious curses. I do not know whether I ought to tire the attention of the reader with the story of other events of a similar nature. I shall mention but briefly that one after another my friends, who remained my friends from the time when I was happy and free, stopped visiting me. According to their words, they believed in my innocence, and at first warmly expressed to me their sympathy. But our lives, mine in prison and theirs at liberty, were so different that gradually under the pressure of perfectly natural causes, such as forgetfulness, official and other duties. The absence of mutual interests, they visited me ever more and more rarely, and finally ceased to see me entirely. I cannot recall without a smile that even the death of my mother, even the betrayal of the girl I loved did not arouse in me such a hopelessly bitter feeling as these gentlemen, whose names I remember but vaguely now, succeeded in wresting from my soul. What horror! What pain! My friends, you have left me alone. My friends, do you understand what you have done? You have left me alone. Can you conceive of leaving a human being alone? Even a serpent has its mate, even a spider has its comrade, and you have left a human being alone. You have given him a soul, and left him alone. You have given him a heart, a mind, a hand for a handshake, lips for a kiss, and you have left him alone. What shall he do now that you have left him alone? Thus I exclaimed in my diary of a prisoner, tormented by woeful perplexities. In my juvenile blindness, in the pain of my young, senseless heart, I still did not want to understand that the solitude, of which I complained so bitterly, like the mind, was an advantage given to man over other creatures, in order to fence around the sacred mysteries of his soul from the stranger's gaze. Let my serious reader consider what would have become of life if man were robbed of his right, of his duty to be alone. In the gathering of idle chatterers, amid the dull collection of transparent glass dolls, that kill each other with their sameness. In the wild city where all doors are open, and all windows are open, passers-by look wearily through the glass walls and observe the same evidences of the hearth and the alcove. Only the creatures that can be alone possess a face, while those that know no solitude, the great, blissful, sacred solitude of the soul, have snouts instead of faces. And in calling my friends, perfidious traitors, poor youth that I was, could not understand the wise law of life, according to which neither friendship, nor love, nor even the tenderest attachment of sister and mother, is eternal. Deceived by the lies of the poets, who proclaimed eternal friendship and love, I did not want to see that which my indulgent reader observes from the windows of his dwelling, how friends, relatives, mother and wife, in apparent despair and in tears, follow their dead to the cemetery, and after a lapse of some time return from there. No one buries himself together with the dead, no one asks the dead to make room in the coffin, and if the grief-stricken wife exclaims, in an outburst of tears, Oh, bury me together with him. 
she is merely expressing symbolically the extreme degree of her despair, one could easily convince himself of this by trying, in jest, to push her down into the grave. And those who restrain her are merely expressing symbolically their sympathy and understanding, thus lending the necessary aspect of solemn grief to the funeral custom. Man must subject himself to the laws of life, not of death, nor to the fiction of the poets, however beautiful it may be. But can the fictitious be beautiful? Is there no beauty in the stern truth of life, in the mighty work of its wise laws, which subjects to itself with great disinterestedness the movements of the heavenly luminaries? As well as the restless linking of the tiny creatures called human beings. Chapter 3 Thus I lived sadly in my prison for five or six years. The first redeeming ray flashed upon me when I least expected it. Endowed with the gift of imagination, I made my former fiancée the object of all my thoughts. She became my love and my dream. Another circumstance which suddenly revealed to me the ground under my feet was, strange as it may seem, the conviction that it was impossible to make my escape from prison. During the first period of my imprisonment, I, as a youthful and enthusiastic dreamer, made all kinds of plans for escape, and some of them seemed to me entirely possible of realization. Cherishing deceptive hopes, this thought naturally kept me in a state of tense alarm and hindered my attention from concentrating itself on more important and substantial matters. As soon as I despaired of one plan I created another, but of course I did not make any progress, I merely moved within a closed circle. It is hardly necessary to mention that each transition from one plan to another was accompanied by cruel sufferings, which tormented my soul, just as the eagle tortured the body of Prometheus. One day, while staring with a weary look at the walls of my cell, I suddenly began to feel how irresistibly thick the stone was, how strong the cement which kept it together. How skillfully and mathematically this severe fortress was constructed. It is true, my first sensation was extremely painful, it was, perhaps, a horror of hopelessness. I cannot recall what I did and how I felt during the two or three months that followed. The first note in my diary after a long period of silence does not explain very much. Briefly I state only that they made new clothes for me and that I had grown stout. The fact is that, after all my hopes had been abandoned, the consciousness of the impossibility of my escape once for all extinguished also my painful alarm and liberated my mind. Which was then already inclined to lofty contemplation and the joys of mathematics. But the following is the day I consider as the first real day of my liberation. It was a beautiful spring morning, May 6, and the balmy, invigorating air was pouring into the open window. While walking back and forth in my cell I unconsciously glanced, at each turn, with a vague interest, at the high window. Where the iron grate outlined its form sharply and distinctly against the background of the azure, cloudless sky. Why is the sky so beautiful through these bars? I reflected as I walked. Is not this the effect of the aesthetic law of contrasts, according to which azure stands out prominently beside black? Or is it not, perhaps, a manifestation of some other, higher law, according to which the infinite may be conceived by the human mind only when it is brought within certain boundaries, for instance? When it is enclosed within a square? When I recalled that at the sight of a wide open window, which was not protected by bars, or of the sky, I had usually experienced a desire to fly. Which was painful because of its uselessness and absurdity, I suddenly began to experience a feeling of tenderness for the bars. Tender gratitude, even love. Forged by hand, by the weak human hand of some ignorant blacksmith, who did not even give himself an account of the profound meaning of his creation. Placed in the wall by an equally ignorant mason, it suddenly represented in itself a model of beauty, nobility, and power. Having seized the infinite within its iron squares, it became congealed in cold and proud peace, frightening the ignorant, giving food for thought to the intelligent and delighting the sage. Chapter 4 In order to make the further narrative clearer to my indulgent reader, I am compelled to say a few words about the exclusive, quite flattering, and, I fear, not entirely deserved. Position which I occupy in our prison. On one hand, 
my spiritual clearness, my rare and perfect view of life, and the nobility of my feelings, which impress all those who speak to me. And, on the other hand, several rather unimportant favors which I have done to the warden, have given me a series of privileges, of which I avail myself, rather moderately, of course. Not desiring to upset the general plan and system of our prison. Thus, during the weekly visiting days, my visitors are not limited to any special time for their interviews, and all those who wish to see me are admitted, sometimes forming quite a large audience. Not daring to accept altogether the assurances made somewhat ironically by the warden, to the effect that I would be, the pride of any prison, I may say, nevertheless, without any false modesty. That my words are treated with proper respect, and that among my visitors I number quite a few warm and enthusiastic admirers, both men and women. I shall mention that the warden himself and some of his assistants honor me by their visits, drawing from me strength and courage for the purpose of continuing their hard work. Of course I use the prison library freely, and even the archives of the prison. And if the warden politely refuse to grant my request for an exact plan of the prison, it is not at all because of his lack of confidence in me, but because such a plan is a state secret. Our prison is a huge five-story building. Situated in the outskirts of the city, at the edge of a deserted field, overgrown with high grass, it attracts the attention of the wayfarer by its rigid outlines. Promising him peace and rest after his endless wanderings. Not being plastered, the building has retained its natural dark red color of old brick, and at close view, I am told, it produces a gloomy, even threatening, impression. Especially on nervous people, to whom the red bricks recall blood and bloody lumps of human flesh. The small, dark, flat windows with iron bars naturally complete the impression and lend to the whole a character of gloomy harmony or stern beauty. Even during good weather, when the sun shines upon our prison, it does not lose any of its dark and grim importance. And is constantly reminding the people that there are laws in existence and that punishment awaits those who break them. My cell is on the fifth story, and my grated window commands a splendid view of the distant city and a part of the deserted field to the right. On the left, beyond the boundary of my vision, are the outskirts of the city, and, as I am told, the church and the cemetery adjoining it. Of the existence of the church and even the cemetery I had known before from the mournful tolling of the bells, which custom requires during the burial of the dead. Quite in keeping with the external style of architecture, the interior arrangement of our prison is also finished harmoniously and properly constructed. For the purpose of conveying to the reader a clearer idea of the prison, I will take the liberty of giving the example of a fool who might make up his mind to run away from our prison. Admitting that the brave fellow possessed supernatural, Herculean strength and broke the lock of his room, what would he find? The corridor, with numerous grated doors, which could withstand cannonading, and armed keepers. Let us suppose that he kills all the keepers, breaks all the doors, and comes out into the yard, perhaps he may think that he is already free. But what of the walls? The walls which encircle our prison, with three rings of stone, I omitted the guard advisedly. The guard is indefatigable. Day and night I hear behind my doors the footsteps of the guard. Day and night his eye watches me through the little window in my door, controlling my movements, reading on my face my thoughts, my intentions, and my dreams. In the daytime I could deceive his attention with lies, assuming a cheerful and carefree expression on my face, but I have rarely met the man who could lie even in his sleep. No matter how much I would be on my guard during the day, at night I would betray myself by an involuntary moan, by a twitch of the face, by an expression of fatigue or grief, or by other manifestations of a guilty and uneasy conscience. Only very few people of unusual willpower are able to lie even in their sleep, skillfully managing the features of their faces, sometimes even preserving a courteous and bright smile on their lips. When their souls, given over to dreams, are quivering from the horrors of a monstrous nightmare, but, as exceptions, these cannot be taken into consideration. I am profoundly happy that I am not a criminal, that my conscience is clear and calm. Read, my friend, read, I say to the watchful eye as I lay myself down to sleep peacefully.
you will not be able to read anything on my face. And it was I who invented the window in the prison door. I feel that my reader is astonished and smiles incredulously, mentally calling me an old liar, but there are instances in which modesty is superfluous and even dangerous. Yes, this simple and great invention belongs to me, just as Newton's system belongs to Newton, and as Kepler's laws of the revolution of the planets belong to Kepler. Later on, encouraged by the success of my invention, I devised and introduced in our prison a series of little innovations, which were concerned only with details. Thus the form of chains and locks used in our prison has been changed. The little window in the door was my invention, and, if anyone should dare deny this, I would call him a liar and a scoundrel. I came upon this invention under the following circumstances. One day, during the roll call, a certain prisoner killed with the iron leg of his bed the inspector who entered his cell. Of course the rascal was hanged in the yard of our prison, and the administration light-mindedly grew calm. But I was in despair, the great purpose of the prison proved to be wrong since such horrible deeds were possible. How is it that no one had noticed that the prisoner had broken off the leg of his bed? How is it that no one had noticed the state of agitation in which the prisoner must have been before committing the murder? By taking up the question so directly I thus approached considerably the solution of the problem. And indeed, after two or three weeks had elapsed I arrived simply and even unexpectedly at my great discovery. I confess frankly that before telling my discovery to the warden of the prison I experienced moments of a certain hesitation, which was quite natural in my position of prisoner. To the reader who may still be surprised at this hesitation, knowing me to be a man of a clear, unstained conscience, I will answer by a quotation from my Diary of a Prisoner. Relating to that period. How difficult is the position of the man who is convicted, though innocent, as I am. If he is sad, if his lips are sealed in silence, and his eyes are lowered, people say of him, he is repenting, he is suffering from pangs of conscience. If in the innocence of his heart he smiles brightly and kindly, the keeper thinks, there, by a false and feigned smile, he wishes to hide his secret. No matter what he does, he seems guilty, such is the force of the prejudice against which it is necessary to struggle. But I am innocent, and I shall be myself, firmly confident that my spiritual clearness will destroy the malicious magic of prejudice. And on the following day the warden of the prison pressed my hand warmly, expressing his gratitude to me, and a month later little holes were made in all doors in every prison in the land. Thus opening a field for wide and fruitful observation. The entire system of our prison life gives me deep satisfaction. The hours for rising and going to bed, for meals and walks are arranged so rationally, in accordance with the real requirements of nature. That soon they lose the appearance of compulsion and become natural, even dear habits. Only in this way can I explain the interesting fact that when I was free I was a nervous and weak young man, susceptible to colds and illness. Whereas in prison I have grown considerably stronger and that for my sixty years I am enjoying an enviable state of health. I am not stout, but I am not thin either, my lungs are in good condition and I have saved almost all my teeth, with the exception of two on the left side of the jaw. I am good-natured, even-tempered, my sleep is sound, almost without any dreams. In figure, in which an expression of calm power and self-confidence predominates, and in face, I resemble somewhat Michelangelo's Moses, that is. At least what some of my friendly visitors have told me. But even more than by the regular and healthy regime, the strengthening of my soul and body was helped by the wonderful, yet natural, peculiarity of our prison. Which eliminates entirely the accidental and the unexpected from its life. Having neither a family nor friends, I am perfectly safe from the shocks, so injurious to life, which are caused by treachery. By the illness or death of relatives, let my indulgent reader recall how many people have perished before his eyes not of their own fault. But because capricious fate had linked them to people unworthy of them. Without changing my feeling of love into trivial personal attachments, I thus make it free for the broad and mighty love for all mankind. And as mankind is immortal, not subjected to illness, and as a harmonious whole it is undoubtedly progressing toward perfection. 
love for it becomes the surest guarantee of spiritual and physical soundness. My day is clear. So are also my days of the future, which are coming toward me in radiant and even order. A murderer will not break into my cell for the purpose of robbing me, a mad automobile will not crush me, the illness of a child will not torture me. Cruel treachery will not steal its way to me from the darkness. My mind is free, my heart is calm, my soul is clear and bright. The clear and rigid rules of our prison define everything that I must not do, thus freeing me from those unbearable hesitations, doubts, and errors with which practical life is filled. True, sometimes there penetrates even into our prison, through its high walls, something which ignorant people call chance, or even fate. And which is only an inevitable reflection of the general laws. But the life of the prison, agitated for a moment, quickly goes back to its habitual rut, like a river after an overflow. To this category of accidents belong the above-mentioned murder of the inspector, the rare and always unsuccessful attempts at escape, and also the executions, which take place in one of the remotest yards of our prison. There is still another peculiarity in the system of our prison, which I consider most beneficial, and which gives to the whole thing a character of stern and noble justice. Left to himself, and only to himself, the prisoner cannot count upon support, or upon that spurious, wretched pity which so often falls to the lot of weak people disfiguring thereby the fundamental purposes of nature. I confess that I think, with a certain sense of pride, that if I am now enjoying general respect and admiration, if my mind is strong, my will powerful, my view of life clear and bright. I owe it only to myself, to my power and my perseverance. How many weak people would have perished in my place as victims of madness, despair, or grief? But I have conquered everything. I have changed the world. I gave to my soul the form which my mind desired. In the desert, working alone, exhausted with fatigue, I have erected a stately structure in which I now live joyously and calmly, like a king. Destroy it, and tomorrow I shall begin to build a new structure, and in my bloody sweat I shall erect it. For I must live. Forgive my involuntary pathos in the last lines, which is so unbecoming to my balanced and calm nature. But it is hard to restrain myself when I recall the road I have traveled. I hope, however, that in the future I shall not darken the mood of my reader with any outbursts of agitated feelings. Only he shouts who is not confident of the truth of his words. Calm firmness and cold simplicity are becoming to the truth. P.S. I do not remember whether I told you that the criminal who murdered my father has not been found as yet. Chapter 5 Deviating from time to time from the calm form of a historical narrative I must pause on current events. Thus I will permit myself to acquaint my readers in a few lines with a rather interesting specimen of the human species which I have found accidentally in our prison. One afternoon a few days ago the warden came to me for the usual chat and among other things told me there was a very unfortunate man in prison at the time upon whom I could exert a beneficent influence. I expressed my willingness in the most cordial manner, and for several days in succession I have had long discussions with the artist K, by permission of the warden. The spirit of hostility, even of obstinacy, with which, to my regret, he met me at his first visit, has now disappeared entirely under the influence of my discussion. Listening willingly and with interest to my ever pacifying words, he gradually told me his rather unusual story after a series of persistent questions. He is a man of about twenty six or twenty eight, of pleasant appearance, and rather good manners, which show that he is a well bred man. A certain quite natural unrestraint in his speech, a passionate vehemence with which he talks about himself, occasionally a bitter, even ironical laughter, followed by painful pensiveness from which it is difficult to arouse him even by a touch of the hand, these complete the makeup of my new acquaintance. Personally to me he is not particularly sympathetic, and however strange it may seem I am especially annoyed by his disgusting habit of constantly moving his thin, emaciated fingers and clutching helplessly the hand of the person with whom he speaks. K. told me very little of his past life. Well, what is there to tell? I was an artist, that's all, he repeated, 
with a sorrowful grimace, and refused to talk about the immoral act for which he was condemned to solitary confinement. I don't want to corrupt you, Grandpa, live honestly, he would jest in a somewhat unbecoming familiar tone, which I tolerated simply because I wished to please the warden of the prison. Having learned from the prisoner the real cause of his sufferings, which sometimes assumed an acute form of violence and threats. During one of these painful minutes, when K. S. Will Power was weak, as a result of insomnia, from which he was suffering, I seated myself on his bed and treated him in general with fatherly kindness. And he blurted out everything to me right there and then. Not desiring to tire the reader with an exact reproduction of his hysterical outbursts, his laughter, and his tears, I shall give only the facts of his story. K. S. Grief, at first not quite clear to me, consists of the fact that instead of paper or canvas for his drawings he was given a large slate and a slate pencil. By the way, the art with which he mastered the material, which was new to him, is remarkable. I have seen some of his productions, and it seems to me that they could satisfy the taste of the most fastidious expert of graphic arts. Personally I am indifferent to the art of painting, preferring live and truthful nature. Thus, owing to the nature of the material, before commencing a new picture, K. had to destroy the previous one by wiping it off his slate, and this seemed to lead him every time to the verge of madness. You cannot imagine what it means, he would say, clutching my hands with his thin, clinging fingers. While I draw, you know, I forget entirely that it is useless. I am usually very cheerful and I even whistle some tune, and once I was even incarcerated for that, as it is forbidden to whistle in this cursed prison. But that is a trifle, for I had at least a good sleep there. But when I finish my picture, no, even when I approach the end of the picture, I am seized with a sensation so terrible that I feel like tearing the brain from my head and trampling it with my feet. Do you understand me? I understand you, my friend, I understand you perfectly, and I sympathize with you. Really? Well, then, listen, old man. I make the last strokes with so much pain, with such a sense of sorrow and hopelessness, as though I were bidding goodbye to the person I loved best of all. But here I have finished it. Do you understand what it means? It means that it has assumed life, that it lives, that there is a certain mysterious spirit in it. And yet it is already doomed to death, it is dead already, dead like a herring. Can you understand it at all? I do not understand it. And, now, imagine, I, fool that I am, I nevertheless rejoice, I cry and rejoice. No, I think, this picture I shall not destroy, it is so good that I shall not destroy it. Let it live. And it is a fact that at such times I do not feel like drawing anything new, I have not the slightest desire for it. And yet it is dreadful. Do you understand me? Perfectly, my friend. No doubt the drawing ceases to please you on the following day. Oh, what nonsense you are prating, old man. That is exactly what he said. Nonsense. How can a dying child cease to please you? Of course, if he lived, he might have become a scoundrel, but when he is dying, no, old man, that isn't it. For I am killing it myself. I do not sleep all night long, I jump up, I look at it, and I love it so dearly that I feel like stealing it. Stealing it from whom? What do I know? But when morning sets in I feel that I cannot do without it, that I must take up that cursed pencil again and create anew. What a mockery! To create! What am I, a galley slave? My friend, you are in a prison. My dear old man! When I begin to steal over to the slate with the sponge in my hand I feel like a murderer. It happens that I go around it for a day or two. Do you know, one day I bit off a finger of my right hand so as not to draw any more, but that, of course, was only a trifle, for I started to learn drawing with my left hand. What is this necessity for creating? To create by all means, create for suffering, create with the knowledge that it will all perish. Do you understand it? Finish it, my friend, don't be agitated. 
then I will expound to you my views. Unfortunately, my advice hardly reached the ears of K. In one of those paroxysms of despair, which frightened the warden of our prison, K. began to throw himself about in his bed, tear his clothes, shout and sob, manifesting in general all the symptoms of extreme mortification. I looked at the sufferings of the unfortunate youth with deep emotion, compared with me he was a youth, vainly endeavoring to hold his fingers which were tearing his clothes. I knew that for this breach of discipline new incarceration awaited him. Oh, impetuous youth, I thought when he had grown somewhat calmer, and I was tenderly unfolding his fine hair which had become entangled, how easily you fall into despair. A bit of drawing, which may in the end fall into the hands of a dealer in old rags, or a dealer in old bronze and cemented porcelain, can cause you so much suffering. But, of course, I did not tell this to my youthful friend, striving, as anyone should under similar circumstances, not to irritate him by unnecessary contradictions. Thank you, old man, said K. Apparently calm now. To tell the truth you seemed very strange to me at first, your face is so venerable, but your eyes. Have you murdered anybody, old man? I deliberately quote the malicious and careless phrase to show how in the eyes of light-minded and shallow people the stamp of a terrible accusation is transformed into the stamp of the crime itself. Controlling my feeling of bitterness, I remarked calmly to the impertinent youth. You are an artist, my child. To you are known the mysteries of the human face, that flexible, mobile and deceptive mask, which, like the sea, reflects the hurrying clouds and the azure ether. Being green, the sea turns blue under the clear sky and black when the sky is black, when the heavy clouds are dark. What do you want of my face, over which hangs an accusation of the most cruel crime? But, occupied with his own thoughts, the artist apparently paid no particular attention to my words and continued in a broken voice. What am I to do? You saw my drawing. I destroyed it, and it is already a whole week since I touched my pencil. Of course, he resumed thoughtfully, rubbing his brow, it would be better to break the slate. To punish me they would not give me another one. You had better return it to the authorities. Very well, I may hold out another week, but what then? I know myself. Even now that devil is pushing my hand, take the pencil, take the pencil. At that moment, as my eyes wandered distractedly over his cell, I suddenly noticed that some of the artist's clothes hanging on the wall were unnaturally stretched. And one end was skillfully fastened by the back of the cot. Assuming an air that I was tired and that I wanted to walk about in the cell, I staggered as from a quiver of senility in my legs, and pushed the clothes aside. The entire wall was covered with drawings. The artist had already leaped from his cot, and thus we stood facing each other in silence. I said in a tone of gentle reproach. How did you allow yourself to do this, my friend? You know the rules of the prison, according to which no inscriptions or drawing on the walls are permissible? I know no rules, said K. morosely. And then, I continued, sternly this time, you lied to me, my friend. You said that you did not take the pencil into your hands for a whole week. Of course I didn't, said the artist, with a strange smile, and even a challenge. Even when caught red-handed, he did not betray any signs of repentance, and looked rather sarcastic than guilty. Having examined more closely the drawings on the wall, which represented human figures in various positions, I became interested in the strange reddish-yellow color of an unknown pencil. Is this iodine? You told me that you had a pain and that you secured iodine. No. It is blood. Blood? Yes. I must say frankly that I even liked him at that moment. How did you get it? From my hand. From your hand? But how did you manage to hide yourself from the eye that is watching you? He smiled cunningly, and even winked. Don't you know that you can always deceive if only you want to do it? My sympathies for him were immediately dispersed. I saw before me a man who was not particularly clever, but in all probability terribly spoiled already, who did not even admit the thought that there are people who simply cannot lie. 
Recalling, however, the promise I had made to the warden, I assumed a calm air of dignity and said to him tenderly, as only a mother could speak to her child. Don't be surprised and don't condemn me for being so strict, my friend. I am an old man. I have passed half of my life in this prison. I have formed certain habits, like all old people, and submitting to all rules myself, I am perhaps overdoing it somewhat in demanding the same of others. You will of course wipe off these drawings yourself, although I feel sorry for them, for I admire them sincerely, and I will not say anything to the administration. We will forget all this, as if nothing had happened. Are you satisfied? He answered drowsily. Very well. In our prison, where we have the sad pleasure of being confined, everything is arranged in accordance with a most purposeful plan and is most strictly subjected to laws and rules. And the very strict order, on account of which the existence of your creations is so short-lived, and, I may say, ephemeral, is full of the profoundest wisdom. Allowing you to perfect yourself in your art, it wisely guards other people against the perhaps injurious influence of your productions, and in any case it completes logically, finishes, enforces. And makes clear the meaning of your solitary confinement. What does solitary confinement in our prison mean? It means that the prisoner should be alone. But would he be alone if by his productions he would communicate in some way or other with other people outside? By the expression of K.'s face I noticed with a sense of profound joy that my words had produced on him the proper impression, bringing him back from the realm of poetic inventions to the land of stern but beautiful reality. And, raising my voice, I continued. As for the rule you have broken, which forbids any inscription or drawing on the walls of our prison, it is not less logical. Years will pass. In your place there may be another prisoner like you, and he may see that which you have drawn. Shall this be tolerated? Just think of it. And what would become of the walls of our prison if everyone who wished it were to leave upon them his profane marks? To the devil with it. This is exactly how K. expressed himself. He said it loudly, even with an air of calmness. What do you mean to say by this, my youthful friend? I wish to say that you may perish here, my old friend, but I shall leave this place. You can't escape from our prison, I retorted, sternly. Have you tried? Yes, I have tried. He looked at me incredulously and smiled. He smiled. You are a coward, old man. You are simply a miserable coward. I, a coward. Oh, if that self-satisfied puppy knew what a tempest of rage he had aroused in my soul he would have squealed for fright and would have hidden himself on the bed. I, a coward. The world has crumbled upon my head, but has not crushed me, and out of its terrible fragments I have created a new world, according to my own design and plan. All the evil forces of life, solitude, imprisonment, treachery, and falsehood, all have taken up arms against me but I have subjected them all to my will. And I who have subjected to myself even my dreams, I am a coward. But I shall not tire the attention of my indulgent reader with these lyrical deviations, which have no bearing on the matter. I continue. After a pause, broken only by K.S. loud breathing, I said to him sadly. I, a coward. And you say this to the man who came with the sole aim of helping you? of helping you not only in word but also in deed? You wish to help me? In what way? I will get you paper and pencil. The artist was silent. And his voice was soft and timid when he asked, hesitatingly. And, my drawings, will remain? Yes, they will remain. It is hard to describe the vehement delight into which the exalted young man was thrown, Naive and pure-hearted youth knows no bounds either in grief or in joy. He pressed my hand warmly, shook me, disturbing my old bones, he called me friend, father, even dear old Fizz, and a thousand other endearing and somewhat naive names. To my regret our conversation lasted too long, and, notwithstanding the entreaties of the young man, who would not part with me, I hurried away to my cell. I did not go to the warden of the prison, as I felt somewhat agitated. 
At that remote time I paced my cell until late in the night, striving to understand what means of escaping from our prison that rather foolish young man could have discovered. Was it possible to run away from our prison? No, I could not admit and I must not admit it. And gradually conjuring up in my memory everything I knew about our prison, I understood that K. must have hit upon an old plan, which I had long discarded, and that he would convince himself of its impracticability even as I convinced myself. It is impossible to escape from our prison. But, tormented by doubts, I measured my lonely cell for a long time, thinking of various plans that might relieve K.S. position and thus divert him from the idea of making his escape. He must not run away from our prison under any circumstances. Then I gave myself to peaceful and sound sleep, with which benevolent nature has rewarded those who have a clear conscience and a pure soul. By the way, lest I forget, I shall mention the fact that I destroyed my diary of a prisoner that night. I had long wished to do it, but the natural pity and faint-hearted love which we feel for our blunders and our shortcomings restrained me. Besides, there was nothing in my diary that could have compromised me in any way. And if I have destroyed it now it is due solely to my desire to throw my past into oblivion and to save my reader from the tediousness of long complaints and moans. From the horror of sacrilegious cursings. May it rest in peace. Chapter 6 Having conveyed to the warden of our prison the contents of my conversation with K. I asked him not to punish the young man for spoiling the walls, which would thus betray me, and I, to save the youth, suggested the following plan. Which was accepted by the warden after a few purely formal objections. It is important for him, I said, that his drawings should be preserved, but it is apparently immaterial to him in whose possession these drawings are. Let him, then, avail himself of his art, paint your portrait, Mr. Warden, and after that the portraits of the entire staff of your officials. To say nothing of the honor you would show him by this condescension, an honor which he will surely know how to appreciate, the painting may be useful to you as a very original ornament in your drawing room or study. Besides, nothing will prevent us from destroying the drawings if we should not care for them. For the naive and somewhat selfish young man apparently does not even admit the thought that anybody's hand would destroy his productions. Smiling, the warden suggested, with a politeness that flattered me extremely, that the series of portraits should commence with mine. I quote word for word that which the warden said to me. Your face actually calls for reproduction on canvas. We shall hang your portrait in the office. The zeal of creativeness, these are the only words I can apply to the passionate, silent agitation in which K. reproduced my features. Usually talkative, he now maintained silence for hours, leaving unanswered my jests and remarks. Be silent, old man, be silent, you are at your best when you are silent, he repeated persistently, calling forth an involuntary smile by his zeal as a professional. My portrait would remind you, my indulgent reader, of that mysterious peculiarity of artists, according to which they very often transmit their own feelings, even their external features, to the subject upon which they are working. Thus, reproducing with remarkable likeness, the lower part of my face, where kindness and the expression of authoritativeness and calm dignity are so harmoniously blended, K. undoubtedly introduced into my eyes his own suffering and even his horror. They're fixed, immobile gaze, madness glimmering somewhere in their depth. The painful eloquence of a deep and infinitely lonely soul, all that was not mine. Is this I? I exclaimed, laughing, when from the canvas this terrible face, full of wild contradictions, stared at me. My friend, I do not congratulate you on this portrait. I do not think it is successful. It is you, old man, you. It is well drawn. You criticize it wrongly. Where will you hang it? He grew talkative again like a magpie, that amiable young man, and all because his wretched painting was to be preserved for some time. O oh, impetuous, O oh, happy youth! Here I could not restrain myself from a little jest for the purpose of teaching a lesson to the self-confident youngster, so I asked him, with a smile. Well, Mr. Artist, what do you think? 
Am I murderer or not? The artist, closing one eye, examined me and the portrait critically. Then whistling a polka, he answered recklessly, The devil knows you, old man. I smiled. K. Understood my jest at last. Burst out laughing and then said with sudden seriousness. You are speaking of the human face but do you know that there is nothing worse in the world than the human face? Even when it tells the truth, when it shouts about the truth, it lies, it lies, old man, for it speaks its own language. Do you know, old man, a terrible incident happened to me? It was in one of the picture galleries in Spain. I was examining a portrait of Christ, when suddenly, Christ, you understand, Christ, great eyes, dark, terrible suffering, sorrow, grief, love, well, in a word, Christ. Suddenly I was struck with something. Suddenly it seemed to me that it was the face of the greatest wrongdoer, tormented by the greatest unheard of woes of repentance, old man, why do you look at me so? Old man. Nearing my eyes to the very face of the artist, I asked him in a cautious whisper, as the occasion required. Dividing each word from the other. Don't you think that when the devil tempted him in the desert he did not renounce him, as he said later, but consented? Sold himself, that he did not renounce the devil, but sold himself. Do you understand? Does not that passage in the Gospels seem doubtful to you? Extreme fright was expressed on the face of my young friend. Forcing the palms of his hands against my chest, as if to push me away, he ejaculated in a voice so low that I could hardly hear his indistinct words. What? You say Jesus sold himself? What for? I explained softly. That the people, my child, that the people should believe him. Well? I smiled. K.S. eyes became round, as if a noose was strangling him. Suddenly, with that lack of respect for old age which was one of his characteristics, he threw me down on the bed with a sharp thrust and jumped away into a corner. When I was slowly getting up from the awkward position into which the unrestraint of that young man had forced me, I fell backward. With my head between the pillow and the back of the bed, he cried to me loudly. Don't you dare. Don't you dare get up, you devil. But I did not think of rising to my feet. I simply sat down on the bed, and, thus seated, with an involuntary smile at the passionate outburst of the youth, I shook my head good-naturedly and laughed. Oh, young man, young man! You yourself have drawn me into this theological conversation. But he stared at me stubbornly, wide-eyed, and kept repeating. Sit there, sit there. I did not say this. No, no. You said it, you, young man, you. Do you remember Spain, the picture gallery? You said it and now you deny it, mocking my clumsy old age. Oh. K. Suddenly lowered his hands and admitted in a low voice. Yes. I said it. But you, old man. I do not remember what he said after that, it is so hard to recall all the childish chatter of this kind, but unfortunately too light-minded young man. I remember only that we parted as friends, and he pressed my hand warmly, expressing to me his sincere gratitude, even calling me, so far as I can remember, his savior. By the way, I succeeded in convincing the warden that the portrait of even such a man as I, after all a prisoner, was out of place in such a solemn official room as the office of our prison. And now the portrait hangs on the wall of my cell, pleasantly breaking the cold monotony of the pure white walls. Leaving for a time our artist, who is now carried away by the portrait of the warden, I shall continue my story. Chapter 7 My spiritual clearness, as I had the pleasure of informing the reader before, has built up for me a considerable circle of men and women admirers. With self-evident emotion I shall tell of the pleasant hours of our hearty conversations, which I modestly call, my talks. It is difficult for me to explain how I deserved it, but the majority of those who come to me regard me with a feeling of the profoundest respect, even adoration. And only a few come for the purpose of arguing with me, but these arguments are usually of a moderate and proper character. 
I usually seat myself in the middle of the room, in a soft and deep armchair, which has furnished me for this occasion by the warden. My hearers surround me closely, and some of them, the more enthusiastic youths and maidens, seat themselves at my feet. Having before me an audience more than half of which is composed of women, and entirely disposed in my favor, I always appeal not so much to the mind as to the sensitive and truthful heart. Fortunately I possess a certain oratorical power, and the customary effects of the oratorical art, to which all preachers, beginning in all probability with Muhammad, have resorted. And which I can handle rather cleverly, allow me to influence my hearers in the desired direction. It is easily understood that to the dear ladies in my audience I am not so much the sage, who has solved the mystery of the iron grate, as a great martyr of a righteous cause. Which they do not quite understand. Shunning abstract discussions, they eagerly hang on every word of compassion and kindness, and respond with the same. Allowing them to love me and to believe in my immutable knowledge of life, I afford them the happy opportunity to depart at least for a time from the coldness of life. From its painful doubts and questions. I say openly without any false modesty, which I despise even as I despise hypocrisy, there were lectures at which I myself being in a state of exaltation, called forth in my audience. Especially in my nervous lady visitors, a mood of intense agitation, which turned into hysterical laughter and tears. Of course I am not a prophet, I am merely a modest thinker, but no one would succeed in convincing my lady admirers that there is no prophetic meaning and significance in my speeches. I remember one such lecture which took place two months ago. The night before I could not sleep as soundly as I usually slept. Perhaps it was simply because of the full moon, which affects sleep, disturbing and interrupting it. I vaguely remember the strange sensation which I experienced and the pale crescent of the moon appeared in my window and the iron squares cut it with ominous black lines into small silver squares. When I started for the lecture I felt exhausted and rather inclined to silence than to conversation, the vision of the night before disturbed me. But when I saw those dear faces, those eyes full of hope and ardent entreaty for friendly advice. When I saw before me that rich field, already ploughed, waiting only for the good seed to be sown, my heart began to burn with delight, pity and love. Avoiding the customary formalities which accompany the meetings of people, declining the hands outstretched to greet me, I turned to the audience, which was agitated at the very sight of me. And gave them my blessing with a gesture to which I know how to lend a peculiar majesty. Come unto me, I exclaimed, come unto me, you who have gone away from that life. Here, in this quiet abode, under the sacred protection of the iron grate, at my heart overflowing with love, you will find rest and comfort. My beloved children, give me your sad soul, exhausted from suffering, and I shall clothe it with light. I shall carry it to those blissful lands where the sun of eternal truth and love never sets. Many had begun to cry already, but, as it was too early for tears, I interrupted them with a gesture of fatherly impatience, and continued. You, dear girl, who came from the world which calls itself free, what gloomy shadows lie on your charming and beautiful face. And you, my daring youth, why are you so pale? Why do I see, instead of the ecstasy of victory, the fear of defeat in your lowered eyes? And you, honest mother, tell me, what wind has made your eyes so red? What furious rain has lashed your wizened face? What snow has whitened your hair, for it used to be dark? But the weeping and the sobs drowned the end of my speech, and besides, I admit it without feeling ashamed of it, I myself brushed away more than one treacherous tear from my eyes. Without allowing the agitation to subside completely, I called in a voice of stern and truthful reproach. Do not weep because your soul is dark, stricken with misfortunes, blinded by chaos. Clipped of its wings by doubts. Give it to me and I shall direct it toward the light, toward order and reason. I know the truth. I have conceived the world. I have discovered the great principle of its purpose. I have solved the sacred formula of the iron grate. I demand of you, 
swear to me by the cold iron of its squares that henceforth you will confess to me without shame or fear all your deeds, your errors and doubts. All the secret thoughts of your soul and the dreams and desires of your body. We swear. We swear. We swear. Save us. Reveal to us the truth. Take our sins upon yourself. Save us. Save us, numerous exclamations resounded. I must mention the sad incident which occurred during that same lecture. At the moment when the excitement reached its height and the hearts had already opened, ready to unburden themselves, a certain youth, looking morose and embittered, exclaimed loudly. Evidently addressing himself to me. Liar! Do not listen to him. He is lying. The indulgent reader will easily believe that it was only by a great effort that I succeeded in saving the incautious youth from the fury of the audience. Offended in that which is most precious to a human being, his faith in goodness and the divine purpose of life. My women admirers rushed upon the foolish youth in a mob and would have beaten him cruelly. Remembering, however, that there was more joy to the pastor in one sinner who repents than in ten righteous men, I took the young man aside where no one could hear us. And entered into a brief conversation with him. Did you call me a liar, my child? Moved by my kindness, the poor young man became confused and answered hesitatingly. Pardon me for my harshness, but it seems to me that you are not telling the truth. I understand you, my friend. You must have been agitated by the intense ecstasy of the women, and you, as a sensible man, not inclined to mysticism, suspected me of fraud, of a hideous fraud. No, no, don't excuse yourself. I understand you. But I wish you would understand me. Out of the mire of superstitions, out of the deep gulf of prejudices and unfounded beliefs. I want to lead their strayed thoughts and place them upon the solid foundation of strictly logical reasoning. The iron grate, which I mentioned, is not a mystical sign, it is only a formula, a simple, sober, honest, mathematical formula. To you, as a sensible man, I will willingly explain this formula. The great is the scheme in which are placed all the laws guiding the universe, which do away with chaos, substituting in its place strict, iron, inviolable order, forgotten by mankind. As a bright-minded man you will easily understand. Pardon me. I did not understand you and if you will permit me I, but why do you make them swear? My friend, the soul of man, believing itself free and constantly suffering from this spurious freedom, is demanding fetters for itself, to some these fetters are an oath, to others a vow. To still others simply a word of honor. You will give me your word of honor, will you not? I will. And by this you are simply striving to enter the harmony of the world, where everything is subjected to a law. Is not the falling of a stone the fulfillment of a vow, of the vow called the law of gravitation? I shall not go into detail about this conversation and the others that followed. The obstinate and unrestrained youth, who had insulted me by calling me liar, became one of my warmest adherents. I must return to the others. During the time that I talked with the young man, the desire for penitence among my charming proselytes reached its height. Not patient enough to wait for me, they commenced in a state of intense ecstasy to confess to one another. Giving to the room an appearance of a garden where dozens of birds of paradise were twittering at the same time. When I returned, each of them separately unfolded her agitated soul to me. I saw how, from day to day, from hour to hour, terrible chaos was struggling in their souls with an eager inclination for harmony and order. How in the bloody struggle between eternal falsehood and immortal truth, falsehood, through inconceivable ways, passed into truth, and truth became falsehood. I found in the human soul all the forces in the world, and none of them was dormant, and in the mad whirlpool each soul became like a fountain. Whose source is the abyss of the sea and whose summit the sky. And every human being, as I have learned and seen, is like the rich and powerful master who gave a masquerade ball at his castle and illuminated it with many lights. And strange masks came from everywhere and the master greeted them, bowing courteously, and vainly asking them who they were. 
and new, ever stranger, ever more terrible, masks were arriving, and the master bowed to them ever more courteously, staggering from fatigue and fear. And they were laughing and whispering strange words about the eternal chaos, whence they came, obeying the call of the master. And lights were burning in the castle, and in the distance lighted windows were visible, reminding him of the festival, and the exhausted master kept bowing ever lower, ever more courteously. Ever more cheerfully. My indulgent reader will easily understand that in addition to a certain sense of fear which I experienced. The greatest delight and even joyous emotion soon came upon me, for I saw that eternal chaos was defeated and the triumphant hymn of bright harmony was rising to the skies. Not without a sense of pride I shall mention the modest offerings by which my kind admirers were striving to express to me their feelings of love and adoration. I am not afraid of calling out a smile on the lips of my readers, for I feel how comical it is, I will say that among the offerings brought me at first were fruit, cakes, all kinds of sweetmeats. But I am afraid, however, that no one will believe me when I say that I have actually declined these offerings, preferring the observance of the prison regime in all its rigidness. At the last lecture, a kind and honorable lady brought me a basketful of live flowers. To my regret, I was compelled to decline this present, too. Forgive me, madam, but flowers do not enter into the system of our prison. I appreciate very much your magnanimous attention, I kiss your hands, madam, I said, but I am compelled to decline the flowers. Traveling along the thorny road to self-renunciation, I must not caress my eyes with the ephemeral and illusionary beauty of these charming lilies and roses. All flowers perish in our prison, madam. Yesterday another lady brought me a very valuable crucifix of ivory, a family heirloom, she said. Not afflicted with the sin of hypocrisy, I told my generous lady frankly that I do not believe in miracles. But at the same time, I said, I regard with the profoundest respect him who is justly called the Savior of the world, and I honor greatly his services to mankind. If I should tell you, madam, that the Gospel has long been my favorite book, that there is not a day in my life that I do not open this great book. Drawing from its strength and courage to be able to continue my hard course, you will understand that your liberal gift could not have fallen into better hands. Henceforth, thanks to you, the sad solitude of my cell will vanish, I am not alone. I bless you, my daughter. I cannot forego mentioning the strange thoughts brought out by the crucifix as it hung there beside my portrait. It was twilight. Outside the wall the bell was tolling heavily in the invisible church, calling the believers together. In the distance, over the deserted field, overgrown with high grass, an unknown wanderer was plodding along, passing into the unknown distance, like a little black dot. It was as quiet in our prison as in a sepulchre. I looked long and attentively at the features of Jesus, which were so calm, so joyous compared with him who looked silently and dully from the wall beside him. And with my habit, formed during the long years of solitude, of addressing inanimate things aloud, I said to the motionless crucifix. Good evening, Jesus. I am glad to welcome you in our prison. There are three of us here, you, I, and the one who is looking from the wall, and I hope that we three will manage to live in peace and in harmony. He is looking silently, and you are silent, and your eyes are closed, I shall speak for the three of us, a sure sign that our peace will never be broken. They were silent, and, continuing, I addressed my speech to the portrait. Where are you looking so intently and so strangely, my unknown friend and roommate? In your eyes I see mystery and reproach. Is it possible that you dare reproach him? Answer. And, pretending that the portrait answered, I continued in a different voice with an expression of extreme sternness and boundless grief. Yes, I do reproach him. Jesus, Jesus. Why is your face so pure, so blissful? You have passed only over the brink of human sufferings, as over the brink of an abyss, and only the foam of the bloody and miry waves have touched you. Do you command me, a human being, to sink into the dark depth? Great is your Golgotha, Jesus, but too reverent and joyous, and one small but interesting stroke is missing, the horror of aimlessness. 
Here I interrupted the speech of the portrait, with an expression of anger. How dare you, I exclaimed, how dare you speak of aimlessness in our prison? They were silent. And suddenly Jesus, without opening his eyes, he even seemed to close them more tightly, answered. Who knows the mysteries of the heart of Jesus? I burst into laughter, and my esteemed reader will easily understand this laughter. It turned out that I, a cool and sober mathematician, possessed a poetic talent and could compose very interesting comedies. I do not know how all this would have ended, for I had already prepared a thundering answer for my roommate when the appearance of the keeper, who brought me food, suddenly interrupted me. But apparently my face bore traces of excitement, for the man asked me with stern sympathy. Were you praying? I do not remember what I answered. Chapter 8 Last Sunday a great misfortune occurred in our prison, the artist K. Whom the reader knows already, ended his life in suicide by flinging himself from the table with his head against the stone floor. The fall and the force of the blow had been so skillfully calculated by the unfortunate young man that his skull was split in two. The grief of the warden was indescribable. Having called me to the office, the warden, without shaking hands with me, reproached me in angry and harsh terms for having deceived him, and he regained his calm. Only after my hearty apologies and promises that such accidents would not happen again. I promised to prepare a project for watching the criminals which would render suicide impossible. The esteemed wife of the warden, whose portrait remained unfinished, was also grieved by the death of the artist. Of course, I had not expected this outcome either, although a few days before committing suicide, K. had provoked in me a feeling of uneasiness. Upon entering his cell one morning, and greeting him, I noticed with amazement that he was sitting before his slate once more drawing human figures. What does this mean, my friend? I inquired cautiously. And how about the portrait of the second assistant? The devil take it. But you. The devil take it. After a pause I remarked distractedly. Your portrait of the warden is meeting with great success. Although some of the people who have seen it say that the right mustache is somewhat shorter than the left. Shorter? Yes, shorter. But in general they find that you caught the likeness very successfully. K. Had put aside his slate pencil and, perfectly calm, said. Tell your warden that I am not going to paint that prison riffraff anymore. After these words there was nothing left for me to do but leave him, which I decided to do. But the artist, who could not get along without giving vent to his effusions, seized me by the hand and said with his usual enthusiasm. Just think of it, old man, what a horror. Every day a new repulsive face appears before me. They sit and stare at me with their frog-like eyes. What am I to do? At first I laughed, I even liked it, but when the frog-like eyes stared at me every day I was seized with horror. I was afraid they might start to quack, qua qua. Indeed there was a certain fear, even madness, in the eyes of the artist, the madness which shortly led him to his untimely grave. Old man, it is necessary to have something beautiful. Do you understand me? And the wife of the warden? Is she not? I shall pass in silence the unbecoming expressions with which he spoke of the lady in his excitement. I must, however, admit that to a certain extent the artist was right in his complaints. I had been present several times at the sittings, and noticed that all who had posed for the artist behaved rather unnaturally. Sincere and naive, conscious of the importance of their position, convinced that the features of their faces perpetuated upon the canvas would go down to posterity. They exaggerated somewhat the qualities which are so characteristic of their high and responsible office in our prison. A certain bombast of pose, an exaggerated expression of stern authority, an obvious consciousness of their own importance. And a noticeable contempt for those on whom their eyes were directed, all this disfigured their kind and affable faces. But I cannot understand what horrible features the artist found where there should have been a smile. I was even indignant at the superficial attitude with which an artist, who considered himself talented and sensible, 
passed the people without noticing that a divine spark was glimmering in each one of them. In the quest after some fantastic beauty he light-mindedly passed by the true beauties with which the human soul is filled. I cannot help feeling sorry for those unfortunate people who, like K. Because of a peculiar construction of their brains, always turn their eyes toward the dark side, whereas there is so much joy and light in our prison. When I said this to K. I heard, to my regret, the same stereotyped and indecent answer. The devil take it. All I could do was to shrug my shoulders. Suddenly changing his tone and bearing, the artist turned to me seriously with a question which, in my opinion, was also indecent. Why do you lie, old man? I was astonished, of course. I lie? Well, let it be the truth, if you like, but why? I am looking and thinking. Why did you say that? Why? My indulgent reader, who knows well what the truth has cost me, will readily understand my profound indignation. I deliberately mention this audacious and other calumnious phrases to show in what an atmosphere of malice, distrust, and disrespect I have to plod along the hard road of suffering. He insisted rudely. I have had enough of your smiles. Tell me plainly, why do you speak so? Then, I admit, I flared up. You want to know why I speak the truth? Because I hate falsehood and I commit it to eternal anathema. Because fate has made me a victim of injustice, and as a victim, like him who took upon himself the great sin of the world and its great sufferings, I wish to point out the way to mankind. Wretched egoist, you know only yourself and your miserable art, while I love mankind. My anger grew. I felt the veins on my forehead swelling. Fool, miserable dauber, unfortunate schoolboy, in love with colors. Human beings pass before you, and you see only their frog-like eyes. How did your tongue turn to say such a thing? Oh, if you only looked even once into the human soul. What treasures of tenderness, love, humble faith, holy humility, you would have discovered there. And to you, bold man, it would have seemed as if you entered a temple, a bright, illuminated temple. But it is said of people like you, do not cast your pearls before swine. The artist was silent, crushed by my angry and unrestrained speech. Finally he sighed and said. Forgive me, old man, I am talking nonsense, of course, but I am so unfortunate and so lonely. Of course, my dear old man, it is all true about the divine spark and about beauty, but a polished boot is also beautiful. I cannot, I cannot. Just think of it. How can a man have such mustaches as he has? And yet he is complaining that the left mustache is shorter. He laughed like a child, and, heaving a sigh, added. I'll make another attempt. I will paint the lady. There is really something good in her. Although she is after all, a cow. He laughed again, and, fearing to brush away with his sleeve the drawing on the slate, he cautiously placed it in the corner. Here I did that which my duty compelled me to do. Seizing the slate, I smashed it to pieces with a powerful blow. I thought that the artist would rush upon me furiously, but he did not. To his weak mind my act seemed so blasphemous, so supernaturally horrible, that his death-like lips could not utter a word. What have you done? he asked at last in a low voice. You have broken it? And raising my hand I replied solemnly. Foolish youth, I have done that which I would have done to my heart if it wanted to jest and mock me. Unfortunate youth, can you not see that your art has long been mocking you, that from that slate of yours the devil himself was making hideous faces at you? Yes. The devil. Being far from your wonderful art, I did not understand you at first, nor your longing, your horror of aimlessness. But when I entered your cell today and noticed you at your ruinous occupation, I said to myself, it is better that he should not create at all than to create in this manner. Listen to me. I then revealed for the first time to this youth the sacred formula of the iron grate, which, dividing the infinite into squares, thereby subjects it to itself. K. Listen to my words with emotion, 
looking with the horror of an ignorant man at the figures which must have seemed to him to be cabalistic, but which were nothing else than the ordinary figures used in mathematics. I am your slave, old man, he said at last, kissing my hand with his cold lips. No, you will be my favorite pupil, my son. I bless you. And it seemed to me that the artist was saved. True, he regarded me with great joy, which could easily be explained by the extreme respect with which I inspired him. And he painted the portrait of the warden's wife with such zeal and enthusiasm that the esteemed lady was sincerely moved. And, strange to say, the artist succeeded in making so strangely beautiful the features of this woman, who was stout and no longer young, that the warden, long accustomed to the face of his wife, was greatly delighted by its new expression. Thus everything went on smoothly, when suddenly this catastrophe occurred, the entire horror of which I alone knew. Not desiring to call forth any unnecessary disputes, I concealed from the warden the fact that on the eve of his death the artist had thrown a letter into my cell, which I noticed only in the morning. I did not preserve the note, nor do I remember all that the unfortunate youth told me in his farewell message, I think it was a letter of thanks for my effort to save him. He wrote that he regretted sincerely that his failing strength did not permit him to avail himself of my instructions. But one phrase impressed itself deeply in my memory, and you will understand the reason for it when I repeat it in all its terrifying simplicity. I am going away from your prison, thus read the phrase. And he really did go away. Here are the walls, here is the little window in the door, here is our prison, but he is not there. He has gone away. Consequently I, too, could go away. Instead of having wasted dozens of years on a titanic struggle, instead of being tormented by the throes of despair, instead of growing enfeebled by horror in the face of unsolved mysteries, of striving to subject the world to my mind and my will, I could have climbed the table and, one instant of pain, I would be free. I would be triumphant over the lock and the walls, over truth and falsehood, over joys and sufferings. I will not say that I had not thought of suicide before as a means of escaping from our prison, but now for the first time it appeared before me in all its attractiveness. In a fit of base faint-heartedness, which I shall not conceal from my reader, even as I do not conceal from him my good qualities. Perhaps even in a fit of temporary insanity I momentarily forgot all I knew about our prison and its great purpose. I forgot, I am ashamed to say, even the great formula of the iron grate, which I conceived and mastered with such difficulty. And I prepared a noose made of my towel for the purpose of strangling myself. But at the last moment, when all was ready, and it was but necessary to push away the taburet, I asked myself. With my habit of reasoning which did not forsake me even at that time, but where am I going? The answer was, I am going to death. But what is death? And the answer was, I do not know. These brief reflections were enough for me to come to myself, and with a bitter laugh at my cowardice I removed the fatal noose from my neck. Just as I had been ready to sob for grief a minute before, so now I laughed, I laughed like a madman, realizing that another trap, placed before me by derisive fate, had so brilliantly been evaded by me. Oh, how many traps there are in the life of man! Like a cunning fisherman, fate catches him now with the alluring bait of some truth, now with the hairy little worm of dark falsehood, now with the phantom of life, now with the phantom of death. My dear young man, my fascinating fool, my charming silly fellow, who told you that our prison ends here, that from one prison you did not fall into another prison, from which it will hardly be possible for you to run away. You were too hasty, my friend, you forgot to ask me something else would have told it to you. I would have told you that omnipotent law reigns over that which you call non-existence and death just as it reigns over that which you call life and existence. Only the fools, dying, believe that they have made an end of themselves, they have ended but one form of themselves, in order to assume another form immediately. Thus I reflected, laughing at the foolish suicide, the ridiculous destroyer of the fetters of eternity. And this is what I said addressing myself to my two silent roommates hanging motionlessly on the white wall of my cell. 
I believe and confess that our prison is immortal. What do you say to this, my friends? But they were silent. And having burst into good-natured laughter, what quiet roommates I have. I undressed slowly and gave myself to peaceful sleep. In my dream I saw another majestic prison, and wonderful jailers with white wings on their backs, and the chief warden of the prison himself. I do not remember whether there were any little windows in the doors or not, but I think there were. I recall that something like an angel's eye was fixed upon me with tender attention and love. My indulgent reader will, of course, guess that I am jesting. I did not dream at all. I am not in the habit of dreaming. Without hoping that the warden, occupied with pressing official affairs, would understand me thoroughly and appreciate my idea concerning the impossibility of escaping from our prison. I confined myself, in my report, to an indication of several ways in which suicides could be averted. With magnanimous short-sightedness peculiar to busy and trusting people, the warden failed to notice the weak points of my project and clasped my hand warmly, expressing to me his gratitude in the name of our entire prison. On that day I had the honor, for the first time, to drink a glass of tea at the home of the warden, in the presence of his kind wife and charming children, who called me, Grandpa. Tears of emotion which gathered in my eyes could but faintly express the feelings that came over me. At the request of the warden's wife, who took a deep interest in me, I related in detail the story of the tragic murders which led me so unexpectedly and so terribly to the prison. I could not find expressions strong enough, there are no expressions strong enough in the human language, to brand adequately the unknown criminal, who not only murdered three helpless people, but who mocked them brutally in a fit of blind and savage rage. As the investigation and the autopsy showed, the murderer dealt the last blows after the people had been dead. It is very possible, however, even murderers should be given their due, that the man, intoxicated by the sight of blood, ceased to be a human being and became a beast, the son of chaos. The child of dark and terrible desires. It was characteristic that the murderer, after having committed the crime, drank wine and ate biscuits, some of these were left on the table together with the marks of his blood-stained fingers. But there was something so horrible that my mind could neither understand nor explain, the murderer, after lighting a cigar himself, apparently moved by a feeling of strange kindness. Put a lighted cigar between the closed teeth of my father. I had not recalled these details in many years. They had almost been erased by the hand of time, and now while relating them to my shocked listeners, who would not believe that such horrors were possible. I felt my face turning pale and my hair quivering on my head. In an outburst of grief and anger I rose from my armchair, and straightening myself to my full height, I exclaimed. Justice on earth is often powerless, but I implore heavenly justice. I implore the justice of life which never forgives, I implore all the higher laws under whose authority man lives. May the guilty one not escape his deserved punishment. His punishment. Moved by my sobs, my listeners there and then expressed their zeal and readiness to work for my liberation, and thus at least partly redeem the injustice heaped upon me. I apologized and returned to my cell. Evidently my old organism cannot bear such agitation any longer. Besides, it is hard even for a strong man to picture in his imagination certain images without risking the loss of his reason. Only in this way can I explain the strange hallucination which appeared before my fatigued eyes in the solitude of my cell. As though benumbed I gazed aimlessly at the tightly closed door, when suddenly it seemed to me that someone was standing behind me. I had felt this deceptive sensation before, so I did not turn around for some time. But when I turned around at last I saw, in the distance, between the crucifix and my portrait, about a quarter of a yard above the floor, the body of my father, as though hanging in the air. It is hard for me to give the details, for twilight had long set in, but I can say with certainty that it was the image of a corpse, and not of a living being. Although a cigar was smoking in its mouth. To be more exact, there was no smoke from the cigar, but a faintly reddish light was seen. It is characteristic that I did not sense the odor of tobacco either at that time or later, I had long given up smoking. 
Here, I must confess my weakness, but the illusion was striking, I commenced to speak to the hallucination. Advancing as closely as possible, the body did not retreat as I approached, but remained perfectly motionless, I said to the ghost. I thank you, father. You know how your son is suffering, and you have come, you have come to testify to my innocence. I thank you, father. Give me your hand, and with a firm filial handclasp I will respond to your unexpected visit. Don't you want to? Let me have your hand. Give me your hand, or I will call you a liar. I stretched out my hand, but of course the hallucination did not deem it worth while to respond, and I was forever deprived of the opportunity of feeling the touch of a ghost. The cry which I uttered and which so upset my friend, the jailer, creating some confusion in the prison, was called forth by the sudden disappearance of the phantom, it was so sudden that the space in the place where the corpse had been seemed to me more terrible than the corpse itself. Such is the power of human imagination when, excited, it creates phantoms and visions, peopling the bottomless and ever-silent emptiness with them. It is sad to admit that there are people, however, who believe in ghosts and build upon this belief nonsensical theories about certain relations between the world of the living and the enigmatic land inhabited by the dead. I understand that the human ear and eye can be deceived, but how can the great and lucid human mind fall into such coarse and ridiculous deception? I ask the jailer. I feel a strange sensation, as though there were the odor of cigar smoke in my cell. Don't you smell it? The jailer sniffed the air conscientiously and replied. No I don't. You only imagined it. If you need any confirmation, here is a splendid proof that all I had seen, if it existed at all, existed only in the net of my eye. Chapter 9 Something altogether unexpected has happened. The efforts of my friends, the warden and his wife, were crowned with success, and for two months I have been free, out of prison. I am happy to inform you that immediately upon my leaving the prison I occupied a very honorable position, to which I could hardly have aspired, conscious of my humble qualities. The entire press met me with unanimous enthusiasm. Numerous journalists, photographers, even caricaturists, the people of our time are so fond of laughter and clever witticisms. In hundreds of articles and drawings reproduced the story of my remarkable life. With striking unanimity the newspapers assigned to me the name of a master, a highly flattering name, which I accepted, after some hesitation, with deep gratitude. I do not know whether it is worth mentioning the few hostile notices called forth by irritation and envy, a vice which so frequently stains the human soul. In one of these notices, which appeared, by the way, in a very filthy little newspaper, a certain scamp, guided by wretched gossip and baseless rumors about my chats in our prison, called me a zealot and liar. Enraged by the insolence of the miserable scribbler, my friends wanted to prosecute him, but I persuaded them not to do it. Vice is its own proper punishment. The fortune which my kind mother had left me and which had grown considerably during the time I was in prison has enabled me to settle down to a life of luxury in one of the most aristocratic hotels. I have a large retinue of servants at my command and an automobile, a splendid invention with which I now became acquainted for the first time, and I have skillfully arranged my financial affairs. Live flowers brought to me in abundance by my charming lady visitors give to my nook the appearance of a flower garden or even a bit of a tropical forest. My servant, a very decent young man, is in a state of despair. He says that he had never seen such a variety of flowers and had never smelled such a variety of odors at the same time. If not for my advanced age and the strict and serious propriety with which I treat my visitors, I do not know how far they would have gone in the expression of their feelings. How many perfumed notes! How many languid sighs and humbly imploring eyes! There was even a fascinating stranger with a black veil, three times she appeared mysteriously, and when she learned that I had visitors she disappeared just as mysteriously. I will add that at the present time I have had the honor of being elected an honorary member of numerous humanitarian organizations such as, the League of Peace. The League for Combating Juvenile Criminality, the Society of the Friends of Man, and others. 
Besides, at the request of the editor of one of the most widely read newspapers, I am to begin next month a series of public lectures. For which purpose I am going on a tour together with my kind impresario. I have already prepared my material for the first three lectures and, in the hope that my reader may be interested, I shall give the synopsis of these lectures. First Lecture Chaos or Order The Eternal Struggle Between Chaos and Order The Eternal Revolt and the Defeat of Chaos, the Rebel The Triumph of Law and Order Second Lecture What is the Soul of Man? The Eternal Conflict in the Soul of Man Between Chaos, Whence it Came, and Harmony, Whither it Strives Irresistibly Falsehood, as the Offspring of Chaos, and Truth, as the Child of Harmony the Triumph of Truth and the Downfall of Falsehood Third Lecture The Explanation of the Sacred Formula of the Iron Grate As my indulgent reader will see, justice is after all not an empty sound, and I am getting a great reward for my sufferings. But not daring to reproach fate which was so merciful to me, I nevertheless do not feel that sense of contentment which, it would seem, I ought to feel. True, at first I was positively happy, but soon my habit for strictly logical reasoning, the clearness and honesty of my views, gained by contemplating the world through a mathematically correct grate, have led me to a series of disillusions. I am afraid to say it now with full certainty, but it seems to me that all their life of this so-called freedom is a continuous self-deception and falsehood. The life of each of these people, whom I have seen during these days, is moving in a strictly defined circle, which is just as solid as the corridors of our prison. Just as closed as the dial of the watches which they, in the innocence of their mind, lift every minute to their eyes, not understanding the fatal meaning of the eternally moving hand. Which is eternally returning to its place, and each of them feels this, even as the circus horse probably feels it. But in a state of strange blindness each one assures us that he is perfectly free and moving forward. Like the stupid bird which is beating itself to exhaustion against the transparent glass obstacle, without understanding what it is that obstructs its way. These people are helplessly beating against the walls of their glass prison. I was greatly mistaken, it seems, also in the significance of the greetings which fell to my lot when I left the prison. Of course I was convinced that in me they greeted the representative of our prison, a leader hardened by experience, a master who came to them only for the purpose of revealing to them the great mystery of purpose. And when they congratulated me upon the freedom granted to me I responded with thanks, not suspecting what an idiotic meaning they placed on the word. May I be forgiven this coarse expression, but I am powerless now to restrain my aversion for their stupid life, for their thoughts, for their feelings. Foolish hypocrites, fearing to tell the truth even when it adorns them. My hardened truthfulness was cruelly taxed in the midst of these false and trivial people. Not a single person believed that I was never so happy as in prison. Why, then, are they so surprised at me, and why do they print my portraits? Are there so few idiots that are unhappy in prison? And the most remarkable thing, which only my indulgent reader will be able to appreciate, is this, often distrusting me completely, they nevertheless sincerely go into raptures over me. Bowing before me, clasping my hands and mumbling at every step, Master! Master! If they only profited by their constant lying, but, no, they are perfectly disinterested, and they lie as though by someone's higher order. They lie in the fanatical conviction that falsehood is in no way different from the truth. Wretched actors, even incapable of a decent makeup, they writhe from morning till night on the boards of the stage, and, dying the most real death, suffering the most real sufferings. They bring into their deathly convulsions the cheap art of the harlequin. Even their crooks are not real, they only play the roles of crooks, while remaining honest people. And the role of honest people is played by rogues, and played poorly, and the public sees it, but in the name of the same fatal falsehood it gives them wreaths and bouquets. And if there is really a talented actor who can wipe away the boundary between truth and deception, so that even they begin to believe, they go into raptures, call him great. Start a subscription for a monument, but do not give any money. 
Desperate cowards, they fear themselves most of all, and admiring delightedly the reflection of their spuriously made-up faces in the mirror. They howl with fear and rage when someone incautiously holds up the mirror to their soul. My indulgent reader should accept all this relatively, not forgetting that certain grumblings are natural in old age. Of course, I have met quite a number of most worthy people, absolutely truthful, sincere, and courageous, I am proud to admit that I found among them also a proper estimate of my personality. With the support of these friends of mine I hope to complete successfully my struggle for truth and justice. I am sufficiently strong for my sixty years, and, it seems, there is no power that could break my iron will. At times I am seized with fatigue owing to their absurd mode of life. I have not the proper rest even at night. The consciousness that while going to bed I may absent-mindedly have forgotten to lock my bedroom door compels me to jump from my bed dozens of times and to feel the lock with a quiver of horror. Not long ago it happened that I locked my door and hid the key under my pillow, perfectly confident that my room was locked, when suddenly I heard a knock, then the door opened. And my servant entered with a smile on his face. You, dear reader, will easily understand the horror I experienced at this unexpected visit, it seemed to me that someone had entered my soul. And though I have absolutely nothing to conceal, this breaking into my room seems to me indecent, to say the least. I caught a cold a few days ago, there is a terrible draft in their windows, and I asked my servant to watch me at night. In the morning I asked him, in jest. Well, did I talk much in my sleep? No, you didn't talk at all. I had a terrible dream, and I remember I even cried. No, you smiled all the time, and I thought, what fine dreams our master must see. The dear youth must have been sincerely devoted to me, and I am deeply moved by such devotion during these painful days. Tomorrow I shall sit down to prepare my lectures. It is high time. Chapter 10 My God what has happened to me? I do not know how I shall tell my reader about it. I was on the brink of the abyss, I almost perished. What cruel temptations fate is sending me! Fools, we smile, without suspecting anything, when some murderous hand is already lifted to attack us, we smile, and the very next instant we open our eyes wide with horror. I, I cried. I cried. Another moment and deceived, would have hurled myself down, thinking that I was flying toward the sky. It turned out that, the charming stranger, who wore a dark veil, and who came to me so mysteriously three times, was no one else than Madame N, my former fiancé, my love, my dream and my suffering. But order! Order! May my indulgent reader forgive the involuntary incoherence of the preceding lines, but I am sixty years old, and my strength is beginning to fail me, and I am alone. My unknown reader, be my friend at this moment, for I am not of iron, and my strength is beginning to fail me. Listen, my friend. I shall endeavor to tell you exactly and in detail, as objectively as my cold and clear mind will be able to do it, all that has happened. You must understand that which my tongue may omit. I was sitting, engaged upon the preparation of my lecture, seriously carried away by the absorbing work, when my servant announced that the strange lady in the black veil was there again. And that she wished to see me. I confess I was irritated, that I was ready to decline to see her, but my curiosity, coupled with my desire not to offend her, led me to receive the unexpected guest. Assuming the expression of majestic nobleness with which I usually greet my visitors, and softening that expression somewhat by a smile in view of the romantic character of the affair. I ordered my servant to open the door. Please be seated, my dear guest, I said politely to the stranger, who stood as dazed before me, still keeping the veil on her face. She sat down. Although I respect all secrecy, I continued jestingly, I would nevertheless ask you to remove this gloomy cover which disfigures you. Does the human face need a mask? The strange visitor declined, in a state of agitation. Very well, I'll take it off, but not now, later. First I want to see you well. 
The pleasant voice of the stranger did not call forth any recollections in me. Deeply interested and even flattered, I submitted to my strange visitor all the treasures of my mind, experience and talent. With enthusiasm I related to her the edifying story of my life, constantly illuminating every detail with a ray of the great purpose. In this I availed myself partly of the material on which I had just been working, preparing my lectures. The passionate attention with which the strange lady listened to my words, the frequent, deep sighs, the nervous quiver of her thin fingers in her black gloves. Her agitated exclamations, inspired me. Carried away by my own narrative, I confess, I did not pay proper attention to the queer behavior of my strange visitor. Having lost all restraint, she now clasped my hands, now pushed them away, she cried and availing herself of each pause in my speech, she implored. Don't, don't, don't. Stop speaking. I can't listen to it. And at the moment when I least expected it she tore the veil from her face, and before my eyes, before my eyes appeared her face, the face of my love, of my dream, of my boundless and bitter sorrow. Perhaps because I lived all my life dreaming of her alone, with her alone I was young, with her I had developed and grown old. With her I was advancing to the grave, her face seemed to me neither old and nor faded, it was exactly as I had pictured it in my dreams, it seemed endlessly dear to me. What has happened to me? For the first time in tens of years I forgot that I had a face, for the first time in tens of years I looked helplessly, like a youngster, like a criminal caught red-handed. Waiting for some deadly blow. You see. You see. It is I. It is I. My God, why are you silent? Don't you recognize me? Did I recognize her? It were better not to have known that face at all. It were better for me to have grown blind rather than to see her again. Why are you silent? How terrible you are! You have forgotten me. Madam. Of course, I should have continued in this manner, I saw how she staggered. I saw how with trembling fingers, almost falling, she was looking for her veil. I saw that another word of courageous truth, and the terrible vision would vanish never to appear again. But some stranger within me, not I, not I, uttered the following absurd, ridiculous phrase, in which, despite its chilliness, rang so much jealousy and hopeless sorrow. Madam, you have deceived me. I don't know you. Perhaps you entered the wrong door. I suppose your husband and your children are waiting for you. Please, my servant will take you down to the carriage. Could I think that these words, uttered in the same stern and cold voice, would have such a strange effect upon the woman's heart? With a cry, all the bitter passion of which I could not describe, she threw herself before me on her knees, exclaiming. So you do love me. Forgetting that our life had already been lived, that we were old, that all had been ruined and scattered like dust by time, and that it can never return again. Forgetting that I was grey, that my shoulders were bent, that the voice of passion sounds strangely when it comes from old lips, I burst into impetuous reproaches and complaints. Yes, I did deceive you, her deathly pale lips uttered. I knew that you were innocent. Be silent. Be silent. Everybody laughed at me, even your friends, your mother whom I despised for it, all betrayed you. Only I kept repeating, he is innocent. Oh, if this woman knew what she was doing to me with her words. If the trumpet of the angel, announcing the day of judgment, had resounded at my very ear, would not have been so frightened as now. What is the blaring of a trumpet calling to battle and struggle to the ear of the brave? It was as if an abyss had opened at my feet. It was as if an abyss had opened before me, and as though blinded by lightning, as though dazed by a blow, I shouted in an outburst of wild and strange ecstasy. Be silent. I. If that woman were sent by God, she would have become silent. If she were sent by the devil, she would have become silent even then. But there was neither God nor devil in her, and interrupting me, not permitting me to finish the phrase, she went on. No, I will not be silent. I must tell you all. I have waited for you so many years. 
Listen, listen. But suddenly she saw my face and she retreated, seized with horror. What is it? What is the matter with you? Why do you laugh? I am afraid of your laughter. Stop laughing. Don't. Don't. But I was not laughing at all, I only smiled softly. And then I said very seriously, without smiling. I am smiling because I am glad to see you. Tell me about yourself. And, as in a dream, I saw her face and I heard her soft terrible whisper. You know that I love you. You know that all my life I loved you alone. I lived with another and was faithful to him. I have children, but you know they are all strangers to me, he and the children and I myself. Yes, I deceived you, I am a criminal, but I do not know how it happened. He was so kind to me, he made me believe that he was convinced of your innocence, later I learned that he did not tell the truth, and with this, just think of it, with this he won me. You lie. I swear to you. For a whole year he followed me and spoke only of you. One day he even cried when I told him about you, about your sufferings, about your love. But he was lying. Of course he was lying. But at that time he seemed so dear to me, so kind that I kissed him on the forehead. Then we used to bring you flowers to the prison. One day as we were returning from you, listen, he suddenly proposed that we should go out driving. The evening was so beautiful. And you went. How did you dare go out with him? You had just seen my prison, you had just been near me, and yet you dared go with him. How base. Be silent. Be silent. I know I am a criminal. But I was so exhausted, so tired, and you were so far away. Understand me. She began to cry, wringing her hands. Understand me. I was so exhausted. And he, he saw how I felt, and yet he dared kiss me. He kissed you. And you allowed him? On the lips? No, no. Only on the cheek. You lie. No, no. I swear to you. I began to laugh. You responded? And you were driving in the forest, you, my fiancé, my love, my dream. And all this for my sake. Tell me. Speak. In my rage I wrung her arms, and wriggling like a snake, vainly trying to evade my look, she whispered. Forgive me, forgive me. How many children have you? Forgive me. But my reason forsook me, and in my growing rage I cried, stamping my foot. How many children have you? Speak, or I will kill you. I actually said this. Evidently I was losing my reason completely if I could threaten to kill a helpless woman. And she, surmising apparently that my threats were mere words, answered with feigned readiness. Kill me. You have a right to do it. I am a criminal. I deceived you. You are a martyr, a saint. When you told me, is it true that even in your thoughts you never deceived me, even in your thoughts? And again an abyss opened before me. Everything trembled, everything fell, everything became an absurd dream, and in the last effort to save my extinguishing reason I shouted. But you are happy. You cannot be unhappy, you have no right to be unhappy. Otherwise I shall lose my mind. But she did not understand. With a bitter laugh, with a senseless smile, in which her suffering mingled with bright, heavenly joy, she said. I am happy. I, happy. Oh, my friend, only near you I can find happiness. From the moment you left the prison I began to despise my home. I am alone there, I am a stranger to all. If you only knew how I hate that scoundrel. You are sensible. You must have felt that you were not alone in prison, that I was always with you there. And he? Be silent. Be silent. If you only heard with what delight I called him scoundrel. She burst into laughter, frightening me by the wild expression on her face. Just think of it. 
all his life he embraced only a lie. And when, deceived, happy, he fell asleep, I looked at him with wide open eyes, I gnashed my teeth softly, and I felt like pinching him, like sticking him with a pin. She burst into laughter again. It seemed to me that she was driving wedges into my brain. Clasping my head, I cried. You lie. You lie to me. Indeed, it was easier for me to speak to the ghost than to the woman. What could I say to her? My mind was growing dim. And how could I repulse her when she, full of love and passion, kissed my hands, my eyes, my face? It was she, my love, my dream, my bitter sorrow. I love you. I love you. And I believed her, I believed her love. I believed everything. And once more I felt that my locks were black, and I saw myself young again. And I knelt before her and wept for a long time, and whispered to her about my sufferings, about the pain of solitude, about a heart cruelly broken, about offended, disfigured, mutilated thoughts. And, laughing and crying, she stroked my hair. Suddenly she noticed that it was grey, and she cried strangely. What is it? And life? I am an old woman already. On leaving me she demanded that I escort her to the threshold, like a young man, and I did. Before going she said to me. I am coming back tomorrow. I know my children will deny me, my daughter is to marry soon. You and I will go away. Do you love me? I do. We will go far, far away, my dear. You wanted to deliver some lectures. You should not do it. I don't like what you say about that iron grate. You are exhausted, you need a rest. Shall it be so? Yes. Oh, I forgot my veil. Keep it, keep it as a remembrance of this day. My dear. In the vestibule, in the presence of the sleepy porter, she kissed me. There was the odor of some new perfume, unlike the perfume with which her letter was scented. And her coquettish laugh was like a sob as she disappeared behind the glass door. That night I aroused my servant, ordered him to pack our things, and we went away. I shall not say where I am at present, but last night and tonight trees were rustling over my head and the rain was beating against my windows. Here the windows are small, and I feel much better. I wrote her a rather long letter, the contents of which I shall not reproduce. I shall never see her again. But what am I to do? May the reader pardon these incoherent questions. They are so natural in a man in my condition. Besides, I caught an acute rheumatism while traveling, which is most painful and even dangerous for a man of my age, and which does not permit me to reason calmly. For some reason or another I think very often about my young friend K, who went to an untimely grave. How does he feel in his new prison? Tomorrow morning, if my strength will permit me, I intend to pay a visit to the warden of our prison and to his esteemed wife. Our Prison Chapter 11 I am profoundly happy to inform my dear reader that I have completely recovered my physical as well as my spiritual powers. A long rest out in the country, amid nature's soothing beauties. The contemplation of village life, which is so simple and bright. The absence of the noise of the city, where hundreds of windmills are stupidly flapping their long arms before your very nose, and finally the complete solitude. Undisturbed by anything, all these have restored to my unbalanced view of the world all its former steadiness and its iron, irresistible firmness. I look upon my future calmly and confidently, and although it promises me nothing but a lonely grave and the last journey to an unknown distance. I am ready to meet death just as courageously as I lived my life, drawing strength from my solitude, from the consciousness of my innocence and my uprightness. After long hesitations, which are not quite intelligible to me now, I finally resolve to establish for myself the system of our prison in all its rigidness. For that purpose, finding a small house in the outskirts of the city, which was to be leased for a long term of years, I hired it. Then with the kind assistance of the warden of our prison, I cannot express my gratitude to him adequately enough in words, I invited to the new place one of the most experienced jailers. 
who is still a young man, but already hardened in the strict principles of our prison. Availing myself of his instruction, and also of the suggestions of the obliging warden, I have engaged workmen who transformed one of the rooms into a cell. The measurements as well as the form and all the details of my new, and, I hope, my last dwelling are strictly in accordance with my plan. My cell is eight by four yards, four yards high, the walls are painted gray at the bottom, the upper part of the walls and the ceiling are white, and near the ceiling there is a square window one and a half by one and a half yards. With a massive iron grate, which has already become rusty with age. In the door, locked with a heavy and strong lock, which issues a loud creak at each turn of the key, there is a small hole for observation, and below it a little window, through which the food is brought and received. The furnishing of the cell, a table, a chair, and a cot fastened to the wall, on the wall a crucifix, my portrait, and the rules concerning the conduct of the prisoners, in a black frame. And in the corner a closet filled with books. This last, being a violation of the strict harmony of my dwelling, I was compelled to do by extreme and sad necessity. The jailer positively refused to be my librarian and to bring the books according to my order, and to engage a special librarian seemed to me to be an act of unnecessary eccentricity. Aside from this, in elaborating my plans, I met with strong opposition not only from the local population, which simply declared me to be insane, but even from the enlightened people. Even the warden endeavored for some time to dissuade me, but finally he clasped my hand warmly, with an expression of sincere regret at not being in a position to offer me a place in our prison. I cannot recall the first day of my confinement without a bitter smile. A mob of impertinent and ignorant idlers yelled from morning till night at my window, with their heads lifted high, my cell is situated in the second story, and they heaped upon me senseless abuse. There were even efforts, to the disgrace of my townspeople, to storm my dwelling, and one heavy stone almost crushed my head. Only the police, which arrived in time, succeeded in averting the catastrophe. When, in the evening, I went out for a walk, hundreds of fools, adults and children, followed me, shouting and whistling, heaping abuse upon me, and even hurling mud at me. Thus, like a persecuted prophet, I wended my way without fear amidst the maddened crowd, answering their blows and curses with proud silence. What has stirred these fools? In what way have I offended their empty heads? When I lied to them, they kissed my hands. Now, when I have re-established the sacred truth of my life in all its strictness and purity, they burst into curses, they branded me with contempt, they hurled mud at me. They were disturbed because I dared to live alone, and because I did not ask them for a place in the common cell for rogues. How difficult it is to be truthful in this world. True, my perseverance and firmness finally defeated them. With the naivete of savages, who honor all they do not understand, they commenced, in the second year, to bow to me, and they are making ever lower bows to me. Because their amazement is growing ever greater, their fear of the inexplicable is growing ever deeper. And the fact that I never respond to their greetings fills them with delight, and the fact that I never smile in response to their flattering smiles fills them with a firm assurance that they are guilty before me for some grave wrong, and that I know their guilt. Having lost confidence in their own and other people's words, they revere my silence, even as people revere every silence and every mystery. If I were to start to speak suddenly, I would again become human to them and would disillusion them bitterly, no matter what I would say, in my silence I am to them like their eternally silent God. For these strange people would cease believing their God as soon as their God would commence to speak. Their women are already regarding me as a saint. And the kneeling women and sick children that I often find at the threshold of my dwelling undoubtedly expect of me a trifle, to heal them, to perform a miracle. Well, another year or two will pass, and I shall commence to perform miracles as well as those of whom they speak with such enthusiasm. Strange people, at times I feel sorry for them, and I begin to feel really angry at the devil who so skillfully mixed the cards in their game that only the cheat knows the truth. His little cheating truth about the marked queens and the marked kings. They bow too low, however, 
and this hinders me from developing a sense of mercy, otherwise, smile at my jest. Indulgent reader, I would not restrain myself from the temptation of performing two or three small, but effective miracles. I must go back to the description of my prison. Having constructed my cell completely, I offered my jailer the following alternative, he must observe with regard to me the rules of the prison regime in all its rigidness. And in that case he would inherit all my fortune according to my will, or he would receive nothing if he failed to do his duty. It seemed that in putting the matter before him so clearly I would meet with no difficulties. Yet at the very first instance, when I should have been incarcerated for violating some prison regulation, this naive and timid man absolutely refused to do it. And only when I threatened to get another man immediately, a more conscientious jailer, was he compelled to perform his duty. Though he always locked the door punctually, he at first neglected his duty of watching me through the peephole. And when I tried to test his firmness by suggesting a change in some rule or other to the detriment of common sense he yielded willingly and quickly. One day, on trapping him in this way, I said to him, My friend, you are simply foolish. If you will not watch me and guard me properly I shall run away to another prison, taking my legacy along with me. What will you do then? I am happy to inform you that at the present time all these misunderstandings have been removed, and if there is anything I can complain of it is rather excessive strictness than mildness. Now that my jailer has entered into the spirit of his position this honest man treats me with extreme sternness, not for the sake of the prophet but for the sake of the principle. Thus, in the beginning of this week he incarcerated me for twenty-four hours for violating some rule, of which, it seemed to me, I was not guilty. And protesting against this seeming injustice I had the unpardonable weakness to say to him. In the end I will drive you away from here. You must not forget that you are my servant. Before you drive me away I will incarcerate you, replied this worthy man. But how about the money? I asked with astonishment. Don't you know that you will be deprived of it? Do I need your money? I would give up all my own money if I could stop being what I am. But what can I do if you violate the rule and I must punish you by incarcerating you? I am powerless to describe the joyous emotion which came over me at the thought that the consciousness of duty had at last entered his dark mind, and that now. Even if in a moment of weakness I wanted to leave my prison, my conscientious jailer would not permit me to do it. The spark of firmness which glittered in his round eyes showed me clearly that no matter where I might run away he would find me and bring me back. And that the revolver which he often forgot to take before, and which he now cleans every day, would do its work in the event I decided to run away. And for the first time in all these years I fell asleep on the stone floor of my dark cell with a happy smile, realizing that my plan was crowned with complete success. Passing from the realm of eccentricity to the domain of stern and austere reality. And the fear which I felt while falling asleep in the presence of my jailer, my fear of his resolute look, of his revolver. My timid desire to hear a word of praise from him, or to call forth perhaps a smile on his lips, re-echoed in my soul as the harmonious clanking of my eternal and last chains. Thus I pass my last years. As before, my health is sound and my free spirit is clear. Let some call me a fool and laugh at me. In their pitiful blindness let others regard me as a saint and expect me to perform miracles. An upright man to some people, to others, a liar and a deceiver, I myself know who I am, and I do not ask them to understand me. And if there are people who will accuse me of deception, of baseness, even of the lack of simple honor, for there are scoundrels who are convinced to this day that I committed murder, no one will dare accuse me of cowardice. No one will dare say that I could not perform my painful duty to the end. From the beginning till the end I remained firm and unbribable, and though a bugbear, a fanatic, a dark horror to some people, I may awaken in others a heroic dream of the infinite power of man. I have long discontinued to receive visitors, and with the death of the warden of our prison, my only true friend, whom I visited occasionally, my last tie with this world was broken. Only I and my ferocious jailer, who watches every movement of mine with mad suspicion, 
and the black grate which has caught in its iron embrace and muzzled the infinite, this is my life. Silently accepting the low bows, in my cold estrangement from the people I am passing my last road. I am thinking of death ever more frequently, but even before death I do not bend my fearless look. Whether it brings me eternal rest or a new unknown and terrible struggle, I am humbly prepared to accept it. Farewell, my dear reader. Like a vague phantom you appeared before my eyes and passed, leaving me alone before the face of life and death. Do not be angry because at times I deceived you and lied, you, too, would have lied perhaps in my place. Nevertheless I loved you sincerely, and sincerely longed for your love. And the thought of your sympathy for me was quite a support to me in my moments and days of hardship. I am sending you my last farewell and my sincere advice. Forget about my existence, even as I shall henceforth forget about yours forever. A deserted field, overgrown with high grass, devoid of an echo, extends like a deep carpet to the very fence of our prison, whose majestic outlines subdue my imagination and my mind. When the dying sun illumines it with its last rays, and our prison, all in red, stands like a queen, like a martyr, with the dark wounds of its grated windows. And the sun rises silently and proudly over the plain, with sorrow, like a lover, I send my complaints and my sighs and my tender reproach and vows to her, to my love, to my dream. To my bitter and last sorrow. I wish I could forever remain near her, but here I look back, and black against the fiery frame of the sunset stands my jailer, stands and waits. With a sigh I go back in silence, and he moves behind me noiselessly, about two steps away, watching every move of mine. Our prison is beautiful at sunset. The Story of the Snake Hush, hush, hush. Move nearer to me. Look into my eyes. I have always been a charming creature, so gentle, so sensitive, so grateful, and wise, and noble, and so elastic in the curvings of my beautiful body. It will be a joy for you to see my quiet dance, now I will curl my body in rings. My scales will glitter dully, as I embrace myself so gently and in this tender cold embrace multiply my body of steel. Alone in the multitude. Alone in the multitude. Hush, hush. Look into my eyes. You do not like my swaying motion and my frank open glance. Oh, heavy is my head, and that is why I sway gently from side to side. Oh, heavy is my head, and that is why my look is so open and frank. Move closer. Give me a little warmth, touch my wise forehead with your fingers, in the beautiful lines of my forehead you will find the shape of the bowl into which flows the wisdom. The dew of the flowers of the night. When the curves of my body sweep the air, it retains their windings, the tissue of a most delicate web, the interlacing of the charms of sleep, the fascination of noiseless motion. The soundless whistling of gliding lines. Silent, I sway from side to side, I look and I sway, ah, what a burden I carry on my neck. I love you. I have always been a charming creature, and tender was my love. Move closer. Do you see my beautiful little teeth, so white and so sharp? I bit, when I kissed. Oh, no. Not painfully, no. Gently. Tenderly caressing, I bit so lightly that but the first light drops appeared, and the cries resembled laughter when one is tickled. And this caress of mine was very pleasant. Else those whom I kissed would not have come for more caresses. And now I can kiss but once, ah, how sad. But once. One kiss for each, it is so little for the loving heart, the feeling soul that seeks to blend with other souls in love. But it is only I, the sad one, that can kiss but once and then again must seek another love. He whom I kiss can know no other love. For him inviolable and eternal is this my only kiss, my wedding kiss so tender. I speak to you so trustfully and when my tale is done. I shall kiss you. I love you. Look into my eyes. Look, what a magnificent, majestic gaze I have, so firm, so open, piercing as cold steel pressed to one's heart. 
I gaze and I sway here, I gaze and I charm you. In my green eyes I gather your fear, your love's obedient and weary longing. Move closer. It is I who am a queen now, and you dare not gaze upon my beauty. And yet there was a time. Such a peculiar time. The mere recollection of it makes me shudder. I was not loved. I was not honored. With cruel ferocity I was hunted down, scorned, and trampled into dust. What a peculiar time! Alone in the multitude! Alone in the multitude! I say to you, move closer! Why did they not love me? For even then I was a charming creature, so kind, so gentle. And how I danced! But they tormented me, with fire they burned me. The coarse and heavy beasts trampled me down with the large hoofs of their madly beating feet. The cold tusks of their bloody mouths tore my tender body. And I gnawed the sand in the impotence of my anguish, swallowed the dust of the earth, and died in despair. Every day I died, trampled into dust. Every day I died in despair. Ah, what a horrid time! The stupid forest has forgotten all this, but won't you pity me? Move closer. Have pity on me, the long sufferer, so sad, so loving, so beautiful in the dance. I love you. How could I defend myself? I had but my beautiful, little, sharp, white teeth, fit only for kissing. How could I defend myself? It is only now that I carry this awful burden of a heavy head upon my neck, it is only now that my gaze is piercing and commanding. At that time my head was light, and my eyes were gentle. I had no poison then. Ah, heavy is my head, and it is so hard for me to hold it up. Ah, I am so tired of my own gaze. There are two stones set into my forehead, two stones for my eyes. Let them be precious jewels, those sparkling stones of mine, but it is so hard to carry them instead of gentle eyes, they press my brain, ah, heavy is my head. I look and I sway, and you appear to be in a greenish haze, so far away. Move closer. Do you see? Even in sadness I am beautiful, and my gaze is languid with love. Look into the pupil of my eye, see, now I expand it, and now I contract it. I can make it twinkle with the peculiar glitter of the night star, I can make it sparkle with the wonderful play of every jewel, the brilliant diamond, the green emerald, the yellow topaz. The bloody ruby. Look into my eyes, a queen, I place a crown upon my head. That which is burning, glittering and sparkling in my eyes, which robs you of your senses, your will, your life, that is my poison, the little drops of my poison. How did it happen? I know not. I never wished the living evil. I lived and I suffered. Silent, I concealed myself. Hurriedly I crawled away, when escape was possible. But no one saw me weep, for I cannot weep. Only my quiet dance became more rapid, more beautiful. Alone in the stillness of the desert, alone with the grief in my heart, I danced on. They hated my rapid dance and would have gladly killed me, as I danced there. And then, suddenly, my head began to grow heavy. It was still the same little, beautiful, wise head, and yet it had become dreadfully heavy, it lowered my neck to the earth and hurt me. Now I am used to it, but at that time I was very uncomfortable. I thought that I was ill. And suddenly. Move closer. Look into my eyes. Hush, hush, hush. And suddenly my gaze grew heavy, stern, and piercing. I was even frightened. Sometimes I want to look at something and turn my gaze away, but no. My gaze is straight, direct. It pierces further, further, as though I were becoming petrified. Look into my eyes. It seems as though I have become petrified and everything I look on turns to stone. Look into my eyes. I love you. Do not laugh at my confiding story, or you will anger me. So every hour I open wide, confidingly, my heart, and yet I am alone. A ringing anguish fills my last embrace and kiss. 
And yet I have no lover, and once more I seek for love and tell my tale in vain. I cannot bear my heart, my poison stupefies me, and my head grows heavy. Am I not beautiful in my despair? Move closer. I love you. Once I was bathing in a forest marsh. I like to be clean, for it is a sign of noble birth, and so I bathe often. And bathing there, and dancing in the water, I saw my own reflection and fell in love with it. Ah, how I love the beautiful and wise! And suddenly, upon my forehead, amongst the ornaments of nature, I saw a strange new sign. Perhaps it is this sign that causes my head to be so heavy, my gaze so sharp and steel-like, my mouth so sweet with poison. Here, here it is, this cross upon my forehead, here, you see? Move closer. Is it not strange? I did not understand it then, I was even fond of it. Let there be still another ornament, I said. And on that day, that awful day when first the cross appeared, my kiss, my kiss, became the first and last kiss I could give, the kiss of death. Alone in the multitude. Alone in the multitude. Ah! You like precious stones, but think, O oh my beloved, think how much more precious is a small drop of my poison. It is so small, have you ever seen it? Never, never. But you will know it. Think, my beloved, what horrid pains, insults unbearable, and impotent, self-gnawing wrath, I had to suffer to bear that little drop. I am a queen. I am a queen. In this one drop, born by me, I hold the death of all the living, and boundless is my kingdom, as boundless as grief and death. I am a queen. Relentless is my gaze. My dance is terrible. How beautiful I am! Alone in the multitude. Alone in the multitude. Do not fall. I have not finished. Move closer. Look into my eyes. Ah! And then it was I crawled into the foolish forest, my present kingdom. I was gentle as a queen, and graciously, so like a queen, I bowed to everybody. And they, they ran away. I bowed to them, bowed graciously, bowed like a queen, and they, the fools, ran fast away. Why did they run away? What do you think? Look into my eyes. Do you see there a twinkle, a glitter? Do you? The rays of my bright crown now blind you, now they turn you to stone, you are lost. Ah, now I shall dance my last, last dance. Do not fall. Now I shall curl my body in rings, my scales will glitter dully, as I embrace myself so tenderly and in this tenderly cold embrace multiply my body of steel. Here am I. Accept this bridal kiss of mine, this only kiss. Ah, there is in it the death-like anguish of all lives oppressed. Alone in the multitude. Alone in the multitude. Bend over me. I love you. Die. Dies ire. Chant the first. Chapter 1. This free song of the stern days of justice and retribution I have composed myself, as well as I could, Geronimo Piscania, a Sicilian bandit, murderer, highwayman, criminal. Having composed it to the best of my ability, I meant to sing it loudly, as good songs should be sung, but my jailer would not allow it. My jailer's ear is overgrown with hair. It has a straight and a narrow channel, fit for words that are untruthful, sly, words that can crawl upon their bellies like reptiles. But my words walk erect, they have deep chests, broad backs, ah, how painfully they tore at the tender ear of the jailer which was overgrown with hair. If the ear is shut, seek another entrance, Geronimo, I said to myself amicably, and I pondered, and I sought, and finally I succeeded and found it, for Geronimo is no fool, let me tell you. And this is what I found, I found a stone. And this is what I did, I chiseled my song into the stone, and with the blows of my wrath I set aflame its icy heart. And when the stone came to life and glanced at me with the fiery eyes of wrath, I cautiously took it away and placed it at the very edge of the prison wall. Can you not see what I have in mind? 
I am wise, I figure that a friendly quake will soon again set the earth aquiver, and once again it will destroy your city. And the walls will crumble, and my stone will drop and shatter the jailer's head. And having shattered it, it will leave upon his soft waxy blood-gray brain the impress of my song of freedom, like the seal of a king. Like a new commandment of wrath, and thus will the jailer go down to his grave. I say, jailer, shut not your ear, for I shall enter through your skull. Chapter 2 If I am then alive, I shall laugh with joy. And if I chance to be dead, my bones shall dance in their insecure grave. That will be a merry tarantella. Can you say upon your oath that such things can never be? The same quake might cast me back upon the face of the earth, my rotting coffin, my decayed flesh, my whole body, dead and buried for keeps, tightly clamped down. For such things have happened upon great days, the earth opening up about the cemeteries, the still coffins crawling out into the light. Those still coffins, uninvited guests at the banquet. Chapter 3 These be the names of the comrades with whom I made friends in those fleeting hours, Pascal, a professor, Giuseppe, Pincio, Alba. They were shot by firing squads. There was also another one, young, obliging, and so handsome. It was a pity to look at him. I esteemed him as a son, he reverenced me as a father, but I did not know his name. I had not chance to ask him, or perhaps I have forgotten it. He, too, was shot by the soldiers. There may have been one or two more, also friends, I do not remember them. When the youngster was being put to death, I did not run far away, I hid right here, back of the wall, now crumbled, near the trampled cactus. I saw and heard everything. And when I started to leave, the trampled cactus pierced me with its thorn. Was it not planted near the wall to keep away the thieves? How faithful are the servants of the rich! Chapter 4 The firing squad put them to death. Remember the names which I have mentioned, and with regard to those whom I have not mentioned by name, remember merely that they were put to death. But don't go and make a sign of the cross upon your brow, or worse than that, don't go and order a requiem mass, they did not like such things. Honor the dead with the silence of truth, and if you must lie, lie in some merrier fashion, but never by saying mass, they did not like that. Chapter 5 that first quake that destroyed the prison and the city had a voice of rare power and of queer, superhuman dignity, it roared from below, from beneath the ground. It was vast and hoarse and menacing. And everything shook and crumbled. And ere I grasped what was going on, I knew that all was over, that it was perhaps the end of the earth. But I was not particularly frightened, why should I be especially frightened even if it were the end of the world? Long did he roar that deaf subterranean trumpeter. And all at once politely opened the door. Chapter 6 I had sat a long time in prison, without hope. I had tried to flee and failed. Nor could you have managed to escape, for that accursed prison was very well built. And I had become accustomed to the iron of the bars and to the stone of the walls, and they seemed to me eternal, and he who had built them the strongest in the world and it was no use to think whether he was just or not, so strong and eternal he was. Even in my dreams I saw no freedom, I did not believe, expect or feel it. And I feared to call it. It is perilous to call freedom, while you keep still, you may live, but call freedom once, ever so softly, you must either gain it or die. This is true, so said Pascal, the professor. And thus without hope I sat in prison, and suddenly opened the door. Politely and of its own accord. At any rate it was no human hand that opened it. Chapter 7 The streets were in ruins, in a terrible chaos. All the material of which people build was resolved to its elements and lay as it had been in the beginning. The houses were crumbling, bursting, reeling like drunken, squatting down upon the ground, on their own crushed legs. Others were sulkily casting themselves down upon the ground, with their heads upon the pavement, crash. And opened were the little boxes in which human beings live, pretty little boxes, all plastered with paper. 
the pictures still hung on the walls, but the people were no more. They had been thrown out, they were lying beneath masses of stone. And the earth was twitching convulsively, for, you must know that the subterranean trumpeter had started to roar again, that deaf devil who can never have enough noise because he is so deaf. Sweet, painstaking, gigantic devil. But I was free and I did not understand it yet. I hesitated to walk away from that accursed prison. I was standing there, blinking stupidly at the ruins. And the comrades had also assembled, none attempting to leave, crowding distractedly, like the children about the figure of a dissipated, drunken mother that had fallen to the ground. A fine mother, indeed. Suddenly Pascal, the professor, said. Look. One of the walls which we had deemed eternal had burst in two, and the window, with its iron bars, had split in two as well. The iron was twisted and torn like a rotten rag, think of it, the iron. In my hands it had not even rattled, it had pretended to be eternal, the most powerful thing on earth, and now it was not worth to be spat upon, the iron, think of it. Then I, and the rest of us, understood that we were free. Chapter 8 Free Chapter 9 It is harder for you to bend a grass blade than for him to bend three iron rails one atop the other. Three or a hundred, it is all the same to him. It is more difficult for you to raise a cup of water to your lips than for him to raise a sea of water, to shake it up, to lift the dregs thereof and to cast them out upon the shore. To bring the cold to boiling. It is harder for you to gnaw through a piece of sugar than for him to gnaw through a mountain. It is more difficult for you to tear a thin and rotting thread than for him to break three wire ropes twisted into one braid. You will perspire and flush with exertion before you manage to stir up an anthill with your stick, and he with one push destroys your city. He has picked up an iron steamship as you with your hand pick up a tiny pebble, and has cast it ashore, have you ever seen the like of such strength? Chapter 10 All that had been open he has shut, the door of your house has grown into its walls, and together they have choked you, your door, your walls, your ceiling. And he likewise has opened the doors of the prison which you had shut so carefully. You, rich man, whom I hate. Chapter 11 If I gather from all over the world all the good words which people use, all the tender sayings, all the ringing songs and fling them all into the joyous air. If I gather all the smiles of children, the laughter of women whom none has yet wronged, the caresses of grey-haired mothers. The faithful handshakes of a friend, and weave of them all an incorruptible wreath for some one beautiful head. If I pass over the face of the earth and garner all the flowers that grow upon it, in the forests and in the fields, in the meadows and in the gardens of the rich, in the depths of the waters. Upon the azure bottom of the ocean. If I gather all the precious sparkling stones, bringing them forth out of hidden crevices, out of the gloomy depths of mines. Tearing them from the crowns of kings and from the ears of the rich, and pile them all, the stones and the flowers, into one radiant mountain. If I gather all the fires that burn in the universe, all the lights, all the rays, all the flashes, flares and silent glows, and in the glare of one mighty conflagration illumine the quaking worlds. Even then I shall be unable to name thee, to crown thee, to laud thee, O Freedom. Chapter 12 Freedom Chapter 13 over my head was the sky, and the sky is always free, always open to the winds and to the movement of the clouds, under my feet was the road, and the road is always free. It was made to walk on, it was made for the feet to move over its surface, going back and forth, leaving one spot and finding another. The road is the sweetheart of him who is free. You have to kiss it on meeting, to weep over it on parting. And when my feet began to move upon the road, I thought that a miracle had occurred. I looked, and Pascal's feet were also moving, the professor. I looked, and the youngster was also moving with youthful feet, hurrying, stumbling, and suddenly he ran. Whither? But Pascal sternly reproved me. Don't throw questions at him, you'll break his limbs. For you and I are old, Geronimo. And we wept. 
and suddenly the deaf trumpeter roared out anew. Chant the Second Chapter 1 A long time we walked about the city and saw much that was striking, strange and sinister. Chapter 2 Neither can you shut in the fire, I was saying this, I, Geronimo Piscania. If you would be at peace, put it out altogether, but do not lock it up in stone, in iron or in glass. It will escape, and your strongly built house will come to a bad end. When your mighty house is fallen, and your life is extinct, it alone will burn, retaining the heat and the blazing ruddiness and all the force of the flame. It may lie a while on the ground, it may pretend even to be dead, then it will lift its head upon a slender neck and look about, to the right and to the left, forward and backward. And it will leap. And it will hide again, and will look again, it will straighten up, throw back its head, and suddenly it will grow terribly stout. And it will no longer have one head upon one slender neck, it will have thousands. And it will no longer crawl slowly, it will run, it will make gigantic bounds. It had been silent, now it is singing, whistling, yelling, giving orders to stone and to iron, driving all from its path. And suddenly it will begin to circle. Chapter 3 We saw more dead people than living, and the dead were calm, they did not know what had happened to them, and they were calm. But what about the living? Just think what a ridiculous thing was told us by a madman for whom, too, in those days of stern equality the door had opened. Do you think he was amazed? He looked on attentively and benignly, and the grey stubble on his yellow face bristled with proud joy, as though he had done it all himself. I do not like madmen, and was going to walk past him, but Pascal, the professor, stopped me, and respectfully asked the proud madman. What makes you so pleased, senor? Pascal was far from being short of stature, but the madman searched for him a long time with his eyes, like for a grain of sand that has suddenly spoken out aloud from amidst of a sand heap. And finally he discovered him. And hardly parting his lips, so proud was he, he repeated the question. What makes me so pleased? And he waved his hand majestically and said. This is perfect order. We have so long craved for order. He called that order. I laughed out aloud but just at that moment a corpulent and altogether insane monk came up, and proved even more ridiculous. Chapter 4 For a long time they played their comedy among the ruins, the lunatic and the monk, while we sat on a heap of stones, laughing and encouraging them, shouting, Bravo! Fraud! I have been deceived! cried the fat monk. He was so fat, I don't think you've ever seen anyone as fat. It was repulsive to watch him, the yellow fat of his cheeks and of his belly quivered and shook so with wrath and fear. There's perfect order for you! cried the lunatic approvingly, hardly deigning to part his lips. Fraud! yelled the monk. And suddenly he commenced to curse God. The monk! Think of it! Chapter 5 Chapter 6 He assured us all that God had deceived him and he wept. He swore like a crooked gambler that this was poor recompense for his prayers and his faith. He stamped his feet and he cursed like a mule driver who comes out of a gin mill and suddenly discovers that his mules had scattered to the four winds. And suddenly Pascal, the professor, lost his temper. He demanded that I give him my knife and said to the monk who had sat down for a rest after his outburst of curses. Listen, in a minute I will slit your belly and if I find there but one drop of wine or one atom of a pullet. And if you don't, angrily retorted the monk. Then we shall count you among the saints. Hold his legs, Geronimo. The monk was frightened and departed mumbling. And I thought you were Christians. Blasphemy! Blasphemy! But the lunatic gazed after him benignly and spoke approvingly. This is what I call perfect order. We have been so long waiting for perfect order. Chapter 7 And we walked a long time about the city and saw many odd things. But the day was short, and the night fell upon earth earlier than ever before. And when the firing squad was killing Pascal, 
the soldiers had lighted their torches. Chapter 8 When Pascal was put against the wall, against the portion of it which had remained uninjured, and the soldiers raised their rifles, the officer said to him. You will die in a moment. Tell me why are you not afraid? That which has happened is terrible, and we are all pale with horror, but you are not. Why is that? Pascal was silent. He waited for the officer to ask him more questions so that he might reply to all of them in one. And whence comes your boldness, to stoop and to take that which belongs to others at a time when people in terror forget even themselves and their children? And are you not sorry for those women and children who have perished? We have seen cats that have lost their mind through terror, and you are a human being. I will have you shot instantly. This was well spoken, but our Pascal could speak every bit as well. He has been shot dead. He is dead, but some day when all the dead arise you will hear his speech, and you will shed tears, if by that time all the tears are not exhausted, O oh man. He said. I take that which is another's because I have nothing that is my own. I took the raiment off a dead man in order to clothe my living flesh, but you have seen me do it, and so you have stripped me, and now I stand naked in front of your rifles. Soldiers, fire! But the officer did not suffer them to fire and asked him to speak further. Chapter 9 Naked I stand in front of your rifles and fear nothing, not even your rifles. But you are pale with fear, and you fear everything, even your own rifles, even my naked body. When the quake was heard, it destroyed and killed your city, your fortunes, your children and wives, but it opened a prison for me. What then shall I fear? I have nothing of my own upon the face of the earth. I am, naked. Chapter 10 And if the whole earth crumbled into ruin, and the very beasts howled with horror, and the fish found a voice to express their grief, and the birds fell to the ground with dread. Even then I would not fear. For all others it means the ruin of the earth, for me it opens the doors of a prison. What then shall I fear? I am naked. Chapter 11 And if the universe crumbled, with heaven and hell, and horror were enthroned over the infinity of living creatures, even then I would know no fear. For all it would be the end of the universe, for me the opening of a prison. What then shall I fear? I am naked. Chapter 12 And now, when with one salvo of your rifles you will destroy for me the earth and the universe, even now I know no fear. For all of you it will be the destruction and the fall of a human body, but for me a prison will open its gates. Soldiers, fire! I am naked. Chapter 13 The Torches Blazed It was the shortest day which I had ever seen. Night fell upon the earth more quickly than ever before. It is your turn now, ordered the officer, when Pascal, the professor, had fallen. True, I had not been caught in any wrongdoing, and there was nothing to kill me for. But can you argue with them? And so I stood up. And I lamented the night. Do you understand me? The night. Here the torches and the fires were ruining it, and there, behind the torches and the fire, it stood out strong, and firm, and dark as the nights of my youth. I love the night, for then I do not see myself and can think what I will. The day reaches my garments, but can go no further. It stops at the darkness of my body and turns blind. But the night reaches my very heart. That is why it is so easy to love at night, anybody will tell you that. Ah, to spend only one hour in the shade of the faithful, of the black and beautiful night, only one hour. But can you argue with them? So I stood up. But it is well to love also in the daytime, when the sun is shining. Love itself is like the night, it reaches the heart, don't you see? And in love you fail to see your own self, even as in the midst of night. And if you only look into its eyes, straight into its black eyes, and look without tearing your gaze away. Suddenly for some reason the officer shouted angrily at the soldier and snapped at me. Get out of here. Chapter 14 Another day passed. And on that day the soldiers shot that youngster who had called me father. 
Chapter 15 Night sank upon the earth and I departed from that city of the dead. Chapter 16 Dies Ere, the day of wrath, the day of vengeance and of stern retribution, the day of horror and of death. Chapter 17 That procession which I had watched from behind the wall was a strange and a terrible sight. They were bearing the statues of their saints, but did not know whether to raise them still higher over their heads or to cast them upon the ground, trampling the fragments underfoot. Some were still cursing, while others were already saying their prayers, but they walked on together, the children of the same father and the same mother, or horror and of death. They leaped over the crevices and disappeared in abysses. And the saints reeled like drunkards. Dies Irae. Some were singing, others were weeping, and still others were laughing. Some howled like lunatics. And they were waving their hands, and all were in a hurry. The fat-bellied monks were running. From whom were they running away? Not a soul was seen behind them. Meekly lolled the ruins in the warm glow of the sun, and the fire was disappearing into the ground, smoking wearily. Chapter 18 From whom were they fleeing? There was not a soul behind them. Chapter 19 You barely touched a tree, and a ripe orange fell at your feet. First one, then another, a third. The crop bids fair to be fine. A good orange is like a little sun, and when there is an abundance of them, you feel like smiling, as though the sun shone brightly. And the leaves are so dark, just like the night back of the sun. No, they are green, dark green. Why are you telling untruths, Geronimo? But how cautious is that deaf devil, that subterranean trumpeter, who is never content because of his deafness, he has destroyed a city, but has left an orange suspended on a branch. To wait for Geronimo. You barely touch the tree, and a ripe orange drops at your feet. First one, then another, then a third. They will be taken overseas to strange lands. And in those lands, where rain the cold and the fogs, people will look at them and say, Yes, there is a sun for you. Chapter 20 Pascal, the professor, we called him I.L. Professor, because he was so wise, he could write verses, and he discoursed so nobly on all sorts of subjects. He is dead. Chapter 21 Why am I terrified? Why do I walk faster and faster? I had been afraid there. Chapter 22 I never knew that my feet so loved to walk. They love every step which they make. They part so sadly with every step, they seem to want to turn back. And so greedy are they that the longest road seems short to them, that the widest road seems narrow. They regret, fancy, that they cannot at once walk backward and forward, to the right and to the left. Let them have their will and they will cover the earth with their traces, not leaving a patch, and still they would seek more. And another thing I did not know, I did not know about my eyes that they can breathe. Afar off I see the ocean. Chapter 23 What else can I tell you? I was seized by the gendarmes. Chapter 24 Once more thou hast locked the doors of my prison, O oh man. When didst thou have time to build it? Still in ruins lies thy house, the bones of thy children are not yet bare in the grave, but thou art already at work, tapping with thy hammer, patching together with cement the obedient stone. Rearing before thy face the obedient iron. How fast dost thou build thy prisons, O man! Still in ruins are thy churches, but thy prison is all finished. Still shaking with terror are thy hands, but already they grasp the key, and rattle the lock, and slip the bolt. Thou art a musician, to the jingle of gold thou requirest the accompanying rattle of fetters, let that be the base. Grim death is still in thy blanched nostrils, and already thou art sniffing at something, turning thy nose this way and that way. How fast buildest thou thy prisons, O man! Chapter 25 The iron does not even rattle, so strong it is and it is cold to the touch like someone's icy heart. Silent is also the stone of the walls, so proud it is, so everlasting and mighty. 
At the appointed time comes the jailer and flings at me my food like at a savage beast. And I show my teeth, why should I not show my teeth? I am starved and naked. And the clock is striking. Art thou content, O man, my master? Chapter 26 But I do not believe in thy prison, O man, my master. I do not believe in thy iron. I do not believe in thy stone, in thy power, O man, my master. That which I have once seen destroyed, shall never be knit together again. Thus would have spoken even Pascal, the professor. Chapter 27 Set thy clock a going, it marks well the time until it stops. Rattle thy keys, for even thy paradise thou hast shut with lock and key. Rattle thy keys and shut the door, they shut well while there is a door. And walk around cautiously. And when all is still, thou wilt say, It is well now, it is quite still now. And thou wilt lie down to sleep. It is quite still now, thou wilt say, but I hear how he is gnawing at the iron with his teeth. But thou wilt say that the iron is too strong for him, and thou wilt lie down to sleep. And when thou hast fallen asleep, holding tight thy keys in thy happy hands, suddenly the subterranean trumpeter will roar out loudly, awaking thee with his thunder. Raising thee to thy feet with the force of terror, holding thee erect with a mighty arm, so that dying thou shalt see death. Wide as the day will open thy eyes, terror will tear them wide open. Ears will come to thy heart, so that dying thou shalt hear death. And thy clock will stop. Chapter 28 Freedom The Ocean Chapter 1 A misty February twilight is descending over the ocean. The newly fallen snow has melted and the warm air is heavy and damp. The northwestern wind from the sea is driving it silently toward the mainland, bringing in its wake a sharply fragrant mixture of brine, of boundless space, of undisturbed, free and mysterious distances. In the sky, where the sun is setting, a noiseless destruction of an unknown city, of an unknown land, is taking place, structures, magnificent palaces with towers, are crumbling. Mountains are silently splitting asunder and, bending slowly, are tumbling down. But no cry, no moan, no crash of the fall reaches the earth, the monstrous play of shadows is noiseless. And the great surface of the ocean, as though ready for something, as though waiting for something, reflecting it faintly, listens to it in silence. Silence reigns also in the fishermen's settlement. The fishermen have gone fishing. The children are sleeping and only the restless women, gathered in front of the houses, are talking softly, lingering before going to sleep, beyond which there is always the unknown. The light of the sea and the sky behind the houses, and the houses and their bark roofs are black and sharp. And there is no perspective, the houses that are far and those that are near seem to stand side by side as if attached to one another, the roofs and the walls embracing one another. Pressing close to one another, seized with the same uneasiness before the eternal unknown. Right here there is also a little church, its side wall formed crudely of rough granite, with a deep window which seems to be concealing itself. A cautious sound of women's voices is heard, softened by uneasiness and by the approaching night. We can sleep peacefully tonight. The sea is calm and the rollers are breaking like the clock in the steeple of old Dan. They will come back with the morning tide. My husband told me that they will come back with the morning tide. Perhaps they will come back with the evening tide. It is better for us to think they will come back in the evening, so that our waiting will not be in vain. But I must build a fire in the stove. When the men are away from home, one does not feel like starting a fire. I never build a fire, even when I am awake, it seems to me that fire brings a storm. It is better to be quiet and silent. And listen to the wind? No, that is terrible. I love the fire. I should like to sleep near the fire, but my husband does not allow it. Why doesn't old Dan come here? It is time to strike the hour. Old Dan will play in the church tonight, he cannot bear such silence as this. When the sea is roaring, old Dan hides himself and is silent, 
he is afraid of the sea. But, as soon as the waves calm down, Dan crawls out quietly and sits down to play his organ. The women laugh softly. He reproaches the sea. He is complaining to God against it. He knows how to complain well. One feels like crying when he tells God about those who have perished at sea. Marriott, have you seen Dan today? Why are you silent, Marriott? Marriott is the adopted daughter of the abbot, in whose house old Dan, the organist, lives. Absorbed in thought, she does not hear the question. Marriott, do you hear? Anna is asking you whether you have seen Dan today. Yes, I think I have. I don't remember. He is in his room. He does not like to leave his room when father goes fishing. Dan is fond of the city priests. He cannot get used to the idea of a priest who goes fishing, like an ordinary fisherman, and who goes to sea with our husbands. He is simply afraid of the sea. You may say what you like, but I believe we have the very best priest in the world. That's true. I fear him, but I love him as a father. May God forgive me, but I would have been proud and always happy, if I were his adopted daughter. Do you hear, Marriott? The women laugh softly and tenderly. Do you hear, Marriott? I do. But aren't you tired of always laughing at the same thing? Yes, I am his daughter, is it so funny that you will laugh all your life at it? The women commence to justify themselves confusedly. But he laughs at it himself. The abbot is fond of jesting. He says so comically, my adopted daughter, and then he strikes himself with his fist and shouts, she's my real daughter, not my adopted daughter. She's my real daughter. I have never known my mother, but this laughter would have been unpleasant to her. I feel it, says Marriott. The women grow silent. The breakers strike against the shore dully with the regularity of a great pendulum. The unknown city, wrapped with fire and smoke, is still being destroyed in the sky. Yet it does not fall down completely, and the sea is waiting. Marriott lifts her lowered head. What were you going to say, Marriott? Didn't he pass here? asks Marriott in a low voice. Another woman answers timidly. Hush! Why do you speak of him? I fear him. No, he did not pass this way. He did. I saw from the window that he passed by. You are mistaken. It was someone else. Who else could that be? Is it possible to make a mistake, if you have once seen him walk? No one walks as he does. Naval officers, Englishmen, walk like that. No. Haven't I seen naval officers in the city? They walk firmly, but openly, even a girl could trust them. Oh, look out! Frightened and cautious laughter. No, don't laugh. He walks without looking at the ground, he puts his feet down as if the ground itself must take them cautiously and place them. But if there's a stone on the road? We have many stones here. He does not bend down, nor does he hide his head when a strong wind blows. Of course not. Of course not. He does not hide his head. Is it true that he is handsome? Who has seen him at close range? I, says Marriott. No, no, don't speak of him, I shall not be able to sleep all night. Since they settled on that hill, in that accursed castle, I know no rest. I am dying of fear. You are also afraid. Confess it. Well, not all of us are afraid. What have they come here for? There are two of them. What is there for them to do here in our poor land, where we have nothing but stones and the sea? They drink gin. The sailor comes every morning for gin. They are simply drunkards who don't want anybody to disturb their drinking. When the sailor passes along the street he leaves behind him an odor as of an open bottle of rum. But is that their business, drinking gin? I fear them. Where is the ship that brought them here? They came from the sea. I saw the ship, says Marriott. The women begin to question her in amazement. You? 
Why, then, didn't you say anything about it? Tell us what you know. Marriott maintains silence. Suddenly one of the women exclaims. Ah, look! They have lit a lamp. There is a light in the castle. On the left, about half a mile away from the village, a faint light flares up, a red little coal in the dark blue of the twilight and the distance. There upon a high rock, overhanging the sea, stands an ancient castle, a grim heritage of grey and mysterious antiquity. Long destroyed, long ruined, it blends with the rocks, continuing and delusively ending them by the broken, dented line of its batteries, its shattered roofs, its half-crumbled towers. Now the rocks and the castle are covered with a smoky shroud of twilight. They seem airy, devoid of any weight, and almost as fantastic as those monstrous heaps of structures which are piled up and which are falling so noiselessly in the sky. But while the others are falling this one stands, and a live light reddens against the deep blue, and it is just as strange a sight as if a human hand were to kindle a light in the clouds. Turning their heads in that direction, the women look on with frightened eyes. Do you see, says one of them. It is even worse than a light on a cemetery. Who needs a light among the tombstones? It is getting cold toward night and the sailor must have thrown some branches into the fireplace, that's all. At least, I think so, says Marriott. And I think that the abbot should have gone there with holy water long ago. Or with the gendarmes. If that isn't the devil himself, it is surely one of his assistants. It is impossible to live peacefully with such neighbors close by. I am afraid for the children. And for your soul? Two elderly women rise silently and go away. Then a third, an old woman, also rises. We must ask the abbot whether it isn't a sin to look at such a light. She goes off. The smoke in the sky is ever increasing and the fire is subsiding, and the unknown city is already near its dark end. The sea odor is growing ever sharper and stronger. Night is coming from the shore. Their heads turned, the women watch the departing old woman. Then they turn again toward the light. Marriott, as though defending someone, says softly. There can't be anything bad in light. For there is light in the candles on God's altar. But there is also fire for Satan in hell, says another old woman, heavily and angrily, and then goes off. Now four remain, all young girls. I am afraid, says one, pressing close to her companion. The noiseless and cold conflagration in the sky is ended, the city is destroyed, the unknown land is in ruins. There are no longer any walls or falling towers, a heap of pale blue gigantic shapes have fallen silently into the abyss of the ocean and the night. A young little star glances at the earth with frightened eyes. It feels like coming out of the clouds near the castle and because of its inmost neighborship the heavy castle grows darker, and the light in its window seems redder and darker. Good night, Marriott, says the girl who sat alone, and then she goes off. Let us also go, it is getting cold, say the other two, rising. Good night, Marriott. Good night. Why are you alone, Marriott? Why are you alone, Marriott, in the daytime and at night? on weekdays and on merry holidays. Do you love to think of your betrothed? Yes, I do. I love to think of Philip. The girl laughs. But you don't want to see him. When he goes out to sea, you look at the sea for hours, when he comes back, you are not there. Where are you hiding yourself? I love to think of Philip. Like a blind man he gropes among the houses, forever calling, Marriott. Marriott. Have you not seen Marriott? They go off laughing and repeating. Good night, Marriott. Have you not seen Marriott? Marriott. The girl is left alone. She looks at the light in the castle. She hears soft, irresolute footsteps. Old Dan, of small stature, slim, a coughing old man with a clean shaven face, comes out from behind the church. Because of his irresoluteness, or because of the weakness of his eyes, he steps uncertainly, touching the ground cautiously and with a certain degree of fear. Oh ho! 
Oh ho! Is that you, Dan? The sea is calm, Dan. Are you going to play tonight? Oh ho! I shall ring the bell seven times. Seven times I shall ring it and send to God seven of his holy hours. He takes the rope of the bell and strikes the hour, seven ringing and slow strokes. The wind plays with them, it drops them to the ground, but before they touch it, it catches them tenderly. Sways them softly and with a light accompaniment of whistling carries them off to the dark coast. Oh, no, mutters Dan, bad hours, they fall to the ground. They are not his holy hours and he will send them back. Oh, a storm is coming. O oh Lord, have mercy on those who are perishing at sea. He mutters and coughs. Dan, I have seen the ship again today. Do you hear, Dan? Many ships are going out to sea. But this one had black sails. It was again going toward the sun. Many ships are going out to sea. Listen, Marriott, there was once a wise king, oh, how wise he was, and he commanded that the sea be lashed with chains. Oh ho! I know, Dan. You told me about it. Oh ho, with chains. But it did not occur to him to christen the sea. Why did it not occur to him to do that, Marriott? Ah, why did he not think of it? We have no such kings now. What would have happened? Dan. Oh ho! He whispers softly. All the rivers and the streams have already been christened, and the cross of the Lord has touched even many stagnant swamps. Only the sea remained, that nasty, salty, deep pool. Why do you scold it? It does not like to be scolded, Marriott reproaches him. Oh ho! Let the sea not like it, I am not afraid of it. The sea thinks it is also an organ and music for God. It is a nasty, hissing, furious pool. A salty spit of Satan. Fie! 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 He goes to the doors at the entrance of the church muttering angrily, threatening, as though celebrating some victory. Oh ho! Oh ho! Dan! Go home! Dan! Why don't you light candles when you play? Dan, I don't love my betrothed. Do you hear, Dan? Dan turns his head unwillingly. I have heard it long ago, Marriott. Tell it to your father. Where is my mother, Dan? Oh ho! You are mad again, Marriott? You are gazing too much at the sea, yes. I am going to tell, I am going to tell your father, yes. He enters the church. Soon the sounds of the organ are heard. Faint in the first, long-drawn, deeply pensive chords, they rapidly gain strength. And with a passionate sadness, their human melodies now wrestle with the dull and gloomy plaintiveness of the tireless surf. Like seagulls in a storm, the sounds soar amidst the high waves, unable to rise higher on their overburdened wings. The stern ocean holds them captive by its wild and eternal charms. But when they have risen, the lowered ocean roars more dully, now they rise still higher, and the heavy, almost voiceless pile of water is shaking helplessly. Varied voices resound through the expanse of the resplendent distances. Day has one sorrow, night has another sorrow, and the proud, ever rebellious, black ocean suddenly seems to become an eternal slave. Her cheek pressed against the cold stone of the wall, Marriott is listening, all alone. She is growing reconciled to something, she is grieving ever more quietly. Suddenly, firm footsteps are heard on the road, the cobblestones are creaking under the vigorous steps, and a man appears from behind the church. He walks slowly and sternly, like those who do not roam in vain, and who know the earth from end to end. He carries his hat in his hands, he is thinking of something, looking ahead. On his broad shoulders is set a round, strong head, with short hair. His dark profile is stern and commandingly haughty, and, although the man is dressed in a partly military uniform, he does not subject his body to the discipline of his clothes. But masters it as a free man. The folds of his clothes fall submissively. Marriott greets him. Good evening. 
He walks on quite a distance, then stops and turns his head slowly. He waits silently, as though regretting to part with his silence. Did you say, good evening, to me? he asks at last. Yes, to you. Good evening. He looks at her silently. Well, good evening. This is the first time I have been greeted in this land, and I was surprised when I heard your voice. Come nearer to me. Why don't you sleep when all are sleeping? Who are you? I am the daughter of the abbot of this place. He laughs. Have priests children? Or are there special priests in your land? Yes, the priests are different here. Now, I recall, Kor told me something about the priest of this place. Who is Kor? My sailor. The one who buys gin in your settlement. He suddenly laughs again and continues. Yes, he told me something. Was it your father who cursed the Pope and declared his own church independent? Yes. And he makes his own prayers? And goes to sea with the fishermen? And punishes with his own hands those who disobey him? Yes. I am his daughter. My name is Marriott. And what is your name? I have many names. Which one shall I tell you? The one by which you were christened. What makes you think that I was christened? Then tell me the name by which your mother called you. What makes you think that I had a mother? I do not know my mother. Marriott says softly. Neither do I know my mother. Both are silent. They look at each other kindly. Is that so? he says. You, too, don't know your mother. Well, then, call me Haggart. Haggart? Yes. Do you like the name? I have invented it myself, Haggart. It's a pity that you have been named already. I would have invented a fine name for you. Suddenly he frowned. Tell me, Marriott, why is your land so mournful? I walk along your paths and only the cobblestones creak under my feet. And on both sides are huge rocks. That is on the road to the castle, none of us ever go there. Is it true that these stones stop the passers-by with the question, where are you going? No, they are mute. Why is your land so mournful? It is almost a week since I've seen my shadow. It is impossible. I don't see my shadow. Our land is very cheerful and full of joy. It is still winter now, but soon spring will come, and sunshine will come back with it. You shall see it, Haggart. He speaks with contempt. And you are sitting and waiting calmly for its return? You must be a fine set of people. Ah, if I only had a ship! What would you have done? He looks at her morosely and shakes his head suspiciously. You are too inquisitive, little girl. Has anyone sent you over to me? No. What do you need a ship for? Haggard laughs good-naturedly and ironically. She asks what a man needs a ship for. You must be a fine set of people. You don't know what a man needs a ship for. And you speak seriously? If I had a ship I would have rushed toward the sun. And it would not matter how it sets its golden sails, would overtake it with my black sails. And I would force it to outline my shadow on the deck of my ship. And I would put my foot upon it this way. He stamps his foot firmly. Then Marriott asks, cautiously. Did you say with black sails? That's what I said. Why do you always ask questions? I have no ship, you know. Goodbye. He puts on his hat, but does not move. Marriott maintains silence. Then he says, very angrily. Perhaps you, too, like the music of your old Dan, that old fool? You know his name? Kor told me it. I don't like his music, no, no. Bring me a good, honest dog, or beast, and he will howl. You will say that he knows no music, he does, but he can't bear falsehood. Here is music. Listen. He takes Marriott by the hand and turns her roughly, her face toward the ocean. Do you hear? 
This is music. Your Dan has robbed the sea and the wind. No, he is worse than a thief, he is a deceiver. He should be hanged on a sail yard, your Dan. Goodbye. He goes, but after taking two steps he turns around. I said goodbye to you. Go home. Let this fool play alone. Well, go. Marriott is silent, motionless. Haggart laughs. Are you afraid perhaps that I have forgotten your name? I remember it. Your name is Marriott. Go, Marriott. She says softly. I have seen your ship. Haggard advances to her quickly and bends down. His face is terrible. It is not true. When? Last evening. It is not true. Which way was it going? Toward the sun. Last evening I was drunk and I slept. But this is not true. I have never seen it. You are testing me. Beware. Shall I tell you if I see it again? How can you tell me? I shall come up your hill. Haggard looks at her attentively. If you are only telling me the truth. What sort of people are there in your land, false or not? In the lands I know, all the people are false. Has anyone else seen that ship? I don't know. I was alone on the shore. Now I see that it was not your ship. You are not glad to hear of it. Haggard is silent, as though he has forgotten her presence. You have a pretty uniform. You are silent? I shall come up to you. Haggard is silent. His dark profile is stern and wildly gloomy. Every motion of his powerful body, every fold of his clothes, is full of the dull silence of the taciturnity of long hours, or days, or perhaps of a lifetime. Your sailor will not kill me. You are silent. I have a betrothed. His name is Philip, but I don't love him. You are now like that rock which lies on the road leading to the castle. Haggard turns around silently and starts. I also remember your name. Your name is Haggard. He goes away. Haggard, calls Marriott, but he has already disappeared behind the house. Only the creaking of the scattered cobblestones is heard, dying away in the misty air. Dan, who has taken a rest, is playing again, he is telling God about those who have perished at sea. The night is growing darker. Neither the rock nor the castle is visible now, only the light in the window is redder and brighter. The dull thuds of the tireless breakers are telling the story of different lives. Chapter 2 a strong wind is tossing the fragment of a sail which is hanging over the large, open window. The sail is too small to cover the entire window, and, through the gaping hole, the dark night is breathing in clement weather. There is no rain, but the warm wind, saturated with the sea, is heavy and damp. Here in the tower live Haggard and his sailor, Kor. Both are sleeping now a heavy, drunken sleep. On the table and in the corners of the room there are empty bottles, and the remains of food, the only taburet is overturned, lying on one side. Toward evening the sailor got up, lit a large illumination lamp, and was about to do more, but he was overcome by intoxication again and fell asleep upon his thin mattress of straw and seagrass. Tossed by the wind, the flame of the illumination lamp is quivering in yellow, restless spots over the uneven, mutilated walls, losing itself in the dark opening of the door. Which leads to the other rooms of the castle. Haggard lies on his back, and the same quivering yellow shades run noiselessly over his strong forehead, approach his closed eyes, his straight, sharply outlined nose, and, tossing about in confusion, rush back to the wall. The breathing of the sleeping man is deep and uneven, from time to time his heavy, strange hand lifts itself, makes several weak, unfinished movements, and falls down on his breast helplessly. Outside the window the breakers are roaring and raging, beating against the rocks, this is the second day a storm is raging in the ocean. The ancient tower is quivering from the violent blows of the waves. It responds to the storm with the rustling of the falling plaster, 
with the rattling of the little cobblestones as they are torn down. With the whisper and moans of the wind which has lost its way in the passages. It whispers and mutters like an old woman. The sailor begins to feel cold on the stone floor, on which the wind spreads itself like water. He tosses about, folds his legs under himself, draws his head into his shoulders, gropes for his imaginary clothes. But is unable to wake up, his intoxication produced by a two-day spree is heavy and severe. But now the wind whines more powerfully than before, something heaves a deep groan. Perhaps a part of a destroyed wall has sunk into the sea. The quivering yellow spots commence to toss about upon the crooked wall more desperately, and Kor awakes. He sits up on his mattress, looks around, but is unable to understand anything. The wind is hissing like a robber summoning other robbers, and filling the night with disquieting phantoms. It seems as if the sea were full of sinking vessels, of people who are drowning and desperately struggling with death. Voices are heard. Somewhere nearby people are shouting, scolding each other, laughing and singing, like madmen. Or talking sensibly and rapidly, it seems that soon one will see a strange human face distorted by horror or laughter, or fingers bent convulsively. But there is a strong smell of the sea, and that, together with the cold, brings Kor to his senses. Noni, he calls hoarsely, but Haggard does not hear him. After a moment's thought, he calls once more. Captain. Noni. Get up. But Haggard does not answer and the sailor mutters. Noni is drunk and he sleeps. Let him sleep. Oh, what a cold night it is. There isn't enough warmth in it even to warm your nose. I am cold. I feel cold and lonesome, Noni. I can't drink like that, although everybody knows I am a drunkard. But it is one thing to drink, and another to drown in gin, that's an entirely different matter. Noni, you are like a drowned man, simply like a corpse. I feel ashamed for your sake, Noni. I shall drink now and. He rises, and staggering, finds an unopened bottle and drinks. A fine wind. They call this a storm, do you hear, Noni? They call this a storm. What will they call a real storm? He drinks again. A fine wind. He goes over to the window and, pushing aside the corner of the sail, looks out. Not a single light on the sea, or in the village. They have hidden themselves and are sleeping, they are waiting for the storm to pass. Brr, how cold. I would have driven them all out to sea. It is mean to go to sea only when the weather is calm. That is cheating the sea. I am a pirate, that's true. My name is Kor, and I should have been hanged long ago on a yard, that's true, too, but I shall never allow myself such meanness as to cheat the sea. Why did you bring me to this hole, Noni? He picks up some brushwood, and throws it into the fireplace. I love you, Noni. I am now going to start a fire to warm your feet. I used to be your nurse, Noni. But you have lost your reason, that's true. I am a wise man, but I don't understand your conduct at all. Why did you drop your ship? You will be hanged, Noni, you will be hanged, and I will dangle by your side. You have lost your reason, that's true. He starts a fire, then prepares food and drink. What will you say when you wake up? Fire. And I will answer, here it is. Then you will say, something to drink. And I will answer, here it is. And then you will drink your fill again, and I will drink with you, and you will prate nonsense. How long is this going to last? We have lived this way two months now, or perhaps two years, or twenty years, I am drowning in gin, I don't understand your conduct at all, Noni. He drinks. Either I have lost my mind from this gin, or a ship is being wrecked nearby. How they are crying. He looks out of the window. No, no one is here. It is the wind. The wind feels weary, and it plays all by itself. It has seen many shipwrecks, and now it is inventing. The wind itself is crying, the wind itself is scolding and sobbing. 
and the wind itself is laughing, the rogue. But if you think that this rag with which I have covered the window is a sail, and that this ruin of a castle is a three-masted brig, you are a fool. We are not going anywhere. We are standing securely at our moorings, do you hear? He pushes the sleeping man cautiously. Get up, Noni. I feel lonesome. If we must drink, let's drink together, I feel lonesome. Noni. Haggard awakens, stretches himself and says, without opening his eyes. Fire. Here it is. Something to drink. Here it is. A fine wind, Noni. I looked out of the window, and the sea splashed into my eyes. It is high tide now and the water dust flies up to the tower. I feel lonesome, Noni. I want to speak to you. Don't be angry. It's cold. Soon the fire will burn better. I don't understand your actions. Don't be angry, Noni, but I don't understand your actions. I am afraid that you have lost your mind. Did you drink again? I did. Give me some. He drinks from the mouth of the bottle lying on the floor, his eyes wandering over the crooked mutilated walls, whose every projection and crack is now lighted by the bright flame in the fireplace. He is not quite sure yet whether he is awake, or whether it is all a dream. With each strong gust of wind the flame is hurled from the fireplace, and then the entire tower seems to dance, the last shadows melt and rush off into the open door. Don't drink it all at once, Noni. Not all at once, says the sailor and gently takes the bottle away from him. Haggard seats himself and clasps his head with both hands. I have a headache. What is that cry? Was there a shipwreck? No, Noni. It is the wind playing roguishly. Cor. Captain. Give me the bottle. He drinks a little more and sets the bottle on the table. Then he paces the room, straightening his shoulders and his chest, and looks out of the window. Cor looks over his shoulder and whispers. Not a single light. It is dark and deserted. Those who had to die have died already, and the cautious cowards are sitting on the solid earth. Haggard turns around and says, wiping his face. When I am intoxicated, I hear voices and singing. Does that happen to you, too, Cor? Who is that singing now? The wind is singing, Noni, only the wind. No, but who else? It seems to me a human being is singing, a woman is singing, and others are laughing and shouting something. Is that all nothing but the wind? Only the wind. Why does the wind deceive me? Says Haggard haughtily. It feels lonesome, Noni, just as I do, and it laughs at the human beings. Have you heard the wind lying like this and mocking in the open sea? There it tells the truth, but here, it frightens the people on shore and mocks them. The wind does not like cowards. You know it. Haggard says morosely. I heard their organist playing not long ago in church. He lies. They are all liars. No, exclaims Haggard angrily. Not all. There are some who tell the truth there, too. I shall cut your ears off if you will slander honest people. Do you hear? Yes. They are silent, they listen to the wild music of the sea. The wind has evidently grown mad. Having taken into its embrace a multitude of instruments with which human beings produce their music, harps, reed pipes, priceless violins, heavy drums and brass trumpets, it breaks them all. Together with a wave, against the sharp rocks. It dashes them and bursts into laughter, only thus does the wind understand music, each time in the death of an instrument, each time in the breaking of strings. In the snapping of the clanging brass. Thus does the mad musician understand music. Haggard heaves a deep sigh and with some amazement, like a man just awakened from sleep, looks around on all sides. Then he commands shortly. Give me my pipe. Here it is. Both commence to smoke. Don't be angry, Noni, says the sailor. 
you have become so angry that one can't come near you at all. May I chat with you? There are some who do tell the truth there, too, says Haggart sternly, emitting rings of smoke. How shall I say it you, Noni, answers the sailor cautiously but stubbornly. There are no truthful people there. It has been so ever since the deluge. At that time all the honest people went out to sea, and only the cowards and liars remained upon the solid earth. Haggard is silent for a minute, then he takes the pipe from his mouth and laughs gaily. Have you invented it yourself? I think so, says Cor modestly. Clever. And it was worth teaching you sacred history for that. Were you taught by a priest? Yes. In prison. At that time I was as innocent as a dove. That's also from sacred scriptures, Noni. That's what they always say there. He was a fool. It was not necessary to teach you, but to hang you, says Haggard, adding morosely, don't talk nonsense, sailor. Hand me a bottle. They drink. Kor stamps his foot against the stone floor and asks. Do you like this motionless floor? I should have liked to have the deck of a ship dancing under my feet. Noni! exclaims the sailor enthusiastically. Noni! Now I hear real words. Let us go away from here. I cannot live like this. I am drowning in gin. I don't understand your actions at all, Noni. You have lost your mind. Reveal yourself to me, my boy. I was your nurse. I nursed you, Noni, when your father brought you on board ship. I remember how the city was burning then and we were putting out to sea, and I didn't know what to do with you, you whined like a little pig in the cook's room. I even wanted to throw you overboard, you annoyed me so much. Ah, Noni, it is all so touching that I can't bear to recall it. I must have a drink. Take a drink, too, my boy, but not all at once, not all at once. They drink. Haggard paces the room heavily and slowly, like a man who is imprisoned in a dungeon but does not want to escape. I feel sad, he says, without looking at Kor. Kor, as though understanding, shakes his head in assent. Sad? I understand. Since then? Ever since then. Ever since we drowned those people? They cried so loudly. I did not hear their cry. But this I heard, something snapped in my heart, Kor. Always sadness, everywhere sadness. Let me drink. He drinks. He who cried, am I perhaps afraid of him, Kor? That would be fine. Tears were trickling from his eyes, he wept like one who is unfortunate. Why did he do that? Perhaps he came from a land where the people had never heard of death, what do you think, sailor? I don't remember him, Noni. You speak so much about him, while I don't remember him. He was a fool, says Haggart. He spoilt his death for himself, and spoilt me my life. I curse him, Kor. May he be cursed. But that doesn't matter, Kor, no. Silence. They have good gin on this coast, says Kor. He'll pass easily, Noni. If you have cursed him there will be no delay, he'll slip into hell like an oyster. Haggard shakes his head. No, Kor, no. I am sad. Ah, sailor, why have I stopped here, where I hear the sea? I should go away, far away on land, where the people don't know the sea at all, where the people have never heard about the sea, a thousand miles away, five thousand miles away. There is no such land. There is, Kor. Let us drink and laugh, Kor. That organist lies. Sing something for me, Kor, you sing well. In your hoarse voice I hear the creaking of ropes. Your refrain is like a sail that is torn by the storm. Sing, sailor. Kor nods his head gloomily. No, I will not sing. Then I shall force you to pray as they prayed. You will not force me to pray, either. You are the captain, and you may kill me, and here is your revolver. It is loaded, Noni. 
and now I am going to speak the truth, Captain. Kor, the bosun, speaks to you in the name of the entire crew. Haggart says. Drop this performance, Kor. There is no crew here. You'd better drink something. He drinks. But the crew is waiting for you, you know it. Captain, is it your intention to return to the ship and assume command again? No. Captain, is it perhaps your intention to go to the people on the coast and live with them? No. I can't understand your actions, Noni. What do you intend to do, Captain? Haggard drinks silently. Not all at once, Noni, not at once. Captain, do you intend to stay in this hole and wait until the police dogs come from the city? Then they will hang us, and not upon a mast, but simply on one of their foolish trees. Yes. The wind is getting stronger. Do you hear, Kor? The wind is getting stronger. And the gold which we have buried here? He points below, with his finger. The gold? Take it and go with it wherever you like. The sailor says angrily. You are a bad man, Noni. You have only set foot on earth a little while ago, and you already have the thoughts of a traitor. That's what the earth is doing. Be silent, Kor. I am listening. Our sailors are singing. Do you hear? No, that's the wine rushing to my head. I'll be drunk soon. Give me another bottle. Perhaps you will go to the priest? He would absolve your sins. Silence. Roars Haggard, clutching at his revolver. Silence. The storm is increasing. Haggard paces the room in agitation, striking against the walls. He mutters something abruptly. Suddenly he seizes the sail and tears it down furiously, admitting the salty wind. The illumination lamp is extinguished and the flame in the fireplace tosses about wildly, like Haggard. Why did you lock out the wind? It's better now. Come here. You were the terror of the seas, says the sailor. Yes, I was the terror of the seas. You were the terror of the coasts. Your famous name resounded like the surf over all the coasts, wherever people live. They saw you in their dreams. When they thought of the ocean, they thought of you. When they heard the storm, they heard you, Noni. I burnt their cities. The deck of my ship is shaking under my feet, Kor. The deck is shaking under me. He laughs wildly, as if losing his senses. You sank their ships. You sent to the bottom the Englishman who was chasing you. He had ten guns more than I. And you burnt and drowned him. Do you remember, Noni, how the wind laughed then? The night was as black as this night, but you made day of it, Noni. We were rocked by a sea of fire. Haggard stands pale-faced, his eyes closed. Suddenly he shouts commandingly. Bosun. Yes, Kor jumps up. Whistle for everybody to go up on deck. Yes. The bosun's shrill whistle pierces sharply into the open body of the storm. Everything comes to life, and it looks as though they were upon the deck of a ship. The waves are crying with human voices. In semi-oblivion, Haggard is commanding passionately and angrily. To the shrouds, the studding sails. Be ready, forepart. Aim at the ropes. I don't want to sink them all at once. Starboard the helm, sail by the wind. Be ready now. Ah, fire. Ah, you are already burning. Board it now. Get the hooks ready. And Kor tosses about violently, performing the mad instructions. Yes, yes. Be braver, boys. Don't be afraid of tears. Eh, who is crying there? Don't dare cry when you are dying. I'll dry your mean eyes upon the fire. Fire. Fire everywhere. Kor, sailor. I am dying. They have poured molten tar into my chest. Oh, how it burns. Don't give way, Noni. Don't give way. 
recall your father. Strike them on the head, Noni. I can't, Kor. My strength is failing. Where is my power? Strike them on the head, Noni. Strike them on the head. Take a knife, Kor, and cut out my heart. There is no ship, Kor, there is nothing. Cut out my heart, comrade, throw out the traitor from my breast. I want to play some more, Noni. Strike them on the head. There is no ship, Kor, there is nothing, it is all a lie. I want to drink. He takes a bottle and laughs. Look, sailor, hear the wind and the storm and you and I are locked. It is all a deception, Kor. I want to play. Here my sorrow is locked. Look. In the green glass it seems like water, but it isn't water. Let us drink, Kor, there on the bottom I see my laughter and your song. There is no ship, there is nothing. Who is coming? He seizes his revolver. The fire in the fireplace is burning faintly, the shadows are tossing about, but two of these shadows are darker than the others and they are walking. Kor shouts. Halt. A man's voice, heavy and deep, answers. Hush. Put down your weapons. I am the abbot of this place. Fire, Noni, fire. They have come for you. I have come to help you. Put down your knife, fool, or I will break every bone in your body without a knife. Coward, are you frightened by a woman and a priest? Haggard puts down his revolver and says ironically. A woman and a priest. Is there anything still more terrible? Pardon my sailor, Mr. Abbot, he is drunk, and when he is drunk he is very reckless and he may kill you. Kor, don't turn your knife. He has come after you, Noni. I have come to warn you. The tower may fall. Go away from here, says the abbot. Why are you hiding yourself, girl? I remember your name, your name is Marriott, says Haggart. I am not hiding. I also remember your name, it is Haggart, replies Marriott. Was it you who brought him here? I. I have told you that they are all traitors, Noni, says Kor. Silence. It is very cold here. I will throw some wood into the fireplace. May I do it? asks Marriott. Do it, answers Haggart. The tower will fall down before long, says the abbot. Part of the wall has caved in already, it is all hollow underneath. Do you hear? He stamps his foot on the stone floor. Where will the tower fall? Into the sea, I suppose. The castle is splitting the rocks. Haggart laughs. Do you hear, Kor? This place is not as motionless as it seemed to you, while it cannot move, it can fall. How many people have you brought along with you, priest, and where have you hidden them? Only two of us came, my father and I, says Marriott. You are rude to a priest. I don't like that, says the abbot. You have come here uninvited. I don't like that either, says Haggart. Why did you lead me here, Marriott? Come, says the abbot. Haggart speaks ironically. And you leave us here to die. That is unchristian, Christian. Although I am a priest, I am a poor Christian, and the Lord knows it, says the abbot angrily. I have no desire to save such a rude scamp. Let us go, Marriott. Captain, asks Kor. Be silent, Kor, says Haggart. So that's the way you speak, Abbot, so you are not a liar? Come with me and you shall see. Where shall I go with you? To my house. To your house? Do you hear, Kor? To the priest. But do you know whom you are calling to your house? No, I don't know. But I see that you are young and strong. I see that although your face is gloomy, it is handsome, and I think that you could be as good a workman as others. A workman? Kor, do you hear what the priest says? Both laugh. The abbot says angrily. You are both drunk. Yes, a little. 
But if I were sober I would have laughed still more, answers Haggart. Don't laugh, Haggart, says Marriott. Haggart replies angrily. I don't like the tongues of false priests, Marriott, they are coated with truth on top, like a lure for flies. Take him away, and you, girl, go away, too. I have forgotten your name. He sits down and stares ahead sternly. His eyebrows move close together, and his hand is pressed down heavily by his lowered head, by his strong chin. He does not know you, father. Tell him about yourself. You speak so well. If you wish it, he will believe you, father. Haggart. Haggart maintains silence. Noni. Captain. Silence. Kor whispers mysteriously. He feels sad. Girl, tell the priest that he feels sad. Kor, begins Marriott. Haggart looks around quickly. What about Kor? Why don't you like him, Marriott? We are so much like each other. He is like you, says the woman with contempt. No, Haggart. But here is what he did, he gave gin to little Noni again today. He moistened his finger and gave it to him. He will kill him, father. Haggart laughs. Is that so bad? He did the same to me. And he dipped him in cold water. The boy is very weak, says Marriott morosely. I don't like to hear you speak of weakness. Our boy must be strong. Core. Three days without gin. He shows him three fingers. Who should be without gin? The boy or I? asks Kor gloomily. You, replies Haggard furiously. Be gone. The sailor sullenly gathers his belongings, the pouch, the pipe, and the flask, and wobbling, goes off. But he does not go far, he sits down upon a neighboring rock. Haggard and his wife look at him. Chapter 3 The work is ended. Having lost its gloss, the last neglected fish lies on the ground, even the children are too lazy to pick it up. And an indifferent, satiated foot treads it into the mud. A quiet, fatigued conversation goes on, mingled with gay and peaceful laughter. What kind of a prayer is our abbot going to say today? It is already time for him to come. And do you think it is so easy to compose a good prayer? He is thinking. Selly's basket broke and the fish were falling out. We laughed so much. It seems so funny to me even now. Laughter. Two fishermen look at the sail in the distance. All my life I have seen large ships sailing past us. Where are they going? They disappear beyond the horizon, and I go off to sleep, and I sleep, while they are forever going, going. Where are they going? Do you know? To America. I should like to go with them. When they speak of America my heart begins to ring. Did you say America on purpose, or is that the truth? Several old women are whispering. Wild Gart is angry again at his sailor. Have you noticed it? The sailor is displeased. Look, how wan his face is. Yes, he looks like the evil one when he is compelled to listen to a psalm. But I don't like Wild Gart either. No. Where did he come from? They resume their whispers. Haggard complains softly. Why have you the same name, Marriott, for everybody? It should not be so in a truthful land. Marriott speaks with restrained force, pressing both hands to her breast. I love you so dearly, Gart, when you go out to sea, I set my teeth together and do not open them until you come back. When you are away, I eat nothing and drink nothing, when you are away, I am silent, and the women laugh, mute Marriott. But I would be insane if I spoke when I am alone. Haggard, here you are again compelling me to smile. You must not. Marriott, I am forever smiling. Marriott, I love you so dearly, Gart. Every hour of the day and the night I am thinking only of what I could still give to you, Gart. Have I not given you everything? But that is so little, everything. There is but one thing I want to do, 
to keep on giving to you, giving. When the sun sets, I present you the sunset, when the sun rises, I present you the sunrise, take it, Gart. And are not all the storms yours? Ah, Haggart, how I love you! Haggart, I am going to toss little Noni so high today that I will toss him up to the clouds. Do you want me to do it? Let us laugh, dear little sister Marriott. You are exactly like myself. When you stand that way, it seems to me that I am standing there, I have to rub my eyes. Let us laugh. Some day I may suddenly mix things up, I may wake up and say to you, Good morning, Haggart. Marriott, good morning, Marriott. Haggart, I will call you Haggart. Isn't that a good idea? Marriott, and I will call you Marriott. Haggart, yes, no. You had better call me Haggart, too. You don't want me to call you Marriott, asks Marriott sadly. The abbot and old Dan appear. The abbot says in a loud, deep voice. Here I am. Here I am bringing you a prayer, children. I have just composed it, it has even made me feel hot. Dan, why doesn't the boy ring the bell? Oh, yes, he is ringing. The fool, he isn't swinging the right rope, but that doesn't matter, that's good enough, too. Isn't it, Marriott? Too thin but merry bells are ringing. Marriott is silent and haggard answers for her. That's good enough. But what are the bells saying, Abbot? The fishermen who have gathered about them are already prepared to laugh, the same undying jest is always repeated. Will you tell no one about it? Says the abbot, in a deep voice, slyly winking his eye. Pope's a rogue. Pope's a rogue. The fishermen laugh merrily. This man, roars the abbot, pointing at Haggart, is my favorite man. He has given me a grandson, and I wrote the Pope about it in Latin. But that wasn't so hard, isn't that true, Marriott? But he knows how to look at the water. He foretells a storm as if he himself caused it. Gart, do you produce the storm yourself? Where does the wind come from? You are the wind yourself. All laugh approval. An old fisherman says. That's true, father. Ever since he has been here, we have never been caught in a storm. Of course it is true, if I say it. Pope's a rogue. Pope's a rogue. Old Dan walks over to Cor and says something to him. Cor nods his head negatively. The abbot, singing, Pope's a rogue, goes around the crowd, throws out brief remarks, and claps some people on the shoulder in a friendly manner. Hello, Katerina, you are getting stout. Oh ho! Are you all ready? And Thomas is missing again, this is the second time he has stayed away from prayer. Anna, you are rather sad, that isn't good. One must live merrily, one must live merrily. I think that it is jolly even in hell, but in a different way. It is two years since you have stopped growing, Philip. That isn't good. Philip answers gruffly. Grass also stops growing if a stone falls upon it. What is still worse than that, worms begin to breed under the rock. Marriott says softly, sadly and entreatingly. Don't you want me to call you Marriott? Haggard answers obstinately and sternly. I don't. If my name will be Marriott, I shall never kill that man. He disturbs my life. Make me a present of his life, Marriott. He kissed you. How can I present you that which is not mine? His life belongs to God and to himself. That is not true. He kissed you. Do I not see the burns upon your lips? Let me kill him, and you will feel as joyful and carefree as a seagull. Say, yes, Marriott. No, you shouldn't do it, Gart. It will be painful to you. Haggart looks at her and speaks with deep irony. Is that it? Well, then, it is not true that you give me anything. You don't know how to give, woman. I am your wife. No. A man has no wife when another man, and not his wife, grinds his knife. 
My knife is dull, Marriott. Marriott looks at him with horror and sorrow. What did you say, Haggart? Wake up. It is a terrible dream, Haggart. It is I, look at me. Open your eyes wider, wider, until you see me well. Do you see me, Gart? Haggart slowly rubs his brow. I don't know. It is true I love you, Marriott. But how incomprehensible your land is, in your land a man sees dreams even when he is not asleep. Perhaps I am smiling already. Look, Marriott. The abbot stops in front of Cor. Ah, old friend, how do you do? You are smiling already. Look, Marriott. I don't want to work, ejaculates the sailor sternly. You want your own way? This man, roars the abbot, pointing at Cor, thinks that he is an atheist. But he is simply a fool. He does not understand that he is also praying to God, but he is doing it the wrong way, like a crab. Even a fish prays to God, my children, I have seen it myself. When you will be in hell, old man, give my regards to the Pope. Well, children, come closer, and don't gnash your teeth. I am going to start at once. Eh, you, Matthias, you needn't put out the fire in your pipe, isn't it the same to God what smoke it is, incense or tobacco, if it is only well meant? Why do you shake your head, woman? Woman, his tobacco is contraband. Young fisherman, God wouldn't bother with such trifles. The abbot thinks a while. No, hold on. I think contraband tobacco is not quite so good. That's an inferior grade. Look here, you better drop your pipe meanwhile, Matthias, I'll think the matter over later. Now, silence, perfect silence. Let God take a look at us first. All stand silent and serious. Only a few have lowered their heads. Most of the people are looking ahead with wide open, motionless eyes, as though they really saw God in the blue of the sky, in the boundless, radiant, distant surface of the sea. The sea is approaching with a caressing murmur, high tide has set in. My God and the God of all these people! Don't judge us for praying, not in Latin but in our own language, which our mothers have taught us. Our God! Save us from all kinds of terrors, from unknown sea monsters. Protect us against storms and hurricanes, against tempests and gales. Give us calm weather and a kind wind, a clear sun and peaceful waves. And another thing, O oh Lord! We ask you. Don't allow the devil, to come close to our bedside when we are asleep. In our sleep we are defenseless, O oh Lord! And the devil terrifies us, tortures us to convulsions, torments us to the very blood of our heart. And there is another thing, O oh Lord! Old Rika, whom you know, is beginning to extinguish your light in his eyes and he can make nets no longer. Rika frequently shakes his head in assent. I can't, I can't. Prolong, then, O oh Lord! Your bright day and bid the night wait. Am I right, Rika? Yes. And here is still another, the last request, O oh Lord! I shall not ask any more, the tears do not dry up in the eyes of our old women crying for those who have perished. Take their memory away, O oh Lord, and give them strong forgetfulness. There are still other trifles, O oh Lord, but let the others pray whose turn has come before you. Amen. Silence. Old Dan tugs the abbot by the sleeve, and whispers something in his ear. Abbot, Dan is asking me to pray for those who perished at sea. The women exclaim in plaintive chorus. For those who perished at sea. For those who died at sea. Some of them kneel. The abbot looks tenderly at their bowed heads, exhausted with waiting and fear, and says. No priest should pray for those who died at sea, these women should pray. Make it so, O Lord, that they should not weep so much. Silence. The incoming tide roars more loudly, the ocean is carrying to the earth its noise, its secrets, its bitter, briny taste of unexplored depths. Soft voices say. 
The sea is coming. High tide has started. The sea is coming. Marriott kisses her father's hand. Woman, says the priest tenderly. Listen, Gart, isn't it strange that this, a woman, he strokes his daughter tenderly with his finger on her pure forehead, should be born of me, a man? Haggart smiles. And is it not strange that this should have become a wife to me, a man? He embraces Marriott, bending her frail shoulders. Let us go to eat, Gart, my son. Whoever she may be, I know one thing well. She has prepared for you and me an excellent dinner. The people disperse quickly. Marriott says confusedly and cheerfully. I'll run first. Run, run, answers the abbot. Gart, my son, call the atheist to dinner. I'll hit him with a spoon on the forehead, an atheist understands a sermon best of all if you hit him with a spoon. He waits and mutters. The boy has commenced to ring the bells again. He does it for himself, the rogue. If we did not lock the steeple, they would pray there from morning until night. Haggard goes over to Kor, near whom Dan is sitting. Kor! Let us go to eat, the priest called you. I don't want to go, Noni. So? What are you going to do here on shore? I will think, Noni, think. I have so much to think to be able to understand at least something. Haggard turns around silently. The abbot calls from the distance. He is not coming. Well, then, let him stay there. And Dan, never call Dan, my son, says the priest in his deep whisper, he eats at night like a rat. Marriott purposely puts something away for him in the closet for the night, when she looks for it in the morning, it is gone. Just think of it, no one ever hears when he takes it. Does he fly? Both go off. Only the two old men, seated in a friendly manner on two neighboring rocks, remain on the deserted shore. And the old men resemble each other so closely, and whatever they may say to each other, the whiteness of their hair, the deep lines of their wrinkles, make them kin. The tide is coming. They have all gone away, mutters Kor. Thus will they cook hot soup on the wrecks of our ship, too. Eh, uh, Dan. Do you know he ordered me to drink no gin for three days? Let the old dog croak. Isn't that so, Noni? Of those who died at sea. Those who died at sea, mutters Dan, a son taken from his father, a son from his father. The father said go, and the son perished in the sea. Oi, oi, oi. What are you prating there, old man? I say, he ordered me to drink no gin. Soon he will order, like that king of yours, that the sea be lashed with chains. Oh ho! With chains! Your king was a fool. Was he married, your king? The sea is coming, coming, mutters Dan, it brings along its noise, its secret, its deception. Oh, how the sea deceives man! Those who died at sea, yes, yes, yes. Those who died at sea, Yes, the sea is coming. And you don't like it? asks Kor, rejoicing maliciously. Well, don't you like it? I don't like your music. Do you hear, Dan? I hate your music. Oh ho! And why do you come to hear it? I know that you and Gart stood by the wall and listened. Kor says sternly. It was he who got me out of bed. He will get you out of bed again. No, roars Kor furiously. I will get up myself at night. Do you hear, Dan? I will get up at night and break your music. And I will spit into your sea. Try, says the sailor distrustfully. How will you spit? This way, and Dan, exasperated, spits in the direction of the sea. The frightened Kor, in confusion, says hoarsely. Oh, what sort of man are you? You spat. Eh, Dan, look out, it will be bad for you, you yourself are talking about those who died at sea. Dan shouts, frightened. Who speaks of those that perished at sea? You, you dog. He goes away, 
grumbling and coughing, swinging his hand and stooping. Kor is left alone before the entire vastness of the sea and the sky. He is gone. Then I am going to look at you, O oh sea, until my eyes will burst of thirst. The ocean, approaching, is roaring. Chapter 4 At the very edge of the water, upon a narrow landing on the rocky shore, stands a man, a small, dark, motionless dot. Behind him is the cold, almost vertical slope of granite, and before his eyes the ocean is rocking heavily and dully in the impenetrable darkness. Its mighty approach is felt in the open voice of the waves which are rising from the depths. Even sniffing sounds are heard, it is as though a drove of monsters, playing, were splashing, snorting, lying down on their backs, and panting contentedly, deriving their monstrous pleasures. The ocean smells of the strong odor of the depths, of decaying seaweeds, of its grass. The sea is calm today and, as always, alone. And there is but one little light in the black space of water and night, the distant lighthouse of the Holy Cross. The rattle of cobblestones is heard from under a cautious step, Haggard is coming down to the sea along a steep path. He pauses, silent with restraint, breathing deeply after the strain of passing the dangerous slope, and goes forward. He is now at the edge, he straightens himself and looks for a long time at him who had long before taken his strange but customary place at the very edge of the deep. He makes a few steps forward and greets him irresolutely and gently, Haggard greets him even timidly. Good evening, stranger. Have you been here long? A sad, soft, and grave voice answers. Good evening, Haggart. Yes, I have been here long. You are watching? I am watching and listening. Will you allow me to stand near you and look in the same direction you are looking? I am afraid that I am disturbing you by my uninvited presence, for when I came you were already here, but I am so fond of this spot. This place is isolated, and the sea is near, and the earth behind is silent, and hear my eyes open. Like a night owl, I see better in the dark, the light of day dazzles me. You know, I have grown up on the sea, sir. No, you are not disturbing me, Haggart. But am I not disturbing you? Then I shall go away. You are so polite, sir, mutters Haggart. But I also love this spot, continues the sad, grave voice. I, too, like to feel that the cold and peaceful granite is behind me. You have grown up on the sea, Haggart, tell me, what is that faint light on the right? That is the lighthouse of the Holy Cross. Aha! The lighthouse of the Holy Cross. I didn't know that. But can such a faint light help in time of a storm? I look and it always seems to me that the light is going out. I suppose it isn't so. Haggart, agitated but restrained, says. You frighten me, sir. Why do you ask me what you know better than I do? You want to tempt me, you know everything. There is not a trace of a smile in the mournful voice, nothing but sadness. No, I know little. I know even less than you do, for I know more. Pardon my rather complicated phrase, Haggart, but the tongue responds with so much difficulty not only to our feeling, but also to our thought. You are polite, mutters Haggard agitated. You are polite and always calm. You are always sad and you have a thin hand with rings upon it, and you speak like a very important personage. Who are you, sir? I am he whom you called, the one who is always sad. When I come, you are already here, when I go away, you remain. Why do you never want to go with me, sir? There is one way for you, Haggart, and another for me. I see you only at night. I know all the people around this settlement, and there is no one who looks like you. Sometimes I think that you are the owner of that old castle where I lived. If that is so I must tell you the castle was destroyed by the storm. I don't know of whom you speak. I don't understand how you know my name, Haggart. But I don't want to deceive you. Although my wife Marriott calls me so, I invented that name myself. I have another name, my real name, of which no one has ever heard here. I know your other name also, Haggart. 
I know your third name, too, which even you do not know. But it is hardly worth speaking of this. You had better look into this dark sea and tell me about your life. Is it true that it is so joyous? They say that you are forever smiling. They say that you are the bravest and most handsome fisherman on the coast. And they also say that you love your wife Marriott very dearly. Oh sir! exclaims Haggard with restraint, my life is so sad that you could not find an image like it in this dark deep. Oh sir! my sufferings are so deep that you could not find a more terrible place in this dark abyss. What is the cause of your sorrow and your sufferings, Haggard? Life, sir. Here your noble and sad eyes look in the same direction my eyes look, into this terrible, dark distance. Tell me, then, what is stirring there? What is resting and waiting there, what is silent there, what is screaming and singing and complaining there in its own voices? What are the voices that agitate me and fill my soul with phantoms of sorrow, and yet say nothing? And whence comes this night? And whence comes my sorrow? Are you sighing, sir, or is it the sigh of the ocean blending with your voice? My hearing is beginning to fail me, my master, my dear master. The sad voice replies. It is my sigh, Haggard. My great sorrow is responding to your sorrow. You see at night like an owl, Haggard, then look at my thin hands and at my rings. Are they not pale? And look at my face, is it not pale? Is it not pale, is it not pale? Oh, Haggard, my dear Haggard. They grieve silently. The heavy ocean is splashing, tossing about, spitting and snorting and sniffing peacefully. The sea is calm tonight and alone, as always. Tell Haggard, says the sad voice. Very well. I will tell Haggard. Tell Haggard that I love him. Silence, and then a faint, plaintive reproach resounds softly. If your voice were not so grave, sir, I would have thought that you were laughing at me. Am I not Haggard that I should tell something to Haggard? But no, I sense a different meaning in your words, and you frighten me again. And when Haggard is afraid, it is real terror. Very well, I will tell Haggard everything you have said. Adjust my cloak, my shoulder is cold. But it always seems to me that the light over there is going out. You called it the lighthouse of the Holy Cross, if I am not mistaken? Yes, it is called so here. Aha! It is called so here. Silence. Must I go now? asks Haggard. Yes, go. And you will remain here? I will remain here. Haggard retreats several steps. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, Haggard. Again the cobblestones rattle under his cautious steps. Without looking back, Haggard climbs the steep rocks. Of what great sorrow speaks this night? Chapter 5 Your hands are in blood, Haggard. Whom have you killed, Haggard? Silence, Kor, I killed that man. Be silent and listen, he will commence to play soon. I stood here and listened, but suddenly my heart sank, and I cannot stay here alone. Don't confuse my mind, Noni, don't tempt me. I will run away from here. At night, when I am already fast asleep, you swoop down on me like a demon, grab me by the neck, and drag me over here. I can't understand anything. Tell me, my boy, is it necessary to hide the body? Yes, yes. Why didn't you throw it into the sea? Silence. What are you prating about? I have nothing to throw into the sea. But your hands are in blood. Silence, Kor. He will commence soon. Be silent and listen, I say to you, are you a friend to me or not, Kor? He drags him closer to the dark window of the church. Kor mutters. How dark it is. If you raised me out of bed for this accursed music. Yes, yes, for this accursed music. Then you have disturbed my honest sleep in vain, I want no music, Noni. So. Was I perhaps to run through the street, knock at the windows and shout, Eh, 
Who is there, where's a living soul? Come and help Haggard, stand up with him against the cannons. You are confusing things, Noni. Drink some gin, my boy. What cannons? Silence, sailor. He drags him away from the window. Oh, you shake me like a squall. Silence. I think he looked at us from the window, something white flashed behind the window pane. You may laugh. Cor, if he came out now I would scream like a woman. He laughs softly. Are you speaking of Dan? I don't understand anything, Noni. But is that Dan? Of course it is not Dan, it is someone else. Give me your hand, sailor. I think that you simply drank too much, like that time, remember, in the castle? And your hand is quivering. But then the game was different. TSS. Kor lowers his voice. But your hand is really in blood. Oh, you are breaking my fingers. Haggard threatens. If you don't keep still, dog, I'll break every bone of your body. I'll pull every vein out of your body, if you don't keep still, you dog. Silence. The distant breakers are softly groaning, as if complaining, the sea has gone far away from the black earth. And the night is silent. It came no one knows whence and spread over the earth. It spread over the earth and is silent, it is silent, waiting for something. And ferocious mists have swung themselves to meet it, the sea breathed phantoms, driving to the earth a herd of headless submissive giants. A heavy fog is coming. Why doesn't he light a lamp? Asks Kor sternly but submissively. He needs no light. Perhaps there is no one there any longer. Yes, he's there. A fog is coming. How quiet it is. There's something wrong in the air, what do you think, Noni? TSS. The first soft sounds of the organ resound. Someone is sitting alone in the dark and is speaking to God in an incomprehensible language about the most important things. And however faint the sounds, suddenly the silence vanishes, the night trembles and stares into the dark church with all its myriads of phantom eyes. An agitated voice whispers. Listen. He always begins that way. He gets a hold of your soul at once. Where does he get the power? He gets a hold of your heart. I don't like it. Listen. Now he makes believe he is Haggard, Cor. Little Haggard in his mother's lap. Look, all hands are filled with golden rays, little Haggard is playing with golden rays. Look. I don't see it, Noni. Leave my hand alone, it hurts. Now he makes believe he is Haggard. Listen. The oppressive chords resound faintly. Haggard moans softly. What is it, Noni? Do you feel any pain? Yes. Do you understand of what he speaks? No. He speaks of the most important, of the most vital, core. If we could only understand it, I want to understand it. Listen, Kor, listen. Why does he make believe that he is Haggard? It is not my soul. My soul does not know this. What, Noni? I don't know. What terrible dreams there are in this land. Listen. There. Now he will cry and he will say, It is Haggard crying. He will call God and will say, Haggard is calling. He lies, Haggard did not call, Haggard does not know God. He moans again, trying to restrain himself. Do you feel any pain? Yes, be silent. Haggard exclaims in a muffled voice. Oh, Kor. What is it, Noni? Why don't you tell him that it isn't Haggard? It is a lie, whispers Haggard rapidly. He thinks that he knows, but he does not know anything. He is a small, wretched old man with red eyes, like those of a rabbit, and tomorrow death will mow him down. Ha! He is dealing in diamonds, he throws them from one hand to the other like an old miser, and he himself is dying of hunger. It is a fraud, Kor, a fraud. Let us shout loudly, 
Kor, we are alone here. He shouts, turning to the thundering organ. Eh, musician. Even a fly cannot rise on your wings, even the smallest fly cannot rise on your wings. Eh, musician. Let me have your torn hat and I will throw a penny into it, your lie is worth no more. What are you prating there about God, you rabbit's eyes? Be silent, I am shamed to listen to you. I swear, I am ashamed to listen to you. Don't you believe me? You are still calling? Whither? Strike them on the head, Noni. Be silent, you dog. But what a terrible land! What are they doing here with the human heart? What terrible dreams there are in this land! He stopped speaking. The organ sings solemnly. Why did you stop speaking, Noni? asks the sailor with alarm. I am listening. It is good music, Kor. Have I said anything? You even shouted, Noni, and you forced me to shout with you. That is not true. I have been silent all the time. Do you know, I haven't even opened my mouth once. You must have been dreaming, Kor. Perhaps you are thinking that you are near the church? You are simply sleeping in your bed, sailor. It is a dream. Kor is terrified. Drink some gin, Noni. I don't need it. I drank something else already. Your hands? Be silent, Kor. Don't you see that everything is silent and is listening, and you alone are talking? The musician may feel offended. He laughs quietly. Brass trumpets are roaring harmoniously about the triumphant conciliation between man and God. The fog is growing thicker. A loud stamping of feet, someone runs through the deserted street in agitation. Noni, whispers the sailor. Who ran by? I hear. Noni. Another one is running. Something is wrong. Frightened people are running about in the middle of the night, the echo of the night doubles the sound of their footsteps, increasing their terror tenfold, and it seems as if the entire village, terror-stricken, is running away somewhere. Rocking, dancing silently, as upon waves, a lantern floats by. They have found him, Kor. They have found the man I killed, Sailor. I did not throw him into the sea. I brought him and set his head up against the door of his house. They have found him. Another lantern floats by, swinging from side to side. As if hearing the alarm, the organ breaks off at a high chord. An instant of silence, emptiness of dread waiting, and then a woman's sob of despair fills it up to the brim. The mist is growing thicker. Chapter 6 The flame in the oil lamp is dying out, having a smell of burning. It is near sunrise. A large, clean, fisherman's hut. A skillfully made little ship is fastened to the ceiling, and even the sails are set. Involuntarily this little ship has somehow become the center of attraction and all those who speak, who are silent and who listen, look at it, study each familiar sail. Behind the dark curtain lies the body of Philip, this hut belonged to him. The people are waiting for Haggard, some have gone out to search for him. On the benches along the walls, the old fishermen have seated themselves, their hands folded on their knees, some of them seem to be slumbering, others are smoking their pipes. They speak meditatively and cautiously, as though eager to utter no unnecessary words. Whenever a belated fisherman comes in, he looks first at the curtain, then he silently squeezes himself into the crowd, and those who have no place on the bench apparently feel embarrassed. The abbot paces the room heavily, his hands folded on his back, his head lowered, when anyone is in his way, he quietly pushes him aside with his hand. He is silent and knits his brows convulsively. Occasionally he glances at the door or at the window and listens. The only woman present there is Marriott. She is sitting by the table and constantly watching her father with her burning eyes. She shudders slightly at each loud word, at the sound of the door as it opens, at the noise of distant footsteps. At night a fog came from the sea and covered the earth. 
and such perfect quiet reigns now that long-drawn tolling is heard in the distant lighthouse of the Holy Cross. Warning is thus given to the ships that have lost their way in the fog. Someone in the corner says. Judging from the blow, it was not one of our people that killed him. Our people can't strike like that. He stuck the knife here, then slashed over there, and almost cut his head off. You can't do that with a dull knife. No. You can't do it with a weak hand. I saw a murdered sailor on the wharf one day, he was cut up just like this. Silence. And where is his mother, asks someone, nodding at the curtain. Selly is taking care of her. Selly took her to her house. An old fisherman quietly asks his neighbor. Who told you? Francina woke me. Who told you, Merle? Someone knocked on my window. Who knocked on your window? I don't know. Silence. How is it you don't know? Who was the first to see? Someone passed by and noticed him. None of us passed by. There was nobody among us who passed by. A fisherman seated at the other end, says. There was nobody among us who passed by. Tell us, Thomas. Thomas takes out his pipe. I am a neighbor of Philip's, of that man there, he points at the curtain. Yes, yes, you all know that I am his neighbor. And if anybody does not know it, I'll say it again, as in a court of justice, I am his neighbor, I live right next to him, he turns to the window. An elderly fisherman enters and forces himself silently into the line. Well, Tibwa, asks the abbot, stopping. Nothing. Haven't you found Haggart? No. It is so foggy that they are afraid of losing themselves. They walk and call each other, some of them hold each other by the hand. Even a lantern can't be seen ten feet away. The abbot lowers his head and resumes his pacing. The old fisherman speaks, without addressing anyone in particular. There are many ships now staring helplessly in the sea. I walked like a blind man, says Tibwa. I heard the holy cross ringing. But it seems as if it changed its place. The sound comes from the left side. The fog is deceitful. Old Desfoso says. This never happened here. Since Dugamal broke Jack's head with a shaft. That was thirty, forty years ago. What did you say, Desfoso, the abbot stops. I say, since Dugamal broke Jack's head. Yes, yes, says the abbot, and resumes pacing the room. Then Dugamal threw himself into the sea from a rock and was dashed to death, that's how it happened. He threw himself down. Marriott shudders and looks at the speaker with hatred. Silence. What did you say, Thomas? Thomas takes his pipe out of his mouth. Nothing. I only said that someone knocked at my window. You don't know who? No. And you will never know. I came out, I looked, and there Philip was sitting at his door. I wasn't surprised, Philip often roamed about at night ever since. He stops irresolutely. Marriott asks harshly. Since when? You said, since. Silence. Desfoso replies frankly and heavily. Since your haggard came. Go ahead, Thomas, tell us about it. So I said to him, why did you knock, Philip? Do you want anything? But he was silent. And he was silent? He was silent. If you don't want anything, you had better go to sleep, my friend, said I. But he was silent. Then I looked at him, his throat was cut open. Marriott shudders and looks at the speaker with aversion. Silence. Another fisherman enters, looks at the curtain and silently forces his way into the crowd. Women's voices are heard behind the door, the abbot stops. Eh, Leban. Chase the women away, he says. Tell them, there is nothing for them to do here. Leban goes out. Wait, the abbot stops. Ask how the mother is feeling, Selly is taking care of her. Desfoso says. You say, 
Chase away the women, abbot. And your daughter? She is here. The abbot looks at Marriott. She says. I am not going away from here. Silence. The abbot paces the room again, he looks at the little ship fastened to the ceiling and asks. Who made it? All look at the little ship. He, answers Desfoso. He made it when he wanted to go to America as a sailor. He was always asking me how a three-masted brig is fitted out. They look at the ship again, at its perfect little sails, at the little rags. Leban returns. I don't know how to tell you about it, Abbot. The women say that Haggart and his sailor are being led over here. The women are afraid. Marriott shudders and looks at the door. The abbot pauses. Oh ho, it is daybreak already, the fog is turning blue, says one fisherman to another, but his voice breaks off. Yes. Low tide has started, replies the other dully. Silence. Then uneven footsteps resound. Several young fishermen with excited faces bring in Haggart, who is bound, and push Kor in after him, also bound. Haggard is calm. As soon as the sailor was bound, something wildly free appeared in his movements, in his manners, in the sharpness of his swift glances. One of the men who brought Haggard says to the abbot in a low voice. He was near the church. Ten times we passed by and saw no one, until he called, Aren't you looking for me? It is so foggy, father. The abbot shakes his head silently and sits down. Marriott smiles to her husband with her pale lips, but he does not look at her. Like all the others, he has fixed his eyes in amazement on the toy ship. Hello, Haggart, says the abbot. Hello, father. You call me father? Yes, you. You are mistaken, Haggart. I am not your father. The fishermen exchanged glances contentedly. Well, then. Hello, Abbot, says Haggard with indifference, and resumes examining the little ship. Kor mutters. That's the way, be firm, Noni. Who made this toy, asks Haggard, but no one replies. Hello, Gart, says Marriott, smiling. It is I, your wife, Marriott. Let me untie your hands. With a smile, pretending that she does not notice the stains of blood, she unfastens the ropes. All look at her in silence. Haggard also looks at her bent, alarmed head. Thank you, he says, straightening his hands. It would be a good thing to untie my hands, too, said Cor, but there is no answer. Abbot, Haggard, did you kill Philip? Haggard, I. Abbot, do you mean to say, eh, you, Haggard, that you yourself killed him with your own hands? Perhaps you said to the sailor, sailor, go and kill Philip, and he did it, for he loves you and respects you as his superior? Perhaps it happened that way. Tell me, Haggard. I called you my son, Haggard. Haggard, no, I did not order the sailor to do it. I killed Philip with my own hand. Silence. Kor, Noni. Tell them to unfasten my hands and give me back my pipe. Don't be in a hurry, roars the priest. Be bound a while, drunkard. You had better be afraid of an untied rope, it may be formed into a noose. But obeying a certain swift movement or glance of Haggard, Marriott walks over to the sailor and opens the knots of the rope. And again all look in silence upon her bent, alarmed head. Then they turn their eyes upon Haggard. Just as they looked at the little ship before, so they now look at him. And he, too, has forgotten about the toy. As if aroused from sleep, he surveys the fisherman, and stares long at the dark curtain. Abbot, Haggard, I am asking you. Who carried Philip's body? Haggard, I. I brought it and put it near the door, his head against the door, his face against the sea. It was hard to set him that way, he was always falling down. But I did it. Abbot, why did you do it? Haggard, I don't know exactly. I heard that Philip has a mother, an old woman, 
and I thought this might please them better, both him and his mother. Abbot, with restraint. You are laughing at us? Haggart, no. What makes you think I am laughing? I am just as serious as you are. Did he, did Philip make this little ship? No one answers. Marriott, rising and bending over to Haggart across the table, says. Didn't you say this, Haggart, my poor boy, I killed you because I had to kill you, and now I am going to take you to your mother. My dear boy? These are very sad words. Who told them to you, Marriott, asks Haggart, surprised. I heard them. And didn't you say further, Mother, I have brought you your son, and put him down at your door, take your boy, Mother? Haggart maintains silence. I don't know, roars the abbot bitterly. I don't know, people don't kill here, and we don't know how it is done. Perhaps that is as it should be, to kill and then bring the murdered man to his mother's threshold. What are you gaping at, you scarecrow? Kor replies rudely. According to my opinion, he should have thrown him into the sea. Your haggard is out of his mind, I have said it long ago. Suddenly old Desfoso shouts amid the loud approval of the others. Hold your tongue. We will send him to the city, but we will hang you like a cat ourselves, even if you did not kill him. Silence, old man, silence, the abbot stops him, while Kor looks over their heads with silent contempt. Haggart, I am asking you, why did you take Philip's life? He needed his life just as you need yours. He was Marriott's betrothed, Anne. Well? Anne, I don't want to speak. Why didn't you ask me before, when he was alive? Now I have killed him. But, says the abbot, and there is a note of entreaty in his heavy voice. But it may be that you are already repenting, Haggart. You are a splendid man, Gart. I know you. When you are sober you cannot hurt even a fly. Perhaps you were intoxicated, that happens with young people, and Philip may have said something to you, and you. No. No? Well, then, let it be no. Am I not right, children? But perhaps something strange came over you it happens with people, suddenly a red mist will get into a man's head, the beast will begin to howl in his breast. And, in such cases one word is enough. No, Philip did not say anything to me. He passed along the road, when I jumped out from behind a large rock and stuck a knife into his throat. He had no time even to be scared. But if you like, Haggart surveys the fisherman with his eyes irresolutely, I feel a little sorry for him. That is, just a little. Did he make this toy? The abbot lowers his head sternly. And Desfoso shouts again, amidst sobs of approval from the others. No. Abbot, you better ask him what he was doing at the church. Dan saw them from the window. Wouldn't you tell us what you and your accursed sailor were doing at the church? What were you doing there? Speak. Haggart looks at the speaker steadfastly and says slowly. I talked with the devil. A muffled rumbling follows. The abbot jumps from his place and roars furiously. Then let him sit on your neck. Eh, Pierre, Jules, tie him down as fast as you can until morning. And the other one, too. And in the morning, in the morning, take him away to the city, to the judges. I don't know their accursed city laws, cries the abbot in despair, but they will hang you, Haggart. You will dangle on a rope, Haggart. Kor rudely pushes aside the young fisherman who comes over to him with a rope, and says to Desfoso in a low voice. It's an important matter, old man. Go away for a minute, he oughtn't to hear it, he nods at Haggart. I don't trust you. You needn't. That's nothing. Noni, there is a little matter here. Come, come, and don't be afraid. I have no knife. The people step aside and whisper. Haggart is silently waiting to be bound, but no one comes over to him. All shudder when Marriott suddenly commences to speak. Perhaps you think that all this is just, father? 
Why, then, don't you ask me about it? I am his wife. Don't you believe that I am his wife? Then I will bring little Noni here. Do you want me to bring little Noni? He is sleeping, but I will wake him up. Once in his life he may wake up at night in order to say that this man whom you want to hang in the city is his father. Don't, says Haggart. Very well, replies Marriott obediently. He commands and I must obey, he is my husband. Let little Noni sleep. But I am not sleeping, I am here. Why, then, didn't you ask me, Marriott, how was it possible that your husband, Haggart, should kill Philip? Silence. Desfoso, who has returned and who is agitated, decides. Let her speak. She is his wife. You will not believe, Desfoso, says Marriott, turning to the old fisherman with a tender and mournful smile. Desfoso, you will not believe what strange and peculiar creatures we women are. Turning to all the people with the same smile, she continues. You will not believe what queer desires, what cunning, malicious little thoughts we women have. It was I who persuaded my husband to kill Philip. Yes, yes, he did not want to do it, but I urged him, I cried so much and threatened him, so he consented. Men always give in, isn't that true, Desfoso? Haggard looks at his wife in a state of great perplexity, his eyebrows brought close to each other. Marriott continues, without looking at him, still smiling as before. You will ask me, why I wanted Philip's death. Yes, yes, you will ask this question, I know it. He never did me any harm, that poor Philip, isn't that true? Then I will tell you, he was my betrothed. I don't know whether you will be able to understand me. You, old Desfoso, you would not kill the girl you kissed one day? Of course not. But we women are such strange creatures, you can't even imagine what strange, suspicious, peculiar creatures we are. Philip was my betrothed, and he kissed me. She wipes her mouth and continues, laughing. Here I am wiping my mouth even now. You have all seen how I wiped my mouth. I am wiping away Philip's kisses. You are laughing. But ask your wife, Desfoso, does she want the life of the man who kissed her before you? Ask all women who love, even the old women. We never grow old in love. We are born so, we women. Haggart almost believes her. Advancing a step forward, he asks. You urged me? Perhaps it is true, Marriott, I don't remember. Marriott laughs. Do you hear? He has forgotten. Go on, Gart. You may say that it was your own idea. That's the way you men are, you forget everything. Will you say perhaps that I? Marriott. Haggard interrupts her threateningly. Marriott, turning pale, looking sorrowfully at his terrible eyes which are now steadfastly fixed upon her, continues, still smiling. Go on, Gart. Will you say perhaps that I, will you say perhaps that I dissuaded you? That would be funny. Haggart, no, I will not say that. You lie, Marriott. Even I, Haggart, just think of it, people, even I believed her, so cleverly does this woman lie. Marriott, go, on, Haggart. Haggart, you are laughing? Abbott, I don't want to be the husband of your daughter, she lies. Abbott, you are worse than the devil, Gart. That's what I say, you are worse than the devil, Gart. Haggart, you are all foolish people. I don't understand you, I don't know now what to do with you. Shall I laugh? Shall I be angry? Shall I cry? You want to let me go, why, then, don't you let me go? You are sorry for Philip. Well, then, kill me. I have told you that it was I who killed the boy. Am I disputing? But you are making grimaces like monkeys that have found bananas, or have you such a game in your land? Then I don't want to play it. And you, Abbot, you are like a juggler in the marketplace. In one hand you have truth and in the other hand you have truth, and you are forever performing tricks. And now she is lying, 
she lies so well that my heart contracts with belief. Oh, she is doing it well. And he laughs bitterly. Marriott, forgive me, Gart. Haggard, when I wanted to kill him, she hung on my hand like a rock, and now she says that she killed him. She steals from me this murder, she does not know that one has to earn that, too. Oh, there are queer people in your land. I wanted to deceive them, not you, Gart. I wanted to save you, says Marriott. Haggard replies. My father taught me, eh, noni, beware. There is one truth and one law for all, for the sun, for the wind, for the waves, for the beasts, and only for man there is another truth. Beware of this truth of man, noni, so said my father. Perhaps this is your truth? Then I am not afraid of it, but I feel very sad and very embittered. Marriott, if you sharpened my knife and said, Go and kill that man, it may be that I would not have cared to kill him. What is the use of cutting down a withered tree? I would have said. But now, farewell, Marriott. Well, bind me and take me to the city. He waits haughtily, but no one approaches him. Marriott has lowered her head upon her hands, her shoulders are twitching. The abbot is also absorbed in thought, his large head lowered. Desfoso is carrying on a heated conversation in whispers with the fisherman. Kor steps forward and speaks, glancing at Haggard askance. I had a little talk with them, Noni, they are all right, they are good fellows, Noni. Only the priest, but he is a good man, too, am I right, Noni? Don't look so crossly at me, or I'll mix up the whole thing. You see, kind people, it's this way, this man, Haggard, and I have saved up a little sum of money, a little barrel of gold. We don't need it, Noni, do we? Perhaps you will take it for yourselves? What do you think? Shall we give them the gold, Noni? You see, here I've entangled myself already. He winks slyly at Marriott, who has now lifted her head. What are you prating there, you scarecrow, asks the abbot. Kor continues. Here it goes, Noni. I am straightening it out little by little. But where have we buried it, the barrel? Do you remember, Noni? I have forgotten. They say it's from the gin, kind people, they say that one's memory fails from too much gin. I am a drunkard, that's true. If you are not inventing, then you had better choke yourself with your gold, you dog, says the abbot. Haggard, Kor. Kor, yes. Haggard, tomorrow you will get a hundred lashes. Abbot, order a hundred lashes for him. Abbot, with pleasure, my son. With pleasure. The movements of the fishermen are just as slow and languid, but there is something new in their increased puffing and pulling at their pipes, in the light quiver of their tanned hands. Some of them arise and look out of the window with feigned indifference. The fog is rising, says one, looking out of the window. Do you hear what I said about the fog? It's time to go to sleep. I say, it's time to go to sleep. Desfoso comes forward and speaks cautiously. That isn't quite so, Abbot. It seems you didn't say exactly what you ought to say, Abbot. They seem to think differently. I don't say anything for myself, I am simply talking about them. What do you say, Thomas? Thomas. We ought to go to sleep, I say. Isn't it true that it is time to go to sleep? Marriott softly, sit down, Gart. You are tired tonight. You don't answer? An old fisherman says. There used to be a custom in our land, I heard, that a murderer was to pay a fine for the man he killed. Have you heard about it, Desfoso? Another voice is heard. Philip is dead. Philip is dead already, do you hear, neighbor? Who is going to support his mother? I haven't enough even for my own. And the fog is rising, neighbor. Abbot, did you hear us say, Gart is a bad man, Gart is a good-for-nothing, a city trickster? No, we said, this thing has never happened here before, says Desfoso. Then a determined voice remarks. Gart is a good man. 
Wild Gart is a good man. Desfoso, if you looked around, Abbot, you couldn't find a single, strong boat here. I haven't enough tar for mine. And the church, is that the way a good church ought to look? I am not saying it myself, but it comes out that way, it can't be helped, Abbot. Haggard turns to Marriott and says. Do you hear, woman? I do. Why don't you spit into their faces? I can't. I love you, Haggart. Are there only ten commandments of God? No, there is still another, I love you, Haggart. What sad dreams there are in your land. The abbot rises and walks over to the fisherman. Well, what did you say about the church, old man? You said something interesting about the church, or was I mistaken? He casts a swift glance at Marriott and Haggart. It isn't the church alone, Abbot. There are four of us old men, Legrand, Stoffel, Poizar, Cornu, and seven old women. Do I say that we are not going to feed them? Of course, we will, but don't be angry, Father, it is hard. You know it yourself, Abbot, old age is no fun. I am an old man, too. Begins old Rika, lisping, but suddenly he flings his hat angrily to the ground. Yes, I am an old man. I don't want any more, that's all. I worked, and now I don't want to work. That's all. I don't want to work. He goes out, swinging his hand. All look sympathetically at his stooping back, at his white tufts of hair. And then they look again at Disfoso, at his mouth, from which their words come out. A voice says. There, Rika doesn't want to work any more. All laugh softly and forcedly. Suppose we send Gart to the city, what then? Desfoso goes on, without looking at Haggart. Well, the city people will hang him, and then what? The result will be that a man will be gone, a fisherman will be gone, you will lose a son, and Marriott will lose her husband, and the little boy his father. Is there any joy in that? That's right, that's right, nods the abbot, approvingly. But what a mind you have, Desfoso. Do you pay attention to them, abbot? asked Haggart. Yes, I do, Haggart. And it wouldn't do you any harm to pay attention to them. The devil is prouder than you, and yet he is only the devil, and nothing more. Desfoso affirms. What's the use of pride? Pride isn't necessary. He turns to Haggart, his eyes still lowered, then he lifts his eyes and asks. Gart. But you don't need to kill anybody else. Excepting Philip, you don't feel like killing anybody else, do you? No. Only Philip, and no more. Do you hear? Only Philip, and no more. And another question, Gart, don't you want to send away this man, Cor? We would like you to do it. Who knows him? People say that all this trouble comes through him. Several voices are heard. Through him. Send him away, Gart. It will be better for him. The abbot upholds them. True. You, too, priest, says Cor, gruffly. Haggart looks with a faint smile at his angry, bristled face, and says. I rather feel like sending him away. Let him go. Well, then, Abbot, says Desfoso, turning around, we have decided, in accordance with our conscience, to take the money. Do I speak properly? One voice answers for all. Yes. Desfoso, well, sailor, where is the money? Cor, Captain. Haggart, give it to them. Cor rudely, then give me back my knife and my pipe first. Who is the eldest among you, you? Listen, then, take crowbars and shovels and go to the castle. Do you know the tower, the accursed tower that fell? Go over there. He bends down and draws a map on the floor with his crooked finger. All bend down and look attentively. Only the abbot gazes sternly out of the window, behind which the heavy fog is still grey. Haggard whispers in a fit of rage. Marriott, it would have been better if you had killed me as I killed Philip. 
and now my father is calling me. Where will be the end of my sorrow, Marriott? Where the end of the world is? And where is the end of the world? Do you want to take my sorrow, Marriott? I do, Haggart. No, you are a woman. Why do you torture me, Gart? What have I done that you should torture me so? I love you. You lied. My tongue lied. I love you. A serpent has a double tongue, but ask the serpent what it wants, and it will tell you the truth. It is your heart that lied. Was it not you, girl, that I met that time on the road? And you said, Good evening. How you have deceived me! Desfoso asks loudly. Well, Abbot? You are coming along with us, aren't you, father? Otherwise something wrong might come out of it. Do I speak properly? The abbot replies merrily. Of course, of course, children. I am going with you. Without me, you will think of the church. I have just been thinking of the church, of the kind of church you need. Oh, it's hard to get along with you, people. The fishermen go out very slowly, they are purposely lingering. The sea is coming, says one. I can hear it. Yes, yes, the sea is coming. Did you understand what he said? The few who remained are more hasty in their movements. Some of them politely bid Haggart farewell. Goodbye, Gart. I am thinking, Haggart, what kind of a church we need. This one will not do, it seems. They prayed here a hundred years. Now it is no good, they say. Well, then, it is necessary to have a new one, a better one. But what shall it be? Pope's a rogue, Pope's a rogue. But, then, I am a rogue, too. Don't you think, Gart, that I am also something of a rogue? One moment, children, I am with you. There is some crowding in the doorway. The abbot follows the last man with his eyes and roars angrily. Eh, you, Haggart, murderer! What are you smiling at? You have no right to despise them like that. They are my children. They have worked, have you seen their hands, their backs? If you haven't noticed that, you are a fool. They are tired. They want to rest. Let them rest, even at the cost of the blood of the one you killed. I'll give them each a little, and the rest I will throw out into the sea. Do you hear, Haggart? I hear, priest. The abbot exclaims, raising his arms. O oh Lord! Why have you made a heart that can have pity on both the murdered and the murderer? Gart, go home. Take him home, Marriott, and wash his hands. To whom do you lie, priest? asks Haggart, slowly. To God or to the devil? To yourself or to the people? Or to everybody? He laughs bitterly. Eh, Gart. You are drunk with blood. And with what are you drunk? They face each other. Marriott cries angrily, placing herself between them. May a thunder strike you down, both of you, that's what I am praying to God. May a thunder strike you down. What are you doing with my heart? You are tearing it with your teeth like greedy dogs. You didn't drink enough blood, Gart, drink mine, then. You will never have enough, Gart, isn't that true? Now, now, says the abbot, calming them. Take him home, Marriott. Go home, Gart, and sleep more. Marriott comes forward, goes to the door and pauses there. Gart. I am going to little Noni. Go. Are you coming along with me? Yes, no, later. I am going to little Noni. What shall I tell him about his father when he wakes up? Haggard is silent. Kor comes back and stops irresolutely at the threshold. Marriott casts at him a glance full of contempt and then goes out. Silence. Kor. Yes. Jin. Here it is, Noni. Drink it, my boy, but not all at once, not all at once, Noni. Haggard drinks, he examines the room with a smile. 
Nobody. Did you see him, Cor? He is there, behind the curtain. Just think of it, sailor, here we are again with him alone. Go home, Noni. Right away. Give me some gin. He drinks. And they? They have gone. They ran, Noni. Go home, my boy. They ran off like goats. I was laughing so much, Noni. Both laugh. Take down that toy, Kor. Yes, yes, a little ship. He made it, Kor. They examine the toy. Look how skillfully the jib was made, Kor. Good boy, Philip. But the halyards are bad, look. No, Philip. You never saw how real ships are fitted out, real ships which rove over the ocean, tearing its gray waves. Was it with this toy that you wanted to quench your little thirst, fool? He throws down the little ship and rises. Kor. Bosun. Yes. Call them. I assume command again, Kor. The sailor turns pale and shouts enthusiastically. Noni. Captain. My knees are trembling. I will not be able to reach them and I will fall on the way. You will reach them. We must also take our money away from these people, what do you think, Kor? We have played a little, and now it is enough, what do you think, Kor? He laughs. The sailor looks at him, his hands folded as in prayer, and he weeps. Chapter 7 These are your comrades, Haggart. I am so glad to see them. You said, Gart, yes, you said that their faces were entirely different from the faces of our people, and that is true. Oh, how true it is. Our people have handsome faces, too, don't think our fishermen are ugly, but they haven't these deep, terrible scars. I like them very much, I assure you, Gart. I suppose you are a friend of Haggart's, you have such stern, fine eyes? But you are silent? Why are they silent, Haggart, did you forbid them to speak? And why are you silent yourself, Haggart? Haggart. Illuminated by the light of torches, Haggart stands and listens to the rapid, agitated speech. The metal of the guns and the uniforms vibrates and flashes. The light is also playing on the faces of those who have surrounded Haggart in a close circle, these are his nearest, his friends. And in the distance there is a different game, there a large ship is dancing silently, casting its light upon the black waves, and the black water plays with them, pleading them like a braid. Extinguishing them and kindling them again. A noisy conversation and the splashing of the waters, and the dreadful silence of kindred human lips that are sealed. I am listening to you, Marriott, says Haggard at last. What do you want, Marriott? It is impossible that someone should have offended you. I ordered them not to touch your house. Oh, no, Haggart, no. No one has offended me. Exclaimed Marriott cheerfully. But don't you like me to hold little Noni in my arms? Then I will put him down here among the rocks. Here he will be warm and comfortable as in his cradle. That's the way. Don't be afraid of waking him, Gart he sleeps soundly and will not hear anything. You may shout, sing, fire a pistol, the boy sleeps soundly. What do you want, Marriott? I did not call you here, and I am not pleased that you have come. Of course, you did not call me here, Haggart, of course, you didn't. But when the fire was started, I thought, now it will light the way for me to walk. Now I will not stumble. And I went. Your friends will not be offended, Haggart, if I will ask them to step aside for a while? I have something to tell you, Gart. Of course, I should have done that before, I understand, Gart. But I only just recalled it now. It was so light to walk. Haggart says sternly. Step aside, Flerio, and you all, step aside with him. They all step aside. What is it that you have recalled? Marriott. Speak. I am going away forever from your mournful land, where one dreams such painful dreams, 
where even the rocks dream of sorrow. And I have forgotten everything. Gently and submissively, seeking protection in kindness, the woman presses close to his hand. Oh, Haggart! Oh, my dear Haggart! They are not offended because I asked them so rudely to step aside, are they? Oh, my dear Haggart! The galoons of your uniform scratched my cheek, but it is so pleasant. Do you know, I never liked it when you wore the clothes of our fishermen, it was not becoming to you, Haggart. But I am talking nonsense, and you are getting angry, Gart. Forgive me. Don't kneel. Get up. It was only for a moment. Here, I got up. You ask me what I want? This is what I want. Take me with you, Haggart. Me and little Noni, Haggart. Haggart retreats. You say that, Marriott? You say that I should take you along? Perhaps you are laughing, woman? Or am I dreaming again? Yes, I say that, take me with you. Is this your ship? How large and beautiful it is, and it has black sails, I know it. Take me on your ship, Haggart. I know, you will say, we have no women on the ship, but I will be the woman, I will be your soul. Haggart, I will be your song, your thoughts, Haggart. And if it must be so, let Kor give gin to little Noni, he is a strong boy. Eh, Marriott, says Haggart sternly. Do you perhaps want me to believe you again? Eh, Marriott? Don't talk of that which you do not know, woman. Are the rocks perhaps casting a spell over me and turning my head? Do you hear the noise, and something like voices? That is the sea, waiting for me. Don't hold my soul. Let it go, Marriott. Don't speak, Haggart. I know everything. It was not as though I came along a fiery road, it was not as though I saw blood today. Be silent, Haggart. I have seen something more terrible, Haggart. Oh, if you could only understand me. I have seen cowardly people who ran without defending themselves. I have seen clutching, greedy fingers, crooked like those of birds, like those of birds, Haggart. And out of these fingers, which were forced open, gold was taken. And suddenly I saw a man sobbing. Think of it, Haggart. They were taking gold from him, and he was sobbing. She laughs bitterly. Haggard advances a step toward her and puts his heavy hand upon her shoulder. Yes, yes, Marriott. Speak on, girl, let the sea wait. Marriott removes his hand and continues. No, I thought. These are not my brethren at all. I thought and laughed. And father shouted to the cowards, take shafts and strike them. But they were running. Father is such a splendid man. Father is a splendid man, Haggard affirms cheerfully. Such a splendid man. And then one sailor bent down close to Noni, perhaps he did not want to do any harm to him, but he bent down to him too closely, so, I fired at him from your pistol. Is it nothing that I fired at our sailor? Haggart laughs. He had a comical face. You killed him, Marriott. No. I don't know how to shoot. And it was he who told me where you were. Oh Haggart, oh brother. She sobs, and then she speaks angrily with a shade of a serpentine hiss in her voice. I hate them. They were not tortured enough. I would have tortured them still more, still more. Oh, what cowardly rascals they are. Listen, Haggart, I was always afraid of your power, to me there was always something terrible and incomprehensible in your power. Where is his God? I wondered, and I was terrified. Even this morning I was afraid, but now that this night came, this terror has fled, and I came running to you over the fiery road, I am going with you, Haggart. Take me, Haggart, I will be the soul of your ship. I am the soul of my ship, Marriott. But you will be the song of my liberated soul, Marriott. You shall be the song of my ship, Marriott. Do you know where we are going? We are going to look for the end of the world, for unknown lands, for unknown monsters. 
and at night Father Ocean will sing to us, Marriott. Embrace me, Haggart. Ah, Haggart, he is not a god who makes cowards of human beings. We shall go to look for a new god. Haggart whispers stormily. I lied when I said that I have forgotten everything, I learned this in your land. I love you, Marriott, as I love fire. Eh, Flirio, comrade. He shouts cheerfully, eh, Flirio, comrade. Have you prepared a salute? I have, Captain. The shores will tremble when our cannons speak. Eh, Flirio, comrade. Don't gnash your teeth, without biting, no one will believe you. Did you put in cannonballs, round, cast iron, good cannonballs? Give them wings, comrade, let them fly like blackbirds on land and sea. Yes, Captain. Haggart laughs. I love to think how the cannonball flies, Marriott. I love to watch its invisible flight. If someone comes in its way, let him. Fate itself strikes down like that. What is an aim? Only fools need an aim, while the devil, closing his eyes, throws stones, the wise game is merrier this way. But you are silent. What are you thinking of, Marriott? I am thinking of them. I am forever thinking of them. Are you sorry for them? Haggart frowns. Yes, I am sorry for them. But my pity is my hatred, Haggart. I hate them, and I would kill them, more and more. I feel like flying faster, my soul is so free. Let us jest, Marriott. Here is a riddle, guess it, for whom will the cannons roar soon? You think, for me? No. For you? No, no, not for you, Marriott. For little Noni, for him, for little Noni who is boarding the ship tonight. Let him wake up from this thunder. How our little Noni will be surprised. And now be quiet, quiet, don't disturb his sleep, don't spoil little Noni's awakening. The sound of voices is heard, a crowd is approaching. Where is the captain? Here. Halt, the captain is here. It's all done. They can be crammed into a basket like herrings. Our bosun is a brave fellow. A jolly man. Kor, intoxicated and jolly, shouts. Not so loud, devils. Don't you see that the captain is here? They scream like seagulls over a dead dolphin. Marriott steps aside a little distance, where little Noni is sleeping. Kor, here we are, captain. No losses, captain. And how we laughed, Noni. Haggart, you got drunk rather early. Come to the point. Kor, very well. The thing is done, captain. We've picked up all our money, not worse than the imperial tax collectors. I could not tell which was ours, so I picked up all the money. But if they have buried some of the gold, forgive us, captain, we are not peasants to plow the ground. Laughter. Haggard also laughs. Let them sow, we shall reap. Golden words, Noni. Eh, Tommy, listen to what the captain is saying. And another thing, whether you will be angry or not, I have broken the music. I have scattered it in small pieces. Show your pipe, Tetu. Do you see, Noni, I didn't do it at once, no. I told him to play a jig, and he said that he couldn't do it. Then he lost his mind and ran away. They all lost their minds there, Captain. Eh, Tommy, show your beard. An old woman tore half of his beard out, Captain, now he is a disgrace to look upon. Eh, Tommy. He has hidden himself, he's ashamed to show his face, Captain. And there's another thing, the priest is coming here. Marriott exclaims. Father. Kor, astonished, asks. Are you here? If she came to complain, I must report to you, Captain, the priest almost killed one of our sailors. And she, too. I ordered the men to bind the priest. Silence. I don't understand your actions, Noni. 
Haggard, restraining his rage, exclaims. I shall have you put in irons. Silence. With ever-growing rage. You dare talk back to me, Riffraff. You. Marriott cautions him. Gart. They have brought father here. Several sailors bring in the abbot, bound. His clothes are in disorder, his face is agitated and pale. He looks at Marriott with some amazement, and lowers his eyes. Then he heaves a sigh. Untie him, says Marriott. Haggard corrects her restrainedly. Only I command here, Marriott. Cor, untie him. Cor unfastens the knots. Silence. Abbot, hello, Haggard. Hello, Abbot. You have arranged a fine night, Haggard. Haggard speaks with restraint. It is unpleasant for me to see you. Why did you come here? Go home, priest, no one will touch you. Keep on fishing, and what else were you doing? Oh, yes, make your own prayers. We are going out to the ocean, your daughter, you know, is also going with me. Do you see the ship? That is mine. It's a pity that you don't know about ships, you would have laughed for joy at the sight of such a beautiful ship. Why is he silent, Marriott? You had better tell him. Abbot, prayers? In what language? Have you, perhaps, discovered a new language in which prayers reach God? Oh, Haggard, Haggard. He weeps, covering his face with his hands. Haggard, alarmed, asks. You are crying, Abbot? Look, Gart, he is crying. Father never cried. I am afraid, Gart. The abbot stops crying. Heaving a deep sigh, he says. I don't know what they call you, haggard or devil or something else, I have come to you with a request. Do you hear, robber, with a request? Tell your crew not to gnash their teeth like that, I don't like it. Haggard replies morosely. Go home, priest. Marriott will stay with me. Let her stay with you. I don't need her, and if you need her, take her. Take her, Haggard. But. He kneels before him. A murmur of astonishment. Marriott, frightened, advances a step to her father. Father. You are kneeling. Abbot, robber. Give us back the money. You will rob more for yourself, but give this money to us. You are young yet, you will rob some more yet. Haggard, you are insane. There's a man, he will drive the devil himself to despair. Listen, priest, I am shouting to you, you have simply lost your mind. The abbot, still kneeling, continues. Perhaps, I have, by God, I don't know. Robber, dearest, what is this to you? Give us this money. I feel sorry for them, for the scoundrels. They rejoiced so much, the scoundrels. They blossomed forth like an old blackthorn which has nothing but thorns and a ragged bark. They are sinners. But am I imploring God for their sake? I am imploring you. Robber, dearest. Marriott looks now at Haggard, now at the priest. Haggard is hesitating. The abbot keeps muttering. Robber, do you want me to call you son? Well, then, son, it makes no difference now, I will never see you again. It's all the same. Like an old blackthorn, they bloomed, oh, Lord, those scoundrels, those old scoundrels. No, Haggard replied sternly. Then you are the devil, that's who you are. You are the devil, mutters the abbot, rising heavily from the ground. Haggard shows his teeth, enraged. Do you wish to sell your soul to the devil? Yes. Eh, Abbot, don't you know yet that the devil always pays with spurious money? Let me have a torch, sailor. He seizes a torch and lifts it high over his head, he covers his terrible face with fire and smoke. Look, here I am. Do you see? Now ask me, if you dare. He flings the torch away. 
what does the abbot dream in this land full of monstrous dreams? Terrified, his heavy frame trembling, helplessly pushing the people aside with his hands, he retreats. He turns around. Now he sees the glitter of the metal, the dark and terrible faces, he hears the angry splashing of the waters, and he covers his head with his hands and walks off quickly. Then Kor jumps up and strikes him with a knife in his back. Why have you done it? The abbot clutches the hand that struck him down. Just so, for nothing. The abbot falls to the ground and dies. Why have you done it, cries Marriott. Why have you done it, roars Haggart. And a strange voice, coming from some unknown depths, answers with Kor's lips. You commanded me to do it. Haggart looks around and sees the stern, dark faces, the quivering glitter of the metal, the motionless body, he hears the mysterious, merry dashing of the waves. And he clasps his head in a fit of terror. Who commanded? It was the roaring of the sea. I did not want to kill him, no, no. Somber voices answer. You commanded. We heard it. You commanded. Haggard listens, his head thrown back. Suddenly he bursts into loud laughter. Oh, devils, devils! Do you think that I have two ears in order that you may lie in each one? Go down on your knees, rascal! He hurls Kor to the ground. String him up with a rope. I would have crushed your venomous head myself, but let them do it. Oh, devils, devils! String him up with a rope. Kor whines harshly. Me, Captain. I was your nurse, Noni. Silence. Rascal. I. Noni. Your nurse. You squealed like a little pig in the cook's room. Have you forgotten it, Noni, mutters the sailor plaintively. Eh, shouts Haggard to the stern crowd. Take him. Several men advance to him. Kor rises. If you do it to me, to your own nurse, then you have recovered, Noni. Eh, obey the captain. Take me. I'll make you cry enough, Tommy. You are always the mischief maker. Grim laughter. Several sailors surround Kor as Haggard watches them sternly. A dissatisfied voice says. There is no place where to hang him here. There isn't a single tree around. Let us wait till we get aboard ship. Let him die honestly on the mast. I know of a tree around here, but I won't tell you, roars Kor hoarsely. Look for it yourself. Well, you have astonished me, Noni. How you shouted, string him up with a rope. Exactly like your father, he almost hanged me, too. Goodbye, Noni, now I understand your actions. Eh, Jin. And then, on the rope. Kor goes off. No one dares approach Haggard, still enraged, he paces back and forth with long strides. He pauses, glances at the body and paces again. Then he calls. Flirio. Did you hear me give orders to kill this man? No, Captain. You may go. He paces back and forth again, and then calls. Flirio. Have you ever heard the sea lying? No. If they can't find a tree, order them to choke him with their hands. He paces back and forth again. Marriott is laughing quietly. Who is laughing? asks Haggard in fury. I, answers Marriott. I am thinking of how they are hanging him and I am laughing. Oh, Haggart, oh, my noble Haggart. Your wrath is the wrath of God, do you know it? No. You are strange, you are dear, you are terrible, Haggart, but I am not afraid of you. Give me your hand, Haggart, press it firmly, firmly. Here is a powerful hand. Flirio, my friend, did you hear what he said? He says the sea never lies. You are powerful and you are just. I was insane when I feared your power, Gart. May I shout to the sea, Haggart, the just? That is not true. Be silent, Marriott, you are intoxicated with blood. 
I don't know what justice is. Who, then, knows it? You, you, Haggart. You are God's justice, Haggart. Is it true that he was your nurse? Oh, I know what it means to be a nurse, a nurse feeds you, teaches you to walk, you love a nurse as your mother. Isn't that true, Gart, you love a nurse as a mother? And yet, string him up with a rope, Cor. She laughs quietly. A loud, ringing laughter resounds from the side where Cor was led away. Haggart stops, perplexed. What is it? The devil is meeting his soul there, says Marriott. No. Let go of my hand. Eh, who's there? A crowd is coming. They are laughing and grinning, showing their teeth. But noticing the captain, they become serious. The people are repeating one and the same name. Kor. 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 And then Kor himself appears, disheveled, crushed, but happy, the rope has broken. Knitting his brow, Haggard is waiting in silence. The rope broke, Noni, mutters Kor hoarsely, modestly, yet with dignity. There are the ends. Eh, you there, keep quiet. There is nothing to laugh at, they started to hang me, and the rope broke, Noni. Haggard looks at his old, drunken, frightened, and happy face, and he laughs like a madman. And the sailors respond with roaring laughter. The reflected lights are dancing more merrily upon the waves, as if they are also laughing with the people. Just look at him, Marriott, what a face he has, Haggard is almost choking with laughter. Are you happy? Speak, are you happy? Look, Marriott, what a happy face he has. The rope broke, that's very strong, it is stronger even than what I said, string him up with a rope. Who said it? Don't you know? Cor. You are out of your wits, and you don't know anything, well, never mind, you needn't know. Eh, give him gin. I am glad, very glad that you are not altogether through with your gin. Drink, Cor. Voices shout. Gin. Eh, the bosun wants a drink. Gin. Cor drinks it with dignity, amid laughter and shouts of approval. Suddenly all the noise dies down and a somber silence reigns, a woman's strange voice drowns the noise, so strange and unfamiliar, as if it were not Marriott's voice at all. But another voice speaking with her lips. Haggart. You have pardoned him, Haggart? Some of the people look at the body, those standing near it step aside. Haggart asks, surprised. Whose voice is that? Is that yours, Marriott? How strange! I did not recognize your voice. You have pardoned him, Haggart. You have heard, the rope broke. Tell me, did you pardon the murderer? I want to hear your voice, Haggart. A threatening voice is heard from among the crowd. The rope broke. Who is talking there? The rope broke. Silence! exclaims Haggart but there is no longer the same commanding tone in his voice. Take them all away. Bosun. Whistle for everybody to go aboard. The time is up. Flurio. Get the boats ready. Yes, yes. Cor whistles. The sailors disperse unwillingly, and the same threatening voice sounds somewhere from the darkness. I thought at first it was the dead man who started to speak. But I would have answered him too, lie there. The rope broke. Another voice replies. Don't grumble. Kor has stronger defenders than you are. What are you prating about, devils? Says Kor. Silence. Is that you, Tommy? I know you, you are always the mischief maker. Come on, Marriott, says Haggart. Give me little Noni. I want to carry him to the boat myself. Come on, Marriott. Where, Haggart? Eh, Marriott. The dreams are ended. I don't like your voice, woman, when did you find time to change it? What a land of jugglers. I have never seen such a land before. Eh, Haggart. 
The dreams are ended. I don't like your voice, either, little Haggard. But it may be that I am still sleeping, then wake me. Haggard, swear that it was you who said it, the rope broke. Swear that my eyes have not grown blind and that they see Cor alive. Swear that this is your hand, Haggard. Silence. The voice of the sea is growing louder, there is the splash and the call and the promise of a stern caress. I swear. Silence. Cor and Flirio come up to Haggard. All's ready, Captain, says Flirio. They are waiting, Noni. Go quicker. They want to feast tonight, Noni. But I must tell you, Noni, that they. Haggard, did you say something, Flirio? Yes, yes, everything is ready. I am coming. I think I am not quite through yet with land. This is such a remarkable land, Flirio. The dreams here drive their claws into a man like thorns, and they hold him. One has to tear his clothing, and perhaps his body as well. What did you say, Marriott? Marriott, don't you want to kiss little Noni? You shall never kiss him again. No, I don't want to. Silence. You will go alone. Yes, I will go alone. Did you ever cry, Haggard? No. Who is crying now? I hear someone crying bitterly. That is not true, it is the roaring of the sea. Oh, Haggard. Of what great sorrow does that voice speak? Be silent, Marriott. It is the roaring of the sea. Silence. Is everything ended now, Haggard? Everything is ended, Marriott. Marriott, imploring, says. Gart. Only one motion of the hand. Right here, against the heart, Gart. No. Leave me alone. Only one motion of the hand. Here is your knife. Have pity on me, kill me with your hand. Only one motion of your hand, Gart. Let go. Give me my knife. Gart, I bless you. One motion of your hand, Gart. Haggard tears himself away, pushing the woman aside. No. Don't you know that it is just as hard to make one motion of the hand as it is for the sun to come down from the sky? Goodbye, Marriott. You are going away? Yes, I am going away. I am going away, Marriott. That's how it sounds. I shall curse you, Haggard. Do you know? I shall curse you, Haggard. And little Noni will curse you, Haggard, Haggard. Haggard exclaims cheerfully and harshly. Eh, Cor. You, Flirio, my old friend. Come here, give me your hand, oh, what a powerful hand it is. Why do you pull me by the sleeve, Cor? You have such a funny face. I can almost see how the rope snapped, and you came down like a sack. Flirio, old friend, I feel like saying something funny, but I have forgotten how to say it. How do they say it? Remind me, Flirio. What do you want, sailor? Cor whispers to him hoarsely. Noni, be on your guard. The rope broke because they used a rotten rope intentionally. They are betraying you. Be on your guard, Noni. Strike them on the head, Noni. Haggard bursts out laughing. Now you have said something funny. And I? Listen, Flirio, old friend. This woman who stands and looks, no, that will not be funny. He advances a step. Cor, do you remember how well this man prayed? Why was he killed? He prayed so well. But there is one prayer he did not know, this one, to you I bring my great eternal sorrow. I am going to you, Father Ocean. And a distant voice, sad and grave, replies. Oh, Haggard, my dear Haggard. But who knows, perhaps it was the roaring of the waves. Many sad and strange dreams come to man on earth. All aboard, exclaims Haggard cheerily, and goes off without looking around. Below, a gay noise of voices and laughter resounds. 
the cobblestones are rattling under the firm footsteps, Haggard is going away. Haggard. He goes, without turning around. Haggard. He has gone away. Loud shouting is heard, the sailors are greeting Haggard. They drink and go off into the darkness. On the shore, the torches which were cast aside are burning low, illumining the body, and a woman is rushing about. She runs swiftly from one spot to another, bending down over the steep rocks. Insane Dan comes crawling out. Is that you, Dan? Do you hear, they are singing, Dan? Haggard has gone away. I was waiting for them to go. Here is another one. I am gathering the pipes of my organ. Here is another one. Be accursed, Dan. Oh ho. And you, too, Marriott, be accursed. Marriott clasps the child in her arms and lifts him high. Then she calls wildly. Haggard, turn around. Turn around, Haggard. Noni is calling you. He wants to curse you, Haggard. Turn around. Look, Noni, look, that is your father. Remember him, Noni. And when you grow up, go out on every sea and find him, Noni. And when you find him, hang your father high on a mast, my little one. The thundering salute drowns her cry. Haggard has boarded his ship. The night grows darker and the dashing of the waves fainter, the ocean is moving away with the tide. The great desert of the sky is mute and the night grows darker and the dashing of the waves ever fainter. The Crushed Flower Chapter 1 His name was Yura. He was six years old, and the world was to him enormous, alive and bewitchingly mysterious. He knew the sky quite well. He knew its deep azure by day, and the white-breasted, half-silvery, half-golden clouds slowly floating by. He often watched them as he lay on his back upon the grass or upon the roof. But he did not know the stars so well, for he went to bed early. He knew well and remembered only one star, the green, bright and very attentive star that rises in the pale sky just before you go to bed. And that seemed to be the only star so large in the whole sky. But best of all, he knew the earth in the yard, in the street and in the garden, with all its inexhaustible wealth of stones, of velvety grass, of hot sand and of that wonderfully varied, mysterious and delightful dust which grown people did not notice at all from the height of their enormous size. And in falling asleep, as the last bright image of the passing day, he took along to his dreams a bit of hot, rubbed-off stone bathed in sunshine or a thick layer of tenderly tickling, burning dust. When he went with his mother to the center of the city along the large streets, he remembered best of all, upon his return, the wide, flat stones upon which his steps and his feet seemed terribly small, like two little boats. And even the multitude of revolving wheels and horses' heads did not impress themselves so clearly upon his memory as this new and unusually interesting appearance of the ground. Everything was enormous to him, the fences, the dogs, and the people but that did not at all surprise or frighten him, that only made everything particularly interesting. That transformed life into an uninterrupted miracle. According to his measures, various objects seemed to him as follows. His father, ten yards tall. His mother, three yards. The neighbor's angry dog, thirty yards. Their own dog, ten yards, like Papa. Their house of one story was very, very tall, a mile. The distance between one side of the street and the other, two miles. Their garden and the trees in their garden seemed immense, infinitely tall. The city, a million, just how much he did not know. And everything else appeared to him in the same way. He knew many people, large and small, but he knew and appreciated better the little ones with whom he could speak of everything. The grown people behaved so foolishly and asked such absurd, dull questions about things that everybody knew, that it was necessary for him also to make believe that he was foolish. He had to lisp and give nonsensical answers, and, of course, he felt like running away from them as soon as possible. 
But there were over him and around him and within him two entirely extraordinary persons, at once big and small, wise and foolish, at once his own and strangers, his father and mother. They must have been very good people, otherwise they could not have been his father and mother, at any rate, they were charming and unlike other people. He could say with certainty that his father was very great, terribly wise, that he possessed immense power, which made him a person to be feared somewhat. And it was interesting to talk with him about unusual things, placing his hand in father's large, strong, warm hand for safety's sake. Mama was not so large, and sometimes she was even very small, she was very kind-hearted, she kissed tenderly. She understood very well how he felt when he had a pain in his little stomach, and only with her could he relieve his heart when he grew tired of life. Of his games or when he was the victim of some cruel injustice. And if it was unpleasant to cry in father's presence, and even dangerous to be capricious. His tears had an unusually pleasant taste in mother's presence and filled his soul with a peculiar serene sadness, which he could find neither in his games nor in laughter nor even in the reading of the most terrible fairy tales. It should be added that Mama was a beautiful woman and that everybody was in love with her. That was good, for he felt proud of it, but that was also bad, for he feared that she might be taken away. And every time one of the men, one of those enormous, invariably inimical men who were busy with themselves, looked at Mama fixedly for a long time, Yura felt bored and uneasy. He felt like stationing himself between him and Mama, and no matter where he went to attend to his own affairs, something was drawing him back. Sometimes Mama would utter a bad, terrifying phrase. Why are you forever staying around here? Go and play in your own room. There was nothing left for him to do but to go away. He would take a book along or he would sit down to draw, but that did not always help him. Sometimes Mama would praise him for reading but sometimes she would say again. You had better go to your own room, Yurachka. You see, you've spilt water on the tablecloth again. You always do some mischief with your drawing. And then she would reproach him for being perverse. But he felt worst of all when a dangerous and suspicious guest would come when Yura had to go to bed. But when he lay down in his bed a sense of easiness came over him and he felt as though all was ended, the lights went out, life stopped, everything slept. In all such cases with suspicious men Yura felt vaguely but very strongly that he was replacing father in some way. And that made him somewhat like a grown man, he was in a bad frame of mind, like a grown person, but, therefore, he was unusually calculating, wise and serious. Of course, he said nothing about this to anyone, for no one would understand him. But, by the manner in which he caressed father when he arrived and sat down on his knees patronizingly, one could see in the boy a man who fulfilled his duty to the end. At times father could not understand him and would simply send him away to play or to sleep, Yura never felt offended and went away with a feeling of great satisfaction. He did not feel the need of being understood, he even feared it. At times he would not tell under any circumstances why he was crying. At times he would make believe that he was absent-minded, that he heard nothing, that he was occupied with his own affairs, but he heard and understood. And he had a terrible secret. He had noticed that these extraordinary and charming people, father and mother, were sometimes unhappy and were hiding this from everybody. Therefore he was also concealing his discovery, and gave everybody the impression that all was well. Many times he found Mama crying somewhere in a corner in the drawing room, or in the bedroom, his own room was next to her bedroom, and one night, very late, almost at dawn. He heard the terribly loud and angry voice of father and the weeping voice of mother. He lay a long time, holding his breath. But then he was so terrified by that unusual conversation in the middle of the night that he could not restrain himself and he asked his nurse in a soft voice. What are they saying? And the nurse answered quickly in a whisper. Sleep, sleep. They are not saying anything. I am coming over to your bed. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? Such a big boy. I am coming over to your bed. Thus, Terribly afraid lest they should be heard, they spoke in whispers and argued in the dark. 
And the end was that Yura moved over to nurse's bed, upon her rough, but cozy and warm blanket. In the morning Papa and Mama were very cheerful and Yura pretended that he believed them and it seemed that he really did believe them. But that same evening, and perhaps it was another evening, he noticed his father crying. It happened in the following way, he was passing his father's study, and the door was half open. He heard a noise and he looked in quietly, father lay face downward upon his couch and cried aloud. There was no one else in the room. Yura went away, turned about in his room and came back, the door was still half open, no one but father was in the room, and he was still sobbing. If he cried quietly, Yura could understand it, but he sobbed loudly, he moaned in a heavy voice and his teeth were gnashing terribly. He lay there, covering the entire couch, hiding his head under his broad shoulders, sniffing heavily, and that was beyond his understanding. And on the table, on the large table covered with pencils, papers and a wealth of other things, stood the lamp burning with a red flame, and smoking, a flat. Grayish-black strip of smoke was coming out and bending in all directions. Suddenly father heaved a loud sigh and stirred. Yura walked away quietly. And then all was the same as ever. No one would have learned of this. But the image of the enormous, mysterious and charming man who was his father and who was crying remained in Yura's memory as something dreadful and extremely serious. And, if there were things of which he did not feel like speaking, it was absolutely necessary to say nothing of this, as though it were something sacred and terrible. And in that silence he must love father all the more. But he must love so that father should not notice it, and he must give the impression that it is very jolly to live on earth. And Yura succeeded in accomplishing all this. Father did not notice that he loved him in a special manner, and it was really jolly to live on earth, so there was no need for him to make believe. The threads of his soul stretched themselves to all, to the sun, to the knife and the cane he was peeling, to the beautiful and enigmatic distance which he saw from the top of the iron roof. And it was hard for him to separate himself from all that was not himself. When the grass had a strong and fragrant odor it seemed to him that it was he who had such a fragrant odor, and when he lay down in his bed, however strange it may seem. Together with him in his little bed lay down the enormous yard, the street, the slant threads of the rain and the muddy pools and the whole, enormous, live, fascinating, mysterious world. Thus all fell asleep with him and thus all awakened with him, and together with him they all opened their eyes. And there was one striking fact, worthy of the profoundest reflection, if he placed a stick somewhere in the garden in the evening it was there also in the morning. And the knuckle bones which he hid in a box in the barn remained there, although it was dark and he went to his room for the night. Because of this he felt a natural need for hiding under his pillow all that was most valuable to him. Since things stood or lay there alone, they might also disappear of their accord, he reasoned. And in general it was so wonderful and pleasant that the nurse and the house and the sun existed not only yesterday, but every day, he felt like laughing and singing aloud when he awoke. When people asked him what his name was he answered promptly. Yura. But some people were not satisfied with this alone, and they wanted to know his full name, and then he replied with a certain effort. Yura Mihailovich. And after a moment's thought he added. Yura Mihailovich Pushkarev. Chapter 2. An unusual day arrived. It was mother's birthday. Guests were expected in the evening. Military music was to play, and in the garden and upon the terrace party-colored lanterns were to burn, and Yura need not go to bed at nine o'clock but could stay up as late as he liked. Yura got up when all were still sleeping. He dressed himself and jumped out quickly with the expectation of miracles. But he was unpleasantly surprised, the rooms were in the same disorder as usual in the morning. The cook and the chambermaid were still sleeping and the door was closed with a hook, it was hard to believe that the people would stir and commence to run about. And that the rooms would assume a holiday appearance, and he feared for the fate of the festival. It was still worse in the garden. The paths were not swept and there was not a single lantern there. He grew very uneasy. Fortunately, Yevman, the coachman, 
was washing the carriage behind the barn in the backyard and though he had done this frequently before, and though there was nothing unusual about his appearance. Yura clearly felt something of the holiday in the decisive way in which the coachman splashed the water from the bucket with his sinewy arms, on which the sleeves of his red blouse were rolled up to his elbows. Yevman only glanced askance at Yura, and suddenly Yura seemed to have noticed for the first time his broad, black, wavy beard and thought respectfully that Yevman was a very worthy man. He said, Good morning, Yevman. Then all moved very rapidly. Suddenly the janitor appeared and started to sweep the paths, suddenly the window in the kitchen was thrown open and women's voices were heard chattering. Suddenly the chambermaid rushed out with a little rug and started to beat it with a stick, as though it were a dog. All commenced to stir. And the events, starting simultaneously in different places, rushed with such mad swiftness that it was impossible to catch up with them. While the nurse was giving Yura his tea, people were beginning to hang up the wires for the lanterns in the garden, and while the wires were being stretched in the garden. The furniture was rearranged completely in the drawing room, and while the furniture was rearranged in the drawing room, Yevman, the coachman, harnessed the horse and drove out of the yard with a certain special, mysterious mission. Yura succeeded in concentrating himself for some time with the greatest difficulty. Together with father he was hanging up the lanterns. And father was charming. He laughed, jested, put Yura on the ladder, he himself climbed the thin, creaking rungs of the ladder, and finally both fell down together with the ladder upon the grass, but they were not hurt. Yura jumped up, while father remained lying on the grass, hands thrown back under his head, looking with half-closed eyes at the shining, infinite azure of the sky. Thus lying on the grass, with a serious expression on his face, apparently not in the mood for play, father looked very much like Gulliver longing for his land of giants. Yura recalled something unpleasant. But to cheer his father up he sat down astride upon his knees and said. Do you remember, father, when I was a little boy I used to sit down on your knees and you used to shake me like a horse? But before he had time to finish he lay with his nose on the grass, he was lifted in the air and thrown down with force, father had thrown him high up with his knees, according to his old habit. Yura felt offended, but father, entirely ignoring his anger, began to tickle him under his armpits, so that Yura had to laugh against his will. And then father picked him up like a little pig by the legs and carried him to the terrace. And mama was frightened. What are you doing? The blood will rush to his head. After which Yura found himself standing on his legs, red-faced, disheveled, feeling very miserable and terribly happy at the same time. The day was rushing fast, like a cat that is chased by a dog. Like forerunners of the coming great festival, certain messengers appeared with notes, wonderfully tasty cakes were brought, the dressmaker came and locked herself in with Mama in the bedroom. Then two gentlemen arrived, then another gentleman, then a lady, evidently the entire city was in a state of agitation. Yura examined the messengers as though they were strange people from another world, and walked before them with an air of importance as the son of the lady whose birthday was to be celebrated. He met the gentleman, he escorted the cakes, and toward midday he was so exhausted that he suddenly started to despise life. He quarreled with the nurse and lay down in his bed face downward in order to have his revenge on her, but he fell asleep immediately. He awoke with the same feeling of hatred for life and a desire for revenge, but after having looked at things with his eyes, which he washed with cold water, he felt that both the world and life were so fascinating that they were even funny. When they dressed Yura in a red silk rustling blouse, and he thus clearly became part of the festival, and he found on the terrace a long, snow-white table glittering with glass dishes. He again commenced to spin about in the whirlpool of the onrushing events. The musicians have arrived. The musicians have arrived, he cried, looking for father or mother, or for anyone who would treat the arrival of the musicians with proper seriousness. Father and mother were sitting in the garden, in the arbor which was thickly surrounded with wild grapes, maintaining silence the beautiful head of mother lay on father's shoulder. Although father embraced her, he seemed very serious, 
and he showed no enthusiasm when he was told of the arrival of the musicians. Both treated their arrival with inexplicable indifference, which called forth a feeling of sadness in Yura. But Mama stirred and said, Let me go. I must go. Remember, said father, referring to something Yura did not understand but which resounded in his heart with a light, gnawing alarm. Stop. Aren't you ashamed? Mother laughed, and this laughter made Yura feel still more alarmed. Especially since father did not laugh but maintained the same serious and mournful appearance of Gulliver pining for his native land. But soon all this was forgotten, for the wonderful festival had begun in all its glory, mystery and grandeur. The guests came fast, and there was no longer any place at the white table, which had been deserted but a while before. Voices resounded, and laughter and merry jests, and the music began to play. And on the deserted paths of the garden where but a while ago Yura had wandered alone, imagining himself a prince in quest of the sleeping princess. Now appeared people with cigarettes and with loud free speech. Yura met the first guests at the front entrance, he looked at each one carefully, and he made the acquaintance and even the friendship of some of them on the way from the corridor to the table. Thus he managed to become friendly with the officer, whose name was Matenka, a grown man whose name was Matenka, he said so himself. Matenka had a heavy leather sword, which was as cold as a snake, which could not be taken out, but Matenka lied. The sword was only fastened at the handle with a silver cord, but it could be taken out very nicely. And Yura felt vexed because the stupid Matenka instead of carrying his sword, as he always did, placed it in a corner in the hallway as a cane. But even in the corner the sword stood out alone, one could see at once that it was a sword. Another thing that displeased Yura was that another officer came with Matenka, an officer whom Yura knew and whose name was also Yura Mihailovich. Yura thought that the officer must have been named so for fun. That wrong Yura Mihailovich had visited them several times, he even came once on horseback. But most of the time he came just before little Yura had to go to bed. And little Yura went to bed, while the unreal Yura Mihailovich remained with Mama, and that caused him to feel alarmed and sad, he was afraid that Mama might be deceived. He paid no attention to the real Yura Mihailovich, and now, walking beside Matenka, he did not seem to realize his guilt, he adjusted his mustaches and maintained silence. He kissed Mama's hand, and that seemed repulsive to little Yura, but the stupid Matenka also kissed Mama's hand, and thereby set everything aright. But soon the guests arrived in such numbers, and there was such a variety of them, as if they had fallen straight from the sky. And some of them seemed to have fallen near the table, while others seemed to have fallen into the garden. Suddenly several students and ladies appeared in the path. The ladies were ordinary, but the students had holes cut at the left side of their white coats, for their swords. But they did not bring their swords along, no doubt because of their pride, they were all very proud. And the ladies rushed over to Yura and began to kiss him. Then the most beautiful of the ladies, whose name was Nanachka, took Yura to the swing and swung him until she threw him down. He hurt his left leg near the knee very painfully and even stained his little white pants in that spot, but of course he did not cry, and somehow his pain had quickly disappeared somewhere. At this time father was leading an important-looking bald-headed old man in the garden, and he asked Yurachka. Did you get hurt? But as the old man also smiled and also spoke, Yurachka did not kiss father and did not even answer him. But suddenly he seemed to have lost his mind he commenced to squeal for joy and to run around. If he had a bell as large as the whole city he would have rung that bell. But as he had no such bell he climbed the linden tree, which stood near the terrace, and began to show off. The guests below were laughing and Mama was shouting, and suddenly the music began to play, and Yura soon stood in front of the orchestra, spreading his legs apart and, according to his old but long-forgotten habit, put his finger into his mouth. The sound seemed to strike at him all at once, they roared and thundered, they made his legs tingle, and they shook his jaw. They played so loudly that there was nothing but the orchestra on the whole earth, everything else had vanished. 
The brass ends of some of the trumpets even spread apart and opened wide from the great roaring, Yura thought that it would be interesting to make a military helmet out of such a trumpet. Suddenly Yura grew sad. The music was still roaring, but now it was somewhere far away, while within him all became quiet, and it was growing ever more and more quiet. Heaving a deep sigh, Yura looked at the sky, it was so high, and with slow footsteps he started out to make the rounds of the holiday, of all its confused boundaries, possibilities and distances. And everywhere he turned out to be too late. He wanted to see how the tables for card playing would be arranged, but the tables were ready and people had been playing cards for a long time when he came up. He touched the chalk and the brush near his father and his father immediately chased him away. What of that, what difference did that make to him? He wanted to see how they would start to dance and he was sure that they would dance in the parlor, but they had already commenced to dance, not in the parlor, but under the linden trees. He wanted to see how they would light the lanterns, but the lanterns had all been lit already, every one of them, to the very last of the last. They lit up of themselves like stars. Mama danced best of all. Chapter 3 Night arrived in the form of red, green and yellow lanterns. While there were no lanterns, there was no night. And now it lay everywhere. It crawled into the bushes, it covered the entire garden with darkness, as with water, and it covered the sky. Everything looked as beautiful as the very best fairy tale with colored pictures. At one place the house had disappeared entirely, only the square window made of red light remained. And the chimney of the house was visible and there a certain spark glistened, looked down and seemed to think of its own affairs. What affairs do chimneys have? Various affairs. Of the people in the garden only their voices remained. As long as someone walked near the lanterns he could be seen. But as soon as he walked away all seemed to melt, 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 and the voice above the ground laughed, talked, floating fearlessly in the darkness. But the officers and the students could be seen even in the dark, a white spot, and above it a small light of a cigarette and a big voice. And now the most joyous thing commenced for Yura, the fairy tale. The people and the festival and the lanterns remained on earth, while he soared away, transformed into air, melting in the night like a grain of dust. The great mystery of the night became his mystery, and his little heart yearned for still more mystery, in its solitude his heart yearned for the fusion of life and death. That was Yura's second madness that evening, he became invisible. Although he could enter the kitchen as others did, he climbed with difficulty upon the roof of the cellar over which the kitchen window was flooded with light and he looked in. Their people were roasting something, busying themselves, and did not know that he was looking at them, and yet he saw everything. Then he went away and looked at Papa's and Mama's bedroom. The room was empty, but the beds had already been made for the night and a little image lamp was burning, he saw that. Then he looked into his own room, his own bed was also ready, waiting for him. He passed the room where they were playing cards, also as an invisible being, holding his breath and stepping so lightly, as though he were soaring in the air. Only when he reached the garden, in the dark, he drew a proper breath. Then he resumed his quest. He came over to people who were talking so near him that he could touch them with his hand, and yet they did not know that he was there, and they continued to speak undisturbed. He watched Nanachka for a long time until he learned all her life, he was almost trapped. Nanachka even exclaimed. Yurachka, is that you? He lay down behind a bush and held his breath. Thus Nanachka was deceived. And she had almost caught him. To make things more mysterious, he started to crawl instead of walk, now the alleys seemed full of danger. Thus a long time went by, according to his own calculations at the time, ten years went by, and he was still hiding and going ever farther away from the people. And thus he went so far that he was seized with dread, between him and the past, when he was walking like everybody else, an abyss was formed over which it seemed to him impossible to cross. Now he would have come out into the light but he was afraid, it was impossible, all was lost. And the music was still playing, and everybody had forgotten him, even Mama. He was alone. 
There was a breath of cold from the dewy grass, the gooseberry bush scratched him, the darkness could not be pierced with his eyes, and there was no end to it. O oh Lord! Without any definite plan, in a state of utter despair, Yura now crawled toward a mysterious, faintly blinking light. Fortunately it turned out to be the same arbor which was covered with wild grapes and in which father and mother had sat that day. He did not recognize it at first. Yes, it was the same arbor. The lights of the lanterns everywhere had gone out, and only two were still burning. A yellow little lantern was still burning brightly, and the other, a yellow one, too, was already beginning to blink. And though there was no wind, that lantern quivered from its own blinking, and everything seemed to quiver slightly. Yura was about to get up to go into the arbor and there begin life anew, with an imperceptible transition from the old, when suddenly he heard voices in the arbor. His mother and the wrong Yura Mihailovich, the officer, were talking. The right Yura grew petrified in his place, his heart stood still, and his breathing ceased. Mama said. Stop. You have lost your mind. Somebody may come in here. Yura Mihailovich said. And you? Mama said. I am twenty-six years old today. I am old. Yura Mihailovich said. He does not know anything. Is it possible that he does not know anything? He does not even suspect. Listen, does he shake everybody's hand so firmly? Mama said. What a question. Of course he does. That is, no, not everybody. Yura Mihailovich said. I feel sorry for him. Mama said. For him. And she laughed strangely. Yurochka understood that they were talking of him, of Yurochka, but what did it all mean, O oh Lord? And why did she laugh? Yura Mihailovich said. Where are you going? I will not let you go. Mama said. You offend me. Let me go. No, you have no right to kiss me. Let me go. They became silent. Now Yurochka looked through the leaves and saw that the officer embraced and kissed Mama. Then they spoke of something, but he understood nothing, he heard nothing, he suddenly forgot the meaning of words. And he even forgot the words which he knew and used before. He remembered but one word, Mama, and he whispered it uninterruptedly with his dry lips, but that word sounded so terrible, more terrible than anything. And in order not to exclaim it against his will, Yura covered his mouth with both hands, one upon the other, and thus remained until the officer and Mama went out of the arbor. When Yura came into the room where the people were playing cards, the serious, bald-headed man was scolding Papa for something, brandishing the chalk, talking, shouting. Saying that Father did not act as he should have acted, that what he had done was impossible, that only bad people did such things, that the old man would never again play with Father, and so on. And father was smiling, waving his hands, attempting to say something, but the old man would not let him, and he commenced to shout more loudly. And the old man was a little fellow, while father was big, handsome and tall, and his smile was sad, like that of Gulliver pining for his native land of tall and handsome people. Of course, he must conceal from him, of course, he must conceal from him that which happened in the arbor, and he must love him, and he felt that he loved him so much. And with a wild cry Yura rushed over to the bald-headed old man and began to beat him with his fists with all his strength. Don't you dare insult him. Don't you dare insult him. Oh Lord, what has happened? Someone laughed, someone shouted. Father caught Yura in his arms, pressed him closely, causing him pain, and cried. Where is mother? Call mother. Then Yura was seized with a whirlwind of frantic tears, of desperate sobs and mortal anguish. But through his frantic tears he looked at his father to see whether he had guessed it, and when mother came in he started to shout louder in order to divert any suspicion. But he did not go to her arms, he clung more closely to father, so that father had to carry him into his room. But it seemed that he himself did not want to part with Yura. As soon as he carried him out of the room where the guests were he began to kiss him, 
and he repeated. Oh, my dearest! Oh, my dearest! And he said to Mama, who walked behind him. Just think of the boy. Mama said. That is all due to your whist. You were scolding each other so, that the child was frightened. Father began to laugh, and answered. Yes, he does scold harshly. But Yura, oh, what a dear boy. In his room Yura demanded that father himself undress him. Now, you are getting cranky, said father. I don't know how to do it, let mama undress you. But you stay here. Mama had deft fingers and she undressed him quickly, and while she was removing his clothes Yura held father by the hand. He ordered the nurse out of the room. But as father was beginning to grow angry, and he might guess what had happened in the arbor, decided to let him go. But while kissing him he said cunningly. He will not scold you any more, will he? Papa smiled. Then he laughed, kissed Yura once more and said. No, no. And if he does I will throw him across the fence. Please, do, said Yura. You can do it. You are so strong. Yes, I am pretty strong. But you had better sleep. Mama will stay here with you a while. Mama said. I will send the nurse in. I must attend to the supper. Father shouted. There is plenty of time for that. You can stay a while with the child. But Mama insisted. We have guests. We can't leave them that way. But father looked at her steadfastly, and shrugged his shoulders. Mama decided to stay. Very well, then, I'll stay here. But see that Maria does not mix up the wines. Usually it was thus, when Mama sat near Yura as he was falling asleep she held his hand until the last moment, that is what she usually did. But now she sat as though she were all alone, as though Yura, her son, who was falling asleep, was not there at all, she folded her hands in her lap and looked into the distance. To attract her attention Yura stirred, but Mama said briefly. Sleep. And she continued to look. But when Yura's eyes had grown heavy and he was falling asleep with all his sorrow and his tears, Mama suddenly went down on her knees before the little bed and kissed Yura firmly many, many times. But her kisses were wet, hot and wet. Why are your kisses wet? Are you crying? muttered Yura. Yes, I am crying. You must not cry. Very well, I won't, answered mother submissively. And again she kissed him firmly, firmly, frequently, frequently. Yura lifted both hands with a heavy movement, clasped his mother around the neck and pressed his burning cheek firmly to her wet and cold cheek. She was his mother, after all. There was nothing to be done. But how painful, how bitterly painful. 